I call to order the February 26, 2024 special meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning, everyone. Today is a beautiful day. We're about to make a beautiful decision, and I look forward to working with everyone around the horseshoe to get to that place. I want to thank everyone joining us in the boardroom and via live stream today. And I will note that Regent Turner is connected with us via Zoom. As we begin this uh, meeting, I want to take a moment to thank everyone across the university community for your tremendous engagement with our three finalists during their visits across the system. In this regard, 789 people attended the public forums in person, 1,332 people live streamed the forums, and we had well over 4,000 playbacks of the finalist public forum videos. We received 446 written evaluation forms and portal comments. I speak for the entire board in extending to all of you our sincere appreciation for your interest in the candidates and the input you provided. It is incredibly valuable as we move forward selecting our next president. I also want to thank our partners across the system who made the visits possible, including our team from the board office. We are grateful to everyone who worked to make the finalist visits and forums a success. And by the way, one of the regents uh, told me that she had calculated the amount of miles that she believes our team had uh, traveled uh, to the various campuses with the candidates and I think indicated that the miles would get them to Mexico City. Am I correct? All right. That came from Penny Wheeler, our regent. Uh, so a, a shout out to the team who made this all happen. And finally, I want to thank the three finalists, 
They have proven why they have emerged as top candidates for this important leadership role. On several occasions, I have heard my colleagues say, and I have said as well, I wish we could select all three. Before we get into the structure of today's interviews, I'd like to acknowledge the highly public nature of this process. In fact, we believe this is the first time the University of Minnesota has ever had multiple publicly named presidential finalists to consider. The university community has brought into this search process like never before, and we have, are thrilled that we have three outstanding candidates who have stayed with us through the entire process till today. While it may feel uncomfortable to us and the candidates to conduct this part of the selection process in public, what I hope it shows to everyone is that we are doing our very best to engage the university community and to get this right. I will now move to the structure of the selection process. Today, we will interview three finalists selected by the board for the position of president. As background to the questions we will each be asking each of the candidates today, at the public forums that were held across the system, each finalist addressed five key themes, becoming a university for all, supporting our talented faculty and staff, the value of academic research, of academic and research excellence, the power of the system, and student success and support. These topics were developed based on feedback we received from the university community and represent areas of critical importance to all of us. Because we have all been able to view those recordings of the candidates addressing these topics, in the interest of time, our interview questions will not repeat questions in these areas and instead will focus on topics of leadership that will complement the themes that were addressed in the forums and inform the board's deliberation and selection of the university's 18th president. With your input, that is those around the table here and in the community at large, we have developed nine standard questions that we will ask each candidate and two questions that are tailored by individual. If the regents feel need for clarification on a finalist response to a question, please signal to me and I will call on you at that time. However, as to any follow-up questions, if there is time at the end of uh, the questioning of our questions to the candidate, I will open the floor for those questions at that time. So clarification questions that you can ask the can't raise your hand and ask the candidate uh, right while they're on that question. But any follow up questions, I would ask that you wait until we've gotten through all 11 questions so we can make sure we've got adequate time to address each of those 11 questions. It is critical that each of us listen closely and take careful notes throughout the interviews and not simply rely on generalizations or memory. Our notes will be helpful in focusing and informing our deliberations this afternoon. We have allocated 75 minutes to interview each finalist and it is important that we adhere to that limit. We have planned breaks after each interview to provide each of you time to summarize your notes. We will also break for lunch between the second and third interview. The interview order was determined alphabetically by last name. After the three interviews and a break, we will reconvene to deliberate. Hopefully our discussion will find us coalescing around a lead candidate. When that occurs, we will act on a resolution that is in your docket. Any questions on the structure before we begin? All right, seeing none, hearing none, then we are gonna proceed with our first interview, which is the interview of Dr. Laura Bloomberg. Come on in. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Dr. Good morning. Bloomberg. <clears throat> it's been a while since I sat here. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Bloomberg. As you know, the board has a series of questions prepared for our time together today. For your information, each candidate will respond to the same nine questions from the board and two questions tailored to that candidate. 
If there is sufficient time at the end of the interview, we will give you an opportunity to ask us questions. And with that, Regent Wheeler will get us started with the first question. Great, thank you, Chair Mayron, and welcome, Dr. Bloomberg. Yeah. My question is about why you? We've all listened to and watched the finalists' uh, campus forums. Your presentations and responses were informative and thorough, which we appreciate. Thank you. What do you think and what do you believe differentiates you and should cause us to say you're our next president? In other words, what do you want us to know about you that should get us especially excited about you serving as our next president? Chair Mayor on Regent Wheeler, actually all members of the board, first let me just say it is a, really an incomparable honor to sit before you today and to get to this point. I think you know that my uh, love of this state and my love of this institution runs deep. Um, the way this institution has poured into me for decades is, is something that I cannot ignore today, and yet I am fully aware that my that love of place and love of institution is insufficient qualifications to be your next president. So I'm glad that you're starting with this question. I really believe that most of my adult life has included increasingly um, broader scope and larger responsibility leadership opportunities that have prepared me to lead an institution like this, a land-grant, multi-system institution. Um, Perhaps foremost is that my experiences as a K-12 principal in a system that was a system within a system, my leadership of a Center for Integrative Leadership that was uh, intended to serve the entire institution, my role as a dean of a school that had multiple disciplines within it, and certainly now my role as a university president has taught me a level of systems thinking and systemness that I believe is essential in this institution's next president. I also believe strongly in some um, maybe softer skill kinds of things that I believe I've cultivated over a number of years. And one is that I believe fundamentally that relationships matter. That um, from, the, from, the, from the very beginning, a leader needs to understand that there's very few things of consequence or import that a leader does alone. We do it together. Leadership in many ways is a team sport. Um, and so to understand the, the importance, the fundamental importance of building uh, relationships is key. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in this state done a lot of that work in urban and rural areas with the legislature with elected tribal leaders and tribal councils across the state. And in particular, I've, as I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about something that's kind of minute, but it, it says a lot, at least in my mind. As a dean, I was charged with uh, leading the, um, or representing the Humphrey School in hosting an annual Brandle lecture in honor of the late John Brandle. And we did this in partnership with a few organizations. The one that comes immediately to mind for me right now is the Center of the American Experiment. There are things that come out of the Center of the American Experiment with which I personally disagree. Um, and I have been candid about that. My work with the founder and head of that organization was profound, and we became very good friends. And the name of the lecture series was called The Uncommon Quest for Common Ground. And our regular breakfast meetings throughout the year as we planned the lecture, probably more breakfast meetings than we needed for the lecture, became that for me, The Uncommon Quest for Common Ground. And I think that's fundamental when I say relationships matter. And I believe at this point in my career, after decades of leadership opportunities and responsibilities, I have learned fundamentally to be a reflective leader. I think a lot about what happened when things go well. I think even more about what happened when things didn't go as well as I had hoped they would. What did I learn from it? What can I do better? How can I seek to always be better? And I'm proud of that skill. I think it's a muscle that we have to exercise, and I believe I am doing it. And then finally, I would say, as a current president, 
any one of us can pick up a newspaper and see that every day there's something about how hard it is to be a university president and the great resignation and all the early retirements. And, and I have to say this, I think it's hard to be a president, but more importantly, I think it's the best job in the world. I am excited to go to work every day. I am proud to go to work every day. And I don't think there's another job, sorry to all of you who aren't in it, <laughs> I don't think there's another job where you have quite the opportunity to touch the future like you do as a university president. And that makes me excited every single day. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I will uh, ask Regent Hipsch uh, to present his question to <laughs> Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, thanks, Chair Maron, and welcome to Dr. Bloomberg. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Uh, the, my question is regarding strategic planning. The next president will lead development of a new state, statewide strategic vision and accompanying plan while overseeing completion of the current strategic impact 2025. You have been to all five of our campuses and met hundreds of people across our system. We are an R1 land grant university with a mission to serve the state of Minnesota through high quality education, knowledge creation and innovation and service to the people of this great state. Please share your vision for the University of Minnesota system and why you are the right leader to implement that vision. And please give us an example of your experience in strategic planning in your current or past positions and how you obtained buy-in from various stakeholders at the institution to adopt and advance the strategic plan. And Long do it in sorry. four minutes or less, right? <laughs> yeah. Aaron, Regent Hips. Um, I realize it's a little risky after having just said that I believe in so many ways leadership is a team sport to tell you what I think, but I think you deserve to hear what I think. So I'm going to tell you some of the ideas I've been percolating on. But first, let me start by saying I believe the mission of this land grant university is our North Star. And the mission tells us that we are to be exploring, creating, advancing new knowledge, the ever persistent um, search for truth or greater truths or greater understanding. And then we are to apply that knowledge, that creative activity, that search for truth in service to the people of the state, the nation, and the world. That is a big lofty mission and everything we do should be in service to that. I fundamentally believe that. I have watched impact 2025 from its inception to now, it is time for a new plan. I think that there are parts of that plan that are aspirational and are important and would be things that we should continue. This university should continue. Um, at the same time, I believe that there are places where we can maybe get a little bit more direct or surgical or aspirational. Um, I, I used as an example on my um, tour of Minnesota, that there are systemness goals and objectives in impact 2025 that are measures for each of the system campuses. Um, but if we really want to lean into systemness, what would we hold ourselves accountable to for goals for the systemness itself, the interweaving <laughs> of those, of those um, areas or those campuses? Um, and a really interesting conversation uh, whenever it was, two weeks ago, when I was um, uh, on the tour with a faculty member who said, you know, it, there have been times when we've had an aspirational target to achieve. And the example that, that this faculty member used was uh, back a few presidents ago when um, we aspired to be among the top three leading research institutions in the country. And he said that, that you know, some people rolled their eyes at that, but it was a target that we sought to achieve and it, it had a way of focusing our thinking. Um, and I, I tend to agree with that, that an aspirational target focuses our thinking. I believe that we need an aspirational target that has meaning to internal and external stakeholders. Um, I think that in a way we came closer to that when we talked about addressing grand challenges than this university spoke about addressing grand challenges. So I've been thinking about all of those things and I have been thinking about what must be uppermost in your minds most of the time and that is our healthcare system and where we are headed with our medical school. And I think about um, in so many ways what I believe from our mission to what's happening uh, when I say our, please know, as an alum, it's hard for me not to say our. I don't want to be presumptuous um, about your next president, so I apologize for that. Um, 
and think about not only our healthcare systems, but all of the ways across the entire state from our five system campuses to where Extension is located and all of our clinical placements, we are talking about the well-being of people and planet. And I think that there is something about that that should be woven into the next strategic plan of this university. I believe that systemness is fundamental to our future. And I believe that we have the capacity to do innovative, groundbreaking, disruptively innovative research at this institution. So what if we talked about leaning into our systemness, this way that we can integrate because we know something? I, I led the Center for Integrative Leadership. I fundamentally believe that our greatest innovations come at the intersection of things. So what if we leaned into our systemness leveraged all of our academic and intellectual assets to advance nation-leading innovations for the well-being of people and planet. Those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. And nation-leading is an aspirational goal that I fundamentally believe this institution can achieve. Um, I think about I mean, I could go on forever on this, and I realize I shouldn't. So let, let me just give you a couple of things that have been rolling around in my head. Why couldn't this be the institution that harnessed the best of artificial intelligence to rethink how we address the boondoggle that is um, financing and payment plans and coding and integration of all areas of health and well-being? Um, why couldn't this be the institution that could leverage and integrate the best of quantum computing um, and predictive analytics with large, massive data sets, bigger than any human mind could wrap our brain around, um, to predict, prevent, and, um, and uh, cure diseases? I just want to quick... Parenthetically, at Cleveland State, we're an R2 institution, a regional institution, smaller than this, but have leveraged partnerships in a really effective way. And it's the Cleveland Clinic that has now the largest quantum computing capacity, privately owned quantum computing capacity in the country. And it's just down the street from us, and our students have access to that. That could be here. That, that should be here, with all due respect to the people from Cleveland who might be zooming in and <laughs> hearing me say that. And then I think about things outside of our healthcare enterprise, but certainly encompassed within wellness. I think about things like food justice and all of the innovative work that comes out of CFANS um, and what we know about um, our egg economy and social justice and food accessibility. There are so many ways that we could lean into our systemness and advance well-being of people and planet. So let me talk about my experiences in strategic planning for a moment. I, I want to go back several years uh, to when I was uh, at um, an institute that still operates here, the Institute on Community Integration, which was um, when I was there newly designated as a center for excellence in um, developmental disabilities. It's a successful institute. I, I hope you know about it. There are times when on a yearly basis it has $20 million in, in research funding. It's impressive. Um, but I was there when we established the first big strategic plan for the institute. And I was a little befuddled because to me it looked like a lot of faculty members from different areas with different grants who had offices in the same building. But I didn't see a through line. And the challenge was to say, how are we more? How are we greater than the sum of our parts as we establish um, a strategic plan, and uh, earlier I said I'm a reflective leader, that's when I really learned how to think about reflecting on um, what it is we need to do to, to build something that's, that's a togetherness. Um, I learned that when you develop a strong strategic plan, you think deeply about what differentiates you, but also what binds you. What are the differentiators? What are the binders? You interrogate the idea and I really mean interrogate the idea of what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is our why? Why do we exist? I have thought since that time deeply about stakeholder engagement, what it means and what it looks like. And um, to be just a little bit um, 
crass for a moment, I've learned that um, engagement theater can cause harm. And I think one of the things we really need to think about in strategic planning is if we say we want everybody's voices heard, we better mean it. Um, because if there are people that we just want to inform, let's be honest about that. So I've thought very carefully about stakeholder engagement and how to do it. And particularly, I've thought about something that at the Humphrey School we talk about all the time, and that is understanding, and I have to talk with my hands, sort of a matrix of power and interest as you think about strategic planning. There are people who have a high level of power and a high level of interest. There are also people who have a high level of interest and very little traditional power. And as we think about a strategic plan for an institution that is charged with serving the people of the state, we have to think about power and interest. Because if it's only the people who have the power or the privilege to be at the table, making decisions, we, we leave a lot of people out of the equation and we have to think carefully about that. I learned those things from that first strategic planning process. Since that time, I have led strategic planning initiatives with charter school coalitions, um, with tribal communities who had received federal funding for um, adolescent health initiatives, particularly in the, in the northern part of the state, not so much in the southern part of the state. I led strategic planning for the university's Center for Transportation Studies, statewide family service collaboratives, and the West Metro Education Program, which is a, 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 an integrated school district that came out of this um, uh, state's desegregation lawsuit. Um, and I, and I want to say one more thing. Um, a, a number of years ago, I was asked to be uh, part of the strategic planning effort for the what was then called the Office of, of Research, now Office of Research and Innovation. <clears throat> um, and I was charged with a particular part of the strategic plan, which was how do we cultivate um, an ethos or a culture of serendipity in research, which I believe was the beginning of thinking about how is it that we help people from the College of Design and, um, and biological sciences and the Humphrey School find each other and collide, allow their ideas to collide and create something that is really a disruptive innovation. Um, and we did a really creative thing that I loved. We brought people together and we didn't say we're strategic planning, what do you think we should do? We said, tell us a story about your experience as an academic researcher. Tell us a story about a time that you felt real joy in your work, real joy. And then we invited everybody else in the circle who also was going to tell their story to listen to the story and mine what was really valuable in that story. And what we realized was it never happened alone. Not a single person told us a story of themselves alone in a lab. They talked about their relationship with their doctoral student or their co-PI or somebody from another department. And then out of that we built some structural things about how do, we, how do we find serendipity, those places where we can collide. I'm very proud, although I take no credit for the fact that um, we have Spark in the Office of Research now, Spark the um, Strategic Partnerships and Research Collaborations. It, it did emerge from that work, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Ruth Johnson. Thanks, Chair Mayra, and again, welcome, Dr. Bloomberg. So the University of Minnesota is the state's public health care leader and innovator, and we have a role in educating about 70% of the state's medical providers. And we certainly influence health policy in myriad ways. How does your background and experience prepare you to lead a complex academic medical center and its related clinical partnerships? Chair Mayra, Regent Johnson. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to stipulate two things here. Um, first of all, I, I, I will give you some examples. I've, I feel compelled to say something that I said in my introductory materials when I first submitted my CV, and I've said it a few times on the road. Um, uh, there is really nothing that I do as a president that I do alone. Um, I, it is a team, and there are times when I lead the team. There's times when I'm shoulder to shoulder with the team. There are times when I use my authority to enable the team to, to thrive. So examples that I give here, but also throughout the rest of our conversation this morning, 
I want you to know that I know that you know, and, and the people watching know that I don't do these things alone. Um, so I, I just want you to know that. In regard to this specific question about healthcare and academic medicine, I believe that there are leadership challenges for all of us that will extend far beyond our own lived experience, and this is truly one for me. I have not led a medical center. That's just clear and obvious from my background. Um, I am a part of a, a group of presidents who in our, um, acad or our athletic conference, the Horizon League, get together and every single one of the presidents would say, you know, some of them have years of experience to say, who ever would have thought we'd be grappling with NIL and, and collectives in collegiate athletics? You learn as you go. So I want to tell you some of the things that I rely on when I think about uh, something massive like what this institution is going to be grappling with with academic medicine. I think we need to lean heavily into our core values, um, the experiences that are comparable or tangential to it, and the practices that will um, pre prepare us well for this for this next step. Most um, closely aligned for me right now is in this time of truly massive sea change in higher education, um, there will be, I just know it, and we're seeing it in parts of the country, there will be mergers and there will be acquisitions. There will be an M&A model in higher ed, the likes of which we haven't seen for maybe ever in this country. Um, I don't take pleasure in that, but it's just our reality. And institutions like the one I lead, a regional institution that is going to, we will survive this time, but there will be um, institutions in our ecosystem who likely may not. And I want us to be prepared. I want us to be prepared to think about when is the right time to suggest a merger or perhaps an acquisition. And I obviously, I, I think you'll understand, I won't speak specifically about those in Ohio, but it's very much on my mind. And those have very different than buying a medical center from a longtime partner. But in terms of the complexity the behemoth of a challenge, in some ways, it's comparable. So I think about these things. First of all, a clear strategic plan. What is our clear strategic path for doing this? I'm aware of the LOI that this board approved um, with Fairview. Uh, and that's, that's, I would say it's a beginning, but it's not the beginning. It began way before that. That's, that seems essential. I believe that uh, the Endeavor needs a carefully curated team. I'm aware of the some of the third, I don't have all of the inside information, of course, but some of the third party vendors and experts that you are tapping to work with you, I think that is essential. Um, in a comparable way, different circumstances, we are doing the same. I think that um, outside of any third party vendors, the team, the internal carefully curated, curated team, I understand right now it, does, it includes interim President Ettinger, um, but also Vice President Franz, certainly Dr. Tolar and others. The institution needs to be crystal clear about what are the negotiables and what are the non-negotiables. Where can there be wiggle room and where can there absolutely not? And it seems very clear to me that one of the non-negotiables is that this institution is an academic medical institution, that we provide um, the, the, the training in partnership, but that is not something that we cede to others. I think I, I use the example of understanding power and interest before. I think that it, an example of this um, you have the inside information, I don't. But when I think about um, the, the narrative that I watched from afar with the potential partnership with Sanford Health was a conversation and understanding who has the power and who has the interest. And when they are misaligned, things need to change. And I candidly believe that they changed for the better there. Um, when I think about my role, vis-a-vis -vis this question about healthcare and academic medicine, I, it's a simple thing, 
But the, um, the longer I'm a leader, the less concerned I am about sounding dumb. And I am not afraid to ask a lot of questions. Um, and if I get an answer that I don't understand, I'm not afraid to say, I didn't understand that. Could you tell me again? And so when I reflect on my own practice, an area that I think about where I've had to ask a lot of questions, um, when we think about um, uh, the M&A environment that we will be facing in my current role, um, it's about things like understanding capital stack options, understanding what financing models um, may do to our S&P or, or Moody's um, financial ratings, and that's fundamentally important, and I don't want just our CFO to understand that. I want to understand that, so I ask a lot of questions. Uh, and those are the things that I, that I think about. I have been asked, my last comment here, I have been asked to serve on the National Advisory Committee for something that we're calling the P3 Partnership. It's a group of presidents and presidents teams that are gathering. Um, it's, it, it's the, the impetus really came out of Arizona State University and the University of Colorado. Um, it's a group of presidents who are very interested in thinking about how can we elevate each other's knowledge and skills around public-private partnerships. And, and that's where I go to learn a lot about who's doing this work, how are they doing it, what have we learned. And um, uh, the, the last time we gathered in Denver was uh, just a master class in thinking about what's working and what's not working in this, in this really shifting environment in higher education. And I was delighted to be asked to serve on the advisory committee to plan the next P3 partnership gathering, and, um, and, and I'm doing that actively right now. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth, if you would ask the next question. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and good morning, Dr. Bloomberg. Good morning. This question is about enrollment. Several of our campuses, as well as some collegiate units on the Twin Cities campus, have experienced enrollment declines. Although this is consistent with national trends, some universities have been able to maintain or even grow enrollment in this challenging environment. What strategies have you employed to place students and their success at the center of your work and maintain or potentially grow enrollment? Uh, Chair Mayor on Regent Farnsworth, this is a big question, <laughs> and I imagine you spend a lot of time talking about enrollment. I know I certainly do. And we know the national trends. We know the term enrollment cliff. Um, we can talk about what we knew about birth rates 18, 19, 20 years ago and how it's impacting us now. I think uh, I have a lot of opinions about this, so I want to try to crystallize a few. Um, but first, um, I, I want to say that this is an ongoing issue. I, I was a school board member for years in a public school district, Matamidi, um, and we were constantly looking at birth rates, and we were constantly thinking about what schools are we shuttering, and where do we have to move in trailers into um, parking lots because we are bursting at the seams and we need to have places for our kindergarten classes. So. In our, our birth rates and our enrollments in education ebb and flow, but we are certainly at a point where this is going to be a challenge for us for a number of years, and we have to acknowledge that. One of the most important things I think about, when I say that, I always, I always think, well, now you should say something really profound, and I don't know if this is profound, but it's one of the most important things I think about, and that is that we have reams of data, and I have learned that it reams of data do not help us unless we know how to turn it into information, usable information. So we can look at spreadsheets and trends that can say, oh my gosh, our enrollment is going down. But unless we can say, okay, so how does that compare to our market share? Is our market share getting smaller or is the whole pie getting smaller? In what areas is our enrollment going down? I know that you are, I've heard conversations about you're looking at this across um, system campuses. Uh, how does that impact how we think about systemness and the flow of students perhaps through the system? So there's a lot of questions I have about turning data into information. I also think a lot in general as a leader I think about this, but particularly with enrollment, about leveraging windows of opportunity. Imagine if every institution in the country was grappling with declining enrollment and we all said, we're going to expand online education and we're going to really lean into international education. Well, okay, it's still, at, at, there is at some point a limited N. So we could do that broadly. 
or you could do that in a surgical way. For us at Cleveland State, we thought a lot about um, online learning. It's definitely not a new thing, right? There have been online classes and full degree programs for quite some time, and we had some. Uh, but we worked with, again, with a third party vendor to really help us understand where there might be a window of opportunity that we could exploit in a way that we hadn't yet. And we did two things, um, and, it's, and it is serving us well, and we are growing enrollment in those areas. We were um, the first institution in the region to launch uh, an online uh, law degree, online JD. Um, that is, and you know, some of the concerns were, would it uh, would it take away from our in-person JD? All, all of the questions we interrogated, we launched it and it's successful. And another one was in a master's level uh, social work program. That would be different for here. But my point is data into information. So it really answers your questions. Leveraging windows of opportunity and how do we think about them? I absolutely think in a place like the University of Minnesota, this is a, an opportunity to lean into what do we really mean about systemness? If ideas, if research, if the mission can flow into and out of five system campuses, what if we thought differently? And I understand that might be a controversial um, comment, and I, I am um, not fully informed about what the implications of this would be, but what if people, what if students could flow? I, um, I think about, uh, if I may just for a moment, um, talk about the challenges that I had as a dean at the Humphrey School wanting to partner with the American Indian Studies Program at UMD, and the challenges we had with enrollment and registration and, what, and who, does, who does what with which part of the credit hours. Um, we're smart people. I think we ought to be able to figure some of that out if we really put our mind to it. And then finally, I would say, um, as we think about enrollment, and I'm going to leave the centering students part of this because I think you have another question about students and, and well-being. Um, how are we or are we in lockstep with our strategic partners? I realize that we serve the world. We also serve the state of Minnesota. And I, uh, I think a lot about this right now as a president concerned about enrollment. Um, two examples, one, I serve on what is called the Greater Cleveland Partnership Board, which is essentially the, um, the, the chamber. I, I sit on the executive board of that, and it's very important to me to have those relationships with business leaders who employ a disproportionately large percentage of our graduates. I also, and it's partly my, the educator in me, I mean, I started out as a classroom teacher in K-12 education, I asked to be invited to... Um, all of the area superintendents meetings. So um, in the greater Cleveland area, all of the first, second, and third ring superintendents meet together on a quarterly basis. And I've inserted myself into that. <laughs> um, I wanna meet them. I wanna hear what their concerns are. I wanna understand what the needs are. And it becomes a virtuous cycle because some of their needs are for hiring teachers that we are training and we're not doing a good enough job of meeting that need. At the same time, they are graduating students that we would like to attend our institution. So being a part of that strategic partnership ecosystem is very important to me. And those are some of the things that I've been focused on when it comes to enrollment. Thank you, Dr. De Bloomberg. Regent Tad Johnson, if you could um, move forward with your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, nice to see you again, Dr. Bloomberg. Good to see you. Um, my question is about leading in a diverse state. Minnesota has a unique culture, but it is not a monolith. It is home to fed 11 federally recognized tribes, as well as 5.7 million people with widely varying backgrounds, cultures, and viewpoints. It has major urban centers, small towns, and everything in between. If you are selected as president, you will be expected to lead on issues such as tribal relations, creating inclusive campuses where all students can thrive, and connecting the university with all parts of the state. Please give examples of how you did this in your current or previous roles. Another just really short question that I can answer. Just <laughs> Chair Mayor on 
Uh, Regent Johnson, thank you. I, I, I think about a lot of examples, and I didn't know you would be the person asking me this question, but I want to start with, um, again, the, the, these questions have created such an opportunity for reflection and, and to really probe myself personally. What, what do I think, and what, what has shaped me in this way? And I, I think a lot um, about work that I did a, a number of years ago it was while I was leading the Center for Integrative Leadership, I was asked to be the external evaluation consultant to all the northern tribes um, when there was a massive influx of federal funding, flow through funding from the state to tribal communities to support um, health and well-being for adolescents, um, looking at chemical dependency in a culturally relevant way. And in, um, in a in a crazy way, um, I was tapped to do the external evaluation work and set about really trying to understand um, the, the, the tribal traditions, the structure, the, um, the ways in which as a, as a white woman, I could enter into the tribal communities and, and be respectful. So the first time I went, I was doing this on uh, Mille Lacs, Fond du Lac, Leech, um, White Earth, a lot of time in White Earth, and the Red Lake Nation. Um, the first time I went, I thought I was so prepared. I knew all the tribal chairs' names. I'd studied the tribal council. I had um, tobacco ties, tobacco pouches. I understood what I thought I needed to do. And I was very quickly knocked down to size. Um, I won't name the person, but I met with a tribal chair, and I... I think I did a pretty embarrassing job of helping them understand how much I knew about them. <laughs> And she said to me, so I'm, I'm impressed that you've done your homework. What do you know about yourself? What do you know about who you are in this place, as a white woman in, in this place? And that individual used a, a story of a turtle. Um, it was a long story. I'll make it really quick. Uh, but she was talking about my role on the tribe coming in to do this evaluation work and build their evaluation capacity. And she said, you know, if you see a turtle walking along a path, uh, especially a little child, might know that the belly, the underside of the turtle, ha usually has a beautiful pattern. Um, and as a kid, you might see that turtle going about their way, and you want to see it, so you pick it up, and you turn it over, and you look at its pattern. And it's pretty, you don't hurt the turtle, and you set it back down. You haven't really caused any harm. You've learned something. You've enjoyed the experience of seeing what the belly of the turtle did, but you impeded the turtle's progress. You didn't do anything for the turtle. So how are you going to think about coming up here as an evaluator and not just turning us over looking at our belly and thinking that you've done what you needed to do? And it set me on a journey not only in thinking about the tribes, but in thinking about cultural differences in general as an academic, as a scholar, as a leader. What am I doing to to build, to lift us all up, to create um, partnerships that are, are equitable and, and just. And I think about that a lot. Um, I thought about that as the president or the principal of a K-12 school that was uh, quite diverse, um, uh, primarily African or African American, but diverse in terms of where the students came from um, in countries across Africa, um, as well as African American students and all of the cultural differences that they brought. And I think about that now um, as a president of a regional institution in a state, in the state of Ohio, where there is pending legislation that would say the ways in which we address diversity, equity, and inclusion are are not right and would be eliminated. Um, I have had to um, come to terms with the fact that I need to be public about my opposition to that piece of legislation at the same time that I have and work to build relationships with the legislators advancing that legislation. It's a both and. It takes me back to the uncommon quest for common ground, and I, I work on that a lot. Um, one last example, here in the state of Minnesota for a number of years, I was a part of leading um, uh, a Finding Common Ground series where we brought unlikely partners together to find common interests and advance common legislation. And the one that particularly comes to mind was to work with rural farmers who had opinions about um, water quality and easement rights around waterways and um, people who were active as lake owners, lake 
Pacific Shore homeowners or um, involved in the tourist industry who had a different idea about how it is that we should be thinking about our beautiful waterways in this state. We brought people together and facilitated conversations that were civil, tense, but effective. And it underscores for me exactly what you say in this question. It is a, there is a culture of Minnesota, but there are many, 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 many subcultures within it. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, just to let you know, I think you've got about 35 minutes left. All right. And of course, we have uh, lots of questions to ask you, and you have lots to say. And to be honest, we want to hear every bit of it, but I also want to be respectful of our other candidates' time as well. So with that, what I just said won't count against your time. <laughs> <laughs> Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to ask you about student success. Uh, students are central to everything we do at the University of Minnesota. Please share with us uh, how you've promoted, or first of all, your definition of student success, and provide examples how you have promoted academic success, enhanced the student experience, and addressed issues such as mental wellness, campus safety, and food insecurity, uh, both in the graduate and undergraduate uh, context. Chair Mayeron. Regent Kenyanya, um, I'll do this one in two minutes or less. Let's see. <laughs> um, I, IPEDS, the federal government, gives us definitions that talk about persistence, um, retention, and graduation. That is important and insufficient in my mind. Student well-being has got to be, or student success has got to include a vision for what does it mean to be well as a student. How do we support the whole student? And when we do that well, not only do we graduate well-prepared students, Students, but we send them on a journey of lifelong learning. That, to me, is student success. One of the things that I have done, perhaps the most important thing that I have done, um, uh, is very recent. Over the past year, we have restructured how we think about student uh, success, student affairs, student services, student counseling, student career development and exploration at Cleveland State University and built a brand new division, conceived of and built a brand new division called the Division of Student Belonging and Success. Um, we have let go of terms, and this is not an indictment of any place that uses these terms, but we've let go of terms like student services, student affairs, and leaned into student belonging. And when you belong, we believe you bring your full self, not your perfect self, your full self. Um, we will all have varying times in our life where we will be more or less mentally healthy, more or less physically healthy, more or less focused on scholarship. Um, we want to have a structure that pulls um, all of the things that in, at our institution were situated in different parts of the university, pulls it together and says, we're going to put the student in the center of this equation and build around the student. And we built the Division of Student Belonging and Success. And I can tell you a, a whole lot more about that, but I said two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Turner, there you are. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see Regent Turner? On your I screen, am. Dr. Hello, Boomer? Regent Turner. All right. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Dr. Bloomberg, and I uh, apologize for not being there in person, but I just got off my night shift at the hospital. So Wow. Um, anyway, I got question number seven, relationship development. The University of Minnesota is a mission-focused, premier public land-grant university, and Minnesotans feel a great deal of pride and ownership in it. In addition to students, faculty, and staff, there are many other important stakeholders, relationships that need to be nurtured. Please talk about your approach and experience in building relationships with the following. A, students, faculty, and staff. B, unions. C, elected leaders, D, donors, and E, governing boards. <coughs> As you address relationships with these stakeholders, please offer examples of how you have navigated and resolved disagreements with any of them. Another short question. Easy. Peasy. Easy. Let's Peasy. do this yeah. really yeah. quick. <laughs> Chair Maron, Regent Turner, thank you for that one multi-part question. <laughs> 
Um, so I, I have them in front of me. That's what I'm looking at. So I, and I'll just very quickly tell you a, a good day for me is a good day when I'm with students. I every day try to walk through campus. Um, every day I'm in Cleveland, I endeavor to walk through campus. Um, I when asked to list references uh, for this position, I did not hesitate to list our faculty senate president. Um, as a reference, it's somebody who, and again, we don't agree on everything. The thing is, we disagree in good faith because we have a common priority. Um, we are at Cleveland State, our faculty have an AAUP chapter and a collective bargaining agreement, so we are a unionized faculty. Uh, the provost and I, uh, the provost and I also have a really close relationship, but we meet uh, monthly. Not only we have a regular ongoing cadence of relationships with our faculty senate, but also with our union leadership um, so that we're not at the table only when we're negotiating a contract. We're at the table persistently and regularly looking at where we have commonalities, where there are things that we need to address, and perhaps most importantly, building trust. That's different than co-optation. That's different than saying, now we're going to come to the table and we're not going to have any tense moments, because sometimes there are. What it is is we're going to understand um, that we, we trust each other. Um, I have years of experience working with elected leaders. Uh, when I was a school board member, I was also the chair of the Association for Metropolitan School Districts, and in that capacity testified, um, this might age me, but um, it was, I believe I was testifying during the Arnie Carlson administration, the, the go Governor Ventura, and then also Governor um, Pawlenty, I believe. Um, so I, I have I have testified a lot right now. I have a good working relationship with the governor of the state of Ohio, Governor DeWine. He was among the first people, his office was the first people I called when I knew that my name was going to be made public as a finalist. The next call was to the mayor of Cleveland, uh, Justin Bibb, who has become uh, a good friend and certainly a trusted colleague. Uh, governing boards, I just want to tell you this very quickly because I think it's, um, for me, it's been a big learning experience. My first board meeting as a president, I wanted to be so prepared. I have a, you know, I'm sure you're all wonderful, but I just got to tell you, I work for the best board of trustees you could possibly imagine. We have a really strong relationships. Um, uh, and the board chair was another person I named as a reference. Um, but my first meeting, we were bringing a very consequential contract uh, to the board. It was actually the contract to do the online JD and, and social work contract, and it, the dollar amount exceeded what I could approve as a president alone. So we brought it to the board, and by about their second or third question, I quickly became aware that I was unprepared. I was insufficiently prepared, and my team, but I will own it, was insufficiently prepared to answer the board's questions. It was not my finest moment as a president, and they voted to, to table the decision. And afterwards, these trustees who had just hired me were kind of falling over themselves saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but we had to do this. And I said, of course you had to do it, and please don't apologize. If you had done it, none of us would have lived up to our fiduciary responsibilities. And it set us on a path, well, certainly it set me on a path for always being more prepared than I was in that first meeting, but it set us on a path for having an authentic and honest relationship where we, we get things right together. And if I don't get it right, I forgive myself, but I learn and we move on. Um, and with donors, I just, uh, when I left here a week ago after my tour of the state, I got on a plane and flew to Naples, Florida. And that's where I've been the last several days meeting with donors and alums of Cleveland State who have homes down there. I think all of, all university leaders at some point in the year make their way to Naples, Florida, it would seem. <laughs> um, and I, it was a, a wonderful time. I thoroughly enjoy meeting with donors, with our alums. It was breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day, and, and it was um, a ton of fun. Uh, and I'll stop there. I have some other examples, but I, I wanna make sure that we get through all the questions. All right, thank you very much. Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair May Run, and welcome back, Dr. Blooper. Higher education generally and university presidents specifically are under fire across the country. Please tell us about a stand that you took on a difficult academic or social issue that required courage of conviction. 
We are particularly interested in examples involving academic freedom and freedom of expression, which have been at the forefront of recent debates across the country. How did you communicate with the university community and the media about this difficult academic or social issue, and how did the various constituents respond, and what did you learn from that experience? Wow. Chair Mayor on Regent Davenport, this is a big question in higher education right now. We all know that. Um, so I will just get really real with you about this. Um, first of all, Cleveland State, before I became the president, before I became the provost there, um, received a blue ribbon rating from FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, um, and has a strong, strong stand on um, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and academic freedom. That's the environment I stepped into, and I'm proud of it, and I support it. In particular, I think about the Chicago Statement, and I think that that challenges us in higher education as we think about things like being respectful of um, uh, people with multiple identities, respectful of people from different cultures, even as we protect speech. We have codes of conduct, and we say there are certain things that we don't do within this setting, within this community of learners, but fundamentally, we protect speech. Um, so I will talk about a decision I made uh, about the middle of October of this past year following um, the tragedies that were unfolding in the Middle East. Uh, I, I spoke to the Faculty Senate uh, after having issued a statement that really urged people to step away from their keyboards and towards each other. On our campus, we have Palestinian students. We have many, many Muslim students who are not Palestinian but feel um, a strong uh, affinity. We do have Palestinian faculty members. We have Jewish students. We have some students and faculty who have uh, family in Israel. We have Jewish students who are very um, pro um, Zionism and Jewish students who are very anti-Zionism. We have it all, as does this campus, I'm sure. Uh, I thought heavily about the Calvin Report, which is a report that preceded the Chicago Statement. It was written um, near the end of the Vietnam War, and it was in specific response to this question, what is the role of a university president in big geopolitical events at that time like the Vietnam War? And there's a particular line um, in the Calvin Report that I cited um, that day when I spoke to the Faculty Senate. And it says, for the university to attempt to declare a collective position on an issue could automatically censure those members of its community who disagreed with that position. So I talked about that. I said, I've made a statement. I want us to care for each other on this campus, all of us on this campus. Um, but I will not speak um, further on matters of geopolitics. I will be the container for speech within the institution. And shortly after that, um, an organization, a nonprofit organization in Cleveland took out a full page ad in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the, the Star Tribune of Cleveland. Um, and it was simply going to say at the top, we stand with Israel, not the people of Israel, but we stand with Israel, the government of Israel, the state of Israel. And they were asking for people to sign it, to fill the page, and asked for me to sign on behalf of Cleveland State University. Um, and I declined. It was a fairly uh, public absence, um, but I thought heavily about speech. I thought heavily about the nature of our community. I do not have an opinion about how others who decided to sign it felt. But in that moment, I knew that I could not speak for everybody, for the 15,000 students and several thousand staff and faculty and, and sign it. So I did not. Um, that took moral courage and it took a little bit of um, uh, relationship development. Our, our board was divided on this, and, um, and I don't know what would have happened if the board had taken it to a vote, but one of the things we did talk about was if there is anybody who could speak, anybody who could speak on behalf of the entire institution at that point, perhaps it should be the board and not the president, and the board declined to advance that 
idea and we did not sign the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to our next question, Regent Gully. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much, Dr. Bloomberg. It's really great. To Regent Gully, can you move your oh. microphone a little closer? Thank you. Yeah, maybe I could speak up a little bit too. <laughs> thank you so much. We're really glad to have you here. Um, how would you describe your leadership style? Um, what does it look like in action? And can you specifically think about examples that give us insight into how you build, support, and motivate a leadership team? And um, describe a time when you made a difficult decision that was upsetting to a specific stakeholder group. And how did you make that decision? And how did you engage the stakeholder group after the decision was made? <laughs> Chair Mayor and Regent Gully, I uh, I just have to say when I was when I was listening to your deliberations about um, the the finalists, I appreciated very much something you said about um, disagreement and dissent. Uh, and I I thought about that as I was thinking about my own leadership style. I believe when good people come together in good faith to advance a mission, we have to bring all of ourselves, our opinions and our beliefs. And so I appreciated your comment about that. And I just wanted the opportunity to tell you, I believe I'm a relational leader. Um, I'm a communicator. I, um, some people, we jokingly say I'm not a fancy president. I just, it's sort of what you see is what you get. I, I don't know how to be anything other than myself. Um, and that's just how I approach my leadership. I try always, and admittedly, there are times I fall short, I try to model what I expect to see in others, which is respect, honesty, integrity. I am pretty unflappable. I don't find getting mad um, to be very productive, and I, and I, I, I can get at, I can, I can be vehement, I can come on really strong, but I don't lose my temper because it's a waste of energy, and I need all my energy to, to do the job well. Um, and fundamentally, over time, I have come to learn that wisdom and insight is not tied to title and prestige. Um, some of my greatest mentors uh, don't have fancy titles, but they have a ton of wisdom and help me be a better leader every day. Um, a quick example of motivating a team. This is, this is maybe not the best example, but it's something that we do. Um, the DISC assessment, I don't need to go into details, but is an assessment that really helps us understand how we behave in relationship to a team. And I ask my leadership team to all complete the DISC assessment, and then we've mapped it so you can doesn't matter but you, so you can see how different we are on things like the people who will read the manual from cover to cover and then read it again before they pick up their new cell phone and me who would sooner you know throw the phone out the window than read the whole manual um, we understand our differences and I keep that in front of me so that when we're knocking heads about something make it sound like we always disagree and we don't but we remind ourselves we come not only with different generations and racial backgrounds and cultural traditions, we also come with different tendencies in how we lead. And I, I think we need to acknowledge that. And that's one of the things that I really think about when we build a team. Um, a decision that I made, what was it, was it that, that uh, caused conflict or people disagreed with and how do we get through that? Um, part of our current strategic plan at Cleveland State had us realigning colleges, partly for immediate cost savings, but almost more so for long-term efficiencies and a better way of bringing programs together. We realigned and created three new colleges, a college of health, a, a, a core college of arts and sciences. We went back to a very traditional model of arts and sciences at the core of the institution. Um, and a college of public affairs and education. Uh, it's hard, it's sort of a who moved my cheese kind of hard when you do that and you move things around. Um, but there was a vote, it was approved, we were moving forward. Then there was the question of all the myriad things that have to happen front of house and back of house, if you will, to realign colleges. Um, I made the decision that we would uh, make the move sooner rather than later. We would not have all our ducks in a row. We would advance a public 
vision of a college of health, the three new colleges, and then after that behind the scenes catch up. So imagine a duck on a smooth lake and they're paddling underwater like crazy. That's what we were doing um, for a year to get our financial systems and our student records and everything else to follow what on the surface on the homepage of our website looked like three new colleges. And I did that because there were people who were never going to support this decision. And until it was done, they were going to take a lot of time and energy and tending as we got to this decision that we had voted to do. So I said, July 1, we will be those new colleges. Our students who graduate from the fall will graduate under the flags of those new colleges. And then we'll take the next year um, to catch up. People did on the cabinet even, did some, did disagree with that decision. And so what we did was really work hard to say, what do you need to make this so? What do you need to get this work done? And let's make the resources available. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll uh, proceed to the candidate specific questions <laughs> that we have, and we'll start with Regent El Rabi. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, this is one of two questions about leadership style. The question is, describe a situation where you collaborated with your team to set goals. How did you ensure each team member's input was valued? And what measures did you take to secure their commitment and buy-in to the shared objectives? What impact did this collaborative goal-setting approach have on, achieve, on achieving successful outcomes? I want to give you a really concrete example. It's not huge, um, but it's specific and it's recent. Um, we are um, grappling with declining enrollment like so many institutions are and facing a subsequent budget deficit, structural ongoing operating deficit. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, we have aspirational goals and related objectives and activities that we want to implement in service to the strategic plan we're operating under. Um, so in August, we had a cabinet retreat um, which was essentially a day at my house. It wasn't fancy. You know, we, have, we, we, we prepared food together. We sat, hung around my dining room table, the 13, 14 of us, um, and worked on these strategic goals. And what we said was, okay, this is, what we, this is what we've set about doing. These are the six goals and the 27 objectives. I don't know the exact number. Let's get real with ourselves about what we also have to do this year, which is to close an operating deficit, launch some new online degree programs, some other things that we have to do in addition to these. And then, oh, also, by the way, think about what may be on the horizon in terms of potential. I hasten to add potential mergers and acquisitions that weren't a part of the strategic plan. We used, you're familiar with, dots um, to identify. And what we did dots. was to we say, it's <laughs> great. Um, what do we know for sure we have to do? And just, you know, no, the, the board wasn't there. No one needed to know. Where do we say, you know, we say we're going to do this, but we're really not going to do it this year. We can't get to it. And what are the things that we should try to get to, um, but, but we may not be able to? Let's just be honest with each other. And then we looked at where we had agreement. More importantly, we said, put your name next to the things that you know you will have to be the lead on. So if we're going to be talking about launching the Division of Student Belonging and Success, our inaugural vice president that I named already, we knew who she would be. Obviously, she would be the, lay, the, the lead. But then I also said, put your name next to the places where you're going to be right next to the person where you're gonna say, I got you on this. I wanna be your right hand person. I wanna help you. So every one of us had to put ourselves out there and say, I don't think we're gonna to get to this this year. I know you're in charge of this. I'm gonna be right behind you. I'm gonna be your person. I put my, I wrote my name there. It was a really important exercise in, in making sure that every member of the team had a voice and a say, but also very intentionally sharing accountability for getting done the things that we said we were gonna get done. It was a good process, I'd do it again. Thank you. Regent Fairhalen. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, thank you for your patience through this process. It's been a long morning already, but I have one more question for you. 
Um, working in dynamic environments often requires navigating between innovative approaches and proven best practices. Can you share with us a specific situation where you had to make a decision that involved balancing these two aspects? How did you ensure that your team was aligned with that chosen approach and what impact did it have on the overall success of the project or initiative? I will use an example that Chair Mayeron, Regent for Halen. I forgot before, I'm getting this right. But, um, <laughs> I'll use the example I used before to save time, the, the launching a new division of student belonging and success. It was a big darn deal because we really were, you know, if people are most concerned about the size of their portfolio and I was taking things out of per people's portfolios, we needed to make sure that we had a strong core of support to do this. So we started almost a year in advance, um, but at least eight months in advance by pulling together a team to grapple with some thought experiments first. Not, not the president wants to launch a division of student belonging and success, how are we gonna make it happen? It was what would it look like, sound like, and feel like if we put the students in the center of a thought experiment that said, um, every student on this campus, whether they join us virtually or in person, will feel like they belong here. What does that look like, sound like, feel like? Um, so we started there and that, that, uh, that team began to coalesce around a recommendation. That was essential to do that first before we built this, because again, when you pull things and say, I'm, this, is, this is coming out of your portfolio of work and it's going to become a part of a whole new division, there will be a sense of loss. There will be people who feel like, eh, I probably could have done this better myself. The jury is still out. We just launched this in October. We're measuring impact right now. Um, but it also, um, it, it, um, it, I believe it's innovative. I stand behind it. It also changes some tried and true practices, not least of which this vice president doesn't come from the field of student affairs. Again, I hasten to add, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is a best practice. This was a window of opportunity. And we have a faculty member who came up through education, who, came, who understands the community, and who who lives the vision of students at the center of everything. She really gets it. Um, an African-American leader who uh, was, was raised in an environment that gave her a sense of empathy for the vast majority of our students who struggle. And that's the person who I named to be the inaugural vice president, not a staff person from faculty or from student affairs, but a faculty member um, from the institution. Some people, that raised eyebrows for some people. Um, but because we started with a team approach, I'm confident that we have the support we need to do it. Thank you. That concludes our 11 questions. 11 um, questions. 11 questions. 36 um, questions, really. We had no questions of clarification as we went through. So let me ask, uh, go around the table, does anybody have any follow-up questions? I believe that Regent Verhalen does. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, and I do just have one follow-up question. When we spoke about relationship development, you talked about how you walk through the campus at Cleveland State on a regular basis when you're there. Given that we have campuses across the state that you've had the pleasure of visiting in the last couple weeks, how would you bring that forward to nurturing those relationships across those campuses as well? Um, when I was at Morris, uh, an, uh, uh, an individual there, a stakeholder there said, would you commit to spending more than one day, like five days a semester on our campus? And I said, well, I've, one, I don't have the job. Two, I'm not going to commit to anything right now. But I'm very intrigued by that idea. Um, I, I am familiar with all of the campuses. Prior to my visit this time, I've been on all the campuses. I really have an affinity for all parts of this state. And I think that it's essential for a president to be present on all of those campuses. So can I promise five days every semester on every campus? I'm not sure. But the idea is a good one. The other thing, though, is that we have chancellors um, on all of those campuses. And the role of the president in their space, I think, should be a negotiated relationship. I also, though, think about um, all of the clinical placements and all of the places where this land-grant institution has extension presence. And, um, 
and there's there's opportunities to build relationships with elected representation in St. Paul, I mean, from all parts of the state, uh, and opportunities to, you know, when you think about the great Minnesota get-together, there's places where um, I believe a president can really build relationships in a common area as well. Thank you. We have another uh, follow-up question from Regent Turner. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mayor Ron. Um, um, Dr. Bloomberg, in your um, Twin City Forum, you were asked about uh, union negotiations. And I specifically, you were, were, for, were referring to spreading of resources due to declining enrollment and aging infrastructure. Um, as a president, how do you intend to balance the spreading of resources with the need to provide higher livable wages and um, particularly for our lowest paid workers um, who basically keep the university running, our food service, our, our grad students, our, you know what I mean, the main um, boots on the ground work. Mm -hmm. Regent Turner, thanks for that question, and it's good to see you. Um, uh, so it, it, it's a vexing problem. The pie is only so big. Uh, I, there's a couple of things that I believe to be true. First of all, um, uh, there are there is a fundamental need for the people of a university to make it a university. It's the capacity of the humans engaged that really make us who we are. It's not this building. It's not our labs without people. It is our people. And we have got to take care of our people. It's just a fundamentally true reality. There's also the reality that resources are limited, um, infrastructure ages, enrollments decline, and there are difficult decisions to make. I understand that that is contested ground and we have to balance it, but the well-being of our people is key. The assets that we have to bring to those discussions are many. Salary is obviously one, Benefits is another. And so how we negotiate that is a, a key factor. I am comfortable in that space. I can't speak to the specifics of any contract negotiation right now. But the other thing I will say um, is that I, in the outside of the forum, in uh, the reception, I think it was on the Twin Cities campus, I was talking to a graduate student, so I know that um, they're negotiating their first union contract, I believe, and, and that individual said, what do you think about the fact that some people have told us if we make more money, there will be fewer of us? Um, and I said, well, I think that might be a reality. I don't know all the circumstances, but I do know federal grants, for instance. And if you have federal grants that fund graduate students and only so big a pie, it might be that there are fewer opportunities. That's a reality. But I don't know specifically across the whole collective bargaining agreement. Um, so I think that my experience in working in a collective bargaining arena, in a, a, arena or environment is that a good place to start is with our core values. What are our core values? And then I'd lean into the other things that I've talked about earlier. What are our negotiables? What are our non-negotiables? Um, and I truly believe that the core value at the heart of it all is that the people who serve this institution are our greatest asset. Thank you. Uh, last follow-up question is from Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, I was just following up on your answer to the first um, candidate-specific question about where you talked about your cabinet retreat in mm -hmm. um, strategic planning, and I'm just curious, um, you know, briefly in the interest of time, um, if you could talk about then um, after that exercise, where did the boards, like how did that intersect then with the board and the board's responsibilities for maybe reacting to that um, output mm -hmm. from that uh, retreat, which I think sounds like a solid exercise, and kind of then how did that go through the rest of the process? It was a funny thing that day. Um, we had a, a reception at the president's home that evening um, for new faculty. And uh, we lost track of time as we were doing this exercise. And all of a sudden, the caterers showed up. And we had 
junk everywhere, dirty dishes all over that you've never seen a group of vice presidents load a dishwasher and clean a kitchen so fast in your life. It was an amazing, that was the real teamwork part. <laughs> um, but what we did was we, we took the whole structure that we had built and massaged it into what looks a lot like your, um, are they called maroon and gold measures, your objectives, uh, um, underneath goals, um, what metrics we're going to hold ourselves accountable for. So we had a public facing one that said, these are the things that we recommend we table for this year. And we brought that to the board because the board needed to approve. They ultimately become the, my accountability report. So we brought them and said, respectfully, we suggest that we should be honest with ourselves. And this is, these are things that we're just not going to be able to get to. We had the full support of the board to do that. The, the public facing one did not have all the names on it. It was those measures. And then there's a couple of yellow ones. So we have actions, green, yellow, red, and then we have progress, green, yellow, red. So the yellow ones, we'll do them if we have the bandwidth, are things that we're still negotiating right now. Um, behind the scenes, at a cabinet meeting, I have the chart that has the names on it. So I know who's, who said I'm going to be a part of advancing this. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, what a morning, eh? It's been fun. I <laughs> uh, want to give you an opportunity, if you would like, a couple minutes to make any closing remarks to us before we take a break and move on to the next candidate. Um, I will, one last time, I've said it on every stop of my tour de Minnesota. Um, <laughs> you should be, and I'm not just saying this because Mr. Steves is sitting next to you, you should be so proud of the board office um, that serves and supports you. The, um, the structure and the organization of this process has been, I mean, as a, as a president, it's, I would say it's the envy of people who um, need to be embarking on this kind of a president search. I have felt um, uh, respected, well-tended, monitored, <laughs> uh, but everything has gone so smoothly and I'm grateful for that. On a personal level, um, I want, as an alum, uh, I want you to pick the best possible president for this institution that we all love. Um, to be sitting here before you, regardless of what comes next, is just, um, I said it before, it's a pinch me moment. It still feels that way. This institution has poured so much into me and so much into my family for generations that it's just truly an honor to be here sitting before you today. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bloomberg. Uh, that concludes this interview. We're going to take a 15-minute re recess, and then we will resume with our next candidate, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you very much. Um, do you need a watch or something? <laughs> 15 minutes to play. <laughs> Would you follow him along? We <laughs> 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 got a phone or something that you can look at. Was, <laughs> my phone's on the Nairobi time zone.
Minnesota. Okay. Are you ready? The special meeting of the Board of Regents will now come to order. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Hello, Dr. Cunningham. Yes, right over there. Thank you. Tell me whenever you're ready. I know you want to get set up. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Dr. Cunningham, and welcome. The board, as you know, has a series of questions prepared for our time together today. For your information, each candidate will respond to the same nine questions from the board and two questions tailored to that particular candidate. If there is sufficient time at the end of the interview, we will give you an opportunity to ask us questions. And with that, Regent Wheeler, will you get us started on the first question? I will. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And, and Dr. Cunningham, it's a delight to meet you and welcome in. Um, my question has to do with why you. We've all listened and watched the finalist campus forums. Your presentations and responses to questions were informative and thorough. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. What do you believe differentiates you and what should cause us to say you are our next president? In other words, what do you want us to know about you that should get us especially excited about you serving as our next president? Thank you. Uh, and an honor and a privilege to, to be here today and with thanks for the opportunity for the entire process and the smooth logistics really that I've experienced up till now with many thanks to your staff. So. Uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, why I think you should be excited is I know regents are busy and busy leaders of the campus. And uh, I'm hoping you see in my candidacy somebody who can step in immediately and serve across all parts of your tripartite mission immediately, um, helping to lead your multi-billion dollar organization across all of your missions, including the upcoming health system issues, and be up and running immediately. And I want to speak to a couple parts of that, of why I'm excited and why I hope that you're excited. And I'm going to start with the part of your mission that's really around education and a role in higher, uh, higher education. And so, um, you know, my candidacy brings the leadership of uh, a higher ed administrator working on a central main campus on campus issues for the past seven years. You know, I think in the, uh, in the press, and there's even a little bit of some confusion of uh, needing to make some maybe choice around, you know, there's that MD thing, but is she an educator? Does she understand higher education administration? So let me speak to that sort of directly at first. So first of all, um, separate than that shiny MD thing, I'm a tenured faculty in a school of public health, the same as any other tenured faculty across an engineering school, policy school, uh, or literature, science, and arts school. I've worked on the ground in educating. I've educated master's students, undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs. I've developed curriculum, online curriculum, worked on accreditation. I'm an educator uh, in a main campus scenario, as well as the other work that I've done. And in fact, the, the reason that I have the position I have now on campus is probably in spite of being an MD, not because of being an MD. It's usually a role that's held by engineers. Um, and so in, in that role, in addition to all the work on the ground doing education work, I've also had the opportunity for the last seven years to work in the higher ed administration, working on issues like undergraduate student success, uh, like working at the system level across our campuses. And so I just want to be really clear for as a board that you don't need to make a choice between whether you're supporting your health system campus or whether you're supporting your main campus issues around enrollment and the systemness of that. I bring to you deep experience across both of those portfolios. About a decade ago, I made a choice on whether I was going to continue my leadership experience um, within uh, the, me the medical side and the health side, or whether I was going to advance my career really in higher ed administration. And I chose higher ed administration. And with that, I sit at the president's table of a Big Ten peer AAU university 
um, and, and bring to you all the experience that that has to bear. So there's no need to make a choice between those two parts on the educational component. Another part uh, where I hope you can really get excited is I do bring deep administration experience around research. You're a research powerhouse. You should be so proud of the, the research uh, that and the knowledge generation and the knowledge to action for your communities that this university uh, contributes, not just on the main campus, but in engaged learning in Morris and in uh, research comprehensive uh, teaching in uh, at Duluth, and I bring to you uh, that experience that I think can help propel your university here as a research powerhouse, which will advance all of your missions. When we advance one, we advance the other parts of our missions as well, to being really a top five public land grant um, uh, in research. Um, on the other part of your tripartite mission, certainly around service, service to communities, I have a long experience in that role that I hope excites you. Uh, the press has picked up on it a little bit here and there. Uh, but also in a big part of your service to communities is your healthcare service to communities, and I certainly can speak to that in detail. There's a couple other reasons, though, where I, I hope you're excited and I'm excited. Um, uh, as one is on the policy front, I have decades of experience in government relations on the Hill, both in the State House and in federally. I oversee a government relations portfolio currently. Um, I've uh, I'm not only experienced and enjoy uh, uh, working on explaining the value of higher education in both the state and federal landscape. I've testified federally uh, in front of Congress on this as well, a subcommittee. Um, so I'm committed. I've met with all of our uh, state policymakers, um, the vast majority of them, including our governor or governor staff, just in the few past short months. Um, I'm experienced in this, so not only have I done it, am I committed to doing that for you, um, but I've been effective at it. Um, I recently have been able to uh, move forward an initiative uh, with the university and the state that will, has, has advanced. I've been on point for leading this, on point for discussing it um, uh, with, in our, with our policy folks in getting a commitment for the state of Michigan that's hundreds of millions of dollars. That's the largest commitment in state history. Um, and I've been on, on point for that. And it has to do with um, not just asking for money, but with describing the value of, of what we're bringing and partnership to the state. And so I can be effective there. I think you should be excited about my candidacy. Um, and I haven't, we haven't talked very much about this, but because of my management experience, you're asking me to come in and lead a senior management team with a complex, large budget. Uh, and I have experience in doing that. And I know uh, perhaps folks think everything is uh, perfect at some other university in some other way. Uh, but when I stepped into my portfolio, which is a large portfolio spanning uh, multiple system campuses, there were many areas of that that needed to be dusted off. Uh, some of those areas were best in class for 1995 or 2002. Um, they needed to be addressed. They needed to be streamlined. They needed to be organized. The areas that had strengths needed to be augmented. Um, I worked through with uh, senior seasoned experience management um, uh, skills in, in doing those parts and even sunsetting things that really no one could describe their mission appropriately to me. And I'm willing and able to do that work. Uh, finally, I think you should be excited about my candidacy because uh, uh, really of the experience I have um, at a Big Ten Midwest public uh, table. Um, I work, um, the Big Ten administrators, as you may know, across your table all work with each other across the Big Ten. I'm familiar with uh, many of the, uh, the work across our Big Ten and why that's specific. And in fact, when I had to dust off some of those portfolios and address them, we go to our Big Ten peers and we see what's working and what's not working um, and bring in expertise and how we can move ahead and do better. And I'm comfortable at that, at that table in the last seven years, again, separate from the health system, System issues. I've worked through um, major issues that are the same issues that your Big Ten University is facing, issues around uh, from COVID to social unrest. Um, uh, I've done that through the, the leadership of three presidents and three provosts, giving me the opportunity, as many of you know, uh, when leadership transition happens, to step into a wide variety of roles um, and lean in well beyond typical portfolios and manage those transitions. So I think you should be excited because I think my job is to help you sleep well at night. Uh, <laughs> and I'm uh, willing and uh, have the energy and the values uh, to be able to step into that portfolio right away, keep your momentum, and be up and running. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Regent Hipsch, if you would ask the next question. Uh, thanks, Chair Maron, and welcome uh, back to Minnesota, uh, Dr. Cunningham. So the next president will lead development of a new system-wide strategic vision and accompanying plan while overseeing completion of the current strategic uh, impact 2025. You've been to all five of our campuses and met hundreds of people across our system. We are an R1 land grant university with a mission to serve the state of Minnesota through high quality education, knowledge creation, innovation, and service to the people of this great state. 
Please share your vision for the University of Minnesota system and why you are the right leader to implement that vision. And please give us an example of your experience in strategic planning in your current or past position and how you obtain buy-in from various stakeholders at the institution to adopt and advance the strategic plan. Thank you. So I, I, I believe vision is almost everything. Everything flows from a vision and a common vision, and it's great to have operational tactics and metrics and to know that we have to have so many apples by so many year. But it's really important to drive purpose in, um, across our people, all across our, our, our university, to know why we're doing that and where we're trying to run together. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a, a vision, although I want to put in a disclaimer, and obviously a real vision would need to be co-created by both the board as well as by uh, um, the community at large. Uh, but having been to all of your campuses in the past week, you know, I'll posit that in, in 2030, a vision for the system of the University of Minnesota is that there will be a coordinated, efficient, smooth functioning system of a diverse, uh, of diverse campuses, each with a distinct differentiated mission uh, that is uh, stronger and greater than the sum of any one of its campuses that will provide excellence in education, knowledge generation, community impact, innovation in pedagogy and healthcare delivery to improve the lives of our students and improve the lives of people in Minnesota. I'll say one of the reasons, uh, as, as you got to know me in the last week, I also got to know you, and one of the reasons this position is so exciting is to realize how important the set, how where you are right now and the interest in you setting a vision across your system campuses as a system. This is something I've been working on uh, for the past couple of years at the University of Michigan and is, um, uh, again, sort of dear to the values that I have in terms of how we operate uh, as greater than the sum of our parts. So with some specifics, I'll say um, our leadership team, and I've, I've been part of the setting right now, we've been in the process of setting a vision 2034. Uh, for the University of Michigan, a campus-wide process that has been about a year and a half in the making right now, involving every stakeholder group across campus, working for the first time to set a system vision that is separate from the vision and mission of the individual schools and campuses, um, uh, stakeholder um, uh, interviews, town halls, surveys, um, coalescing information, and then you know, at the executive level, really thinking together about how um, we're not just advancing individual pet projects here and there, but how we're actually transforming a vision that's collective and bigger than the sum of our parts. Um, but I wanna speak even more specifically to my work in this area um, across, the, uh, across the research portfolio is we never have had a system research goals for the university. We've only had goals at, in the history in the past at the individual school level or campus level. Um, you know, there's a, there's a jokes that I'm sure are similar across the uh, across a, a big decentralized campus that were perhaps could be seen as being held together by uh, 19 schools and three campuses held together really by a fight song, but not by a common vision or common um, goals. And so, in research, I really saw an opportunity there and. Um, two years ago, a year and a half ago, I really began to work on uh, how we could change that. And it's a culture change to be able to get to have people move towards, um, I have a mission in my school, I'm leading my school, it's doing great on X, Y, and Z. I've you know, even had folks say, but then why do we need system goals? Because you know, my school's doing great or my campus is doing great. And uh, we've, I've been able to move the culture there in, in help, helping people understand that even though you're paddling as fast as you can towards this amazing point, someone else is paddling over there towards that amazing point. And if we can get together and have some higher level goals, in addition to working towards your components, we could work towards something that actually differentiates us as a system and clarify where we want to go together. And we all know that when we know where we're going, we can get there faster together. And so with that, I put together the first system-wide council uh, on research scholarship and creative practice. Um, we're a big, diverse uh, university. Uh, when I'm saying research, I don't just mean STEM. Um, we also have, we had leaders on that uh, council who are in architecture, who are over the humanities, as well as engineering and leaders from the other uh, uh, two campuses. Um, and thinking about how we're gonna put together our first research-wide, system-wide goals. And we've been working towards that for the past year and a half, um, working on, um, and, and we've, we've gotten there. We're, we now have developed um, and are iterating on a series of 
five system research goals where uh, everyone can see themselves in them, but they also are specified and specific to who we are and where we can go. The next stage of that would be taking that system-wide um, vision first and goals, and then working at the individual school level towards how their individual school and campuses can contribute to the system in addition to contributing to their own individual mission uh, and to their own individual goals, because those are certainly unique. But collectively, we have to also be contributing towards the system. And we've been working through that. And then down from that will flow operational tactics, strategy, and then yes, KPIs that we can measure. We do have to be able to talk about what success looks like. And we have to be able to know if we've gotten a success and, and had to be able to articulate that. Um, so that's, that's been my experience. And I, I could share more. But that's a really exciting part of uh, this position for me. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Cunningham. And we'll now move to Regent Ruth Johnson for her question. Thanks, Chair Mayron. Welcome. Good to see you again, Dr. Cunningham. We'll look again here at Healthcare in the Academic Medical Center. Uh, the University of Minnesota is our state's public healthcare leader and innovator. And we have a role in educating some 70% of our healthcare workforce and influencing health policy in myriad ways. So how does your background and experience prepare you to lead a complex academic medical center and its related clinical partnerships? So, you know, I talked about how I want to be clear that um, I, I not only have experience as an emergency physician working on patients somewhere, but I have a lot of experience in higher education administration. Um, but my, my first language certainly was in medical training, um, and I, I do bring substantial <coughs> administrative experience and on-the-ground uh, experience there as well. Uh, I've been on the ground practicing uh, across what's three healthcare systems, some we owned, some we practiced at, uh, some we had training sites at. Uh, I have management experience I actually did early on in my career when figuring out whether I wanted to lead further in higher ed administration or in healthcare administration. I did a full executive year of management training in uh, healthcare administration. Uh, I have experience in academic clinical um, academic health care budgeting and financing. You have brilliant people across your health system who are doing that as well. Uh, but I know that language, and I can work with them on, on, uh, on the issues of the day and can do that really immediately. But I also want to want to be clear, you're not hiring me to run either the medical system or the health system. Again, you have great leaders in that space. If they need um, extra expertise, I also uh, know how to get that expertise around the country and bring it to bear. But I also have experience from the higher education administration component of how a complicated health system and our health, our medical center and health system has been acquiring other health systems even as we speak across the state of Michigan. And I have been uh, in, engaged in how that affects the university academic campus mission, and it obviously does. It's it integrates in any number of ways, ways that will make your senior lawyers kind of crazy around the compliance issues, uh, everything from the med-mal components of it to the regulatory components and how those fit and where they sit, um, down to the issues of the, uh, that will be, make your provost have headaches in terms of what that means for the faculty lines and where they're appointed. Those things are all crossing, and I have understanding and appreciation, and I've worked through them. Uh, also, uh, in, in areas even you know, down to where the fundraising is at, for is it the fundraising with your health system, is the fundraising with your medical school, how is that going to be shared? All of these things have to be entangled, disentangled, thought about, and laid out. And uh, again, I'm ready to engage immediately on those issues very comfortably, but almost as important because, again, you have great leaders there. And uh, you know, my role will be to, to augment and, and, and champion some of that work. Uh, but as a president, I can also speak with a lot of credibility in, around the state and in the policy house in what health care means and what your opportunity is to provide, to be that provider of, of healthcare education, my goodness, for the state of Minnesota is such a tremendous value to the state. Uh, having worn a, a long white coat and stood uh, with our patients and in the trenches with our nurses and, and with our healthcare providers, uh, it's an opportunity in a way that you serve the state, the state that I can speak to with credibility um, as I advocate for the great work that will be done there across the health system. You have an amazing opportunity in, uh, in moving forward with this last letter of intent with Fairview. You also have one opportunity really to get that right for the next decade. Uh, and it will have implications for the rest of your health system. Uh, your health system also uh, is responsible likely, uh, surely, for half of your research expenditures. It will have influences across the system. And uh, I'm prepared and immediately able to step in and begin to help think about those challenges and how to move it forward with grace. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Do uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and good morning, Dr. Cunningham. Uh, my question is about enrollment. Several of our campuses, as well as some collegiate units on the Twin Cities campus, have experienced enrollment declines. Although this is consistent with national trends, some universities have been able to maintain or even grow enrollment in this challenging environment. What strategies have you employed to place students and their success at the center of your work and maintain or potentially grow enrollment? So this is a challenge everywhere across the country. The demographic shifts of the current population are, are certainly everywhere. But I, I do bring, um, again, experience at the senior table of a peer university who has been working through many of these challenges, that how the system campuses um, do all affect each other, uh, including, including enrollment challenges on, on, uh, uh, on our Ann Arbor campus. Um, uh, you know, but so in, in fact, our two system campuses are um, Dearborn and Flint, and despite some rocky years there in the middle, uh, have recently both grown their enrollment. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, our Dearborn campus, which is very analogous to your Duluth campus, uh, recently is up 9% in their enrollment. Uh, our Flint enrollment is also up recently, that's despite coming off years where we had a water crisis where the students couldn't drink the water. Uh, that created its own enrollment challenges, as well as campus safety issues of a very urban um, environment. So, but first, I really want to tackle this at the level of where I think your president should be thinking, and that's at the system level. Um, one of the most important things about this role is having the right senior leaders in place. You have excellent chancellors. I had a great opportunity to meet them over the past week. You also have open positions as a chancellor and open positions in enrollment management. Uh, and my ability and the history I have in being able to recruit <clears throat> top talent and retain them and get them to work with accountability towards goals is something that I certainly would bring to you uh, in this area. A president's role would certainly be to help, help think about with a high level of enrollment strategy um, across the system and then make sure that there's somebody accountable for that strategy, whether that happens at a system level with somebody who is accountable across the system to really understand where when you make tweaks on one part of the system it has un unintended consequences somewhere else or not. Um, there are options there to think about, but getting the organizational chart right, getting the right people in place, and then making sure that they're accountable is certainly the role that a president would need to operate at. I want to say you have a tremendous opportunity here for the University of Minnesota in that you get one degree, a University of Minnesota degree, no matter what campus you're at. Um, you have an amazing brand. I think that brand can even be amplified. You have There's so much potential, um, but that's a great enrollment opportunity for marketing um, that I think we could uh, um, augment more with good strategy uh, going forward. You have the opportunity with very different campuses of very differentiated learning opportunities and the ability to get the right students and really serve all of Minnesota at the right place. This can be done with aggressive recruiting, with a vision that we talked about in the last place that's clear, that people on the street know, that people in the community know, that the advisors in the college, in, in the high school, college, uh, high school campuses know. Uh, so they can tell their students why Minnesota. <clears throat> um, I think it's also important to think about that from uh, uh, on your Twin Cities campus, how we can really articulate the competitiveness of that campus against <laughs> your other states. Once people go to, once kids go across, or students go to other states, they may not come back. Some ways at the University of Michigan, we've done this, has been around our Go Blue Guarantee, which is around uh, you know a clear marketing very clear message that if you are in a certain income bracket, you don't need to worry about that scary sticker price uh, that you can come to the University of Michigan. Um, I know the state has recently implemented a, a similar strategy across the state. However, there are opportunities there to be further differentiated at the University of Minnesota and to really market that effectively to your students. Um, the question was specific about strategies at, uh, at uh, uh, that we've used at the university, and I want to speak to those. I think um, uh, across one of our campuses, one of our chancellors has been really very focused um, uh, not just on enrollment numbers, and I think enrollment numbers sometimes can be a trap. Um, we have to pay attention to enrollment numbers, but we have to pay attention to net tuition revenue. Uh, and understanding how we can really have precision financial aid for the money that we do have um, so that we're not over or under scholarshiping uh, and providing um, uh, the right amount of financial aid to make the budget work as a whole. 
Uh, on our Flint campus, one of the ways that they really were able to increase uh, their enrollment strategies was, was um, uh, by really strengthening and focusing on those transfer pathways uh, from other, other regionals and community colleges and then providing the right advising to make that happen. Uh, and then delivering with those transfer students, making it clear that um, everyone doesn't come at 18 and even if you don't come first here to the <coughs> University of Minnesota, that we might be the right place and the best place for you um, later on uh, uh, when you're when you're ready, some other strategies again that I saw your some of your chancellors using last week that I also know have been successful across the Big Ten are uh, focusing on a return to learn population. Not every student is ready at 18. Uh, later on, they might need upskilling. They might need reskilling. The world is changing. How you can be the choice and the destination for that? Uh, our Flint campus has even employed some earn and learn programs, uh, really connecting them with good business partners. You have amazing business partners across the state of Minnesota, you're providing um, uh, tremendous jobs and training a lot of their workforce and citizens and how they can be partnering in uh, even providing opportunities that well students are, um, are learning. They also maybe could be earning and getting skills at the same time. Um, I want to go back a minute to that commitment to transfer students. There's uh, certainly some campuses and some systems around the country that have made even bigger commitments to transfer students, you know, making it clear that for every X amount of students they accept directly, that they'll accept transfer students, really <coughs> honing that in. I don't know if that's the right strategy or not here. Um, uh, and then thinking uh, um, more about um, opportunities when students apply to our Ann Arbor campus, for example, they can also apply directly um, to our other two campuses. Um, and, and there's operational issues with that. There's ways that it can be approved. But those are things to consider in how we think about uh, maximizing and optimizing a system. Uh, and I want to end here just with the idea that these are all the problems that, um, you know, at a senior leadership table, we have mulled over and tossed over how the resources that go to any one of those systems affect all of the systems. And these are the conversations that we have uh, and we've been and, and have been have been part of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Tan Johnson, if you could ask the next question. Thank you, Chair Marron. <clears throat> and uh, good morning, Dr. Cunningham. Minnesota has a unique culture, uh, but it is not a monolith. It is home to 11 federally recognized tribes, as well as 5.7 million people with varying backgrounds, cultures, and viewpoints. It has major urban centers, small towns, and everything in between. If you are selected as president, you will be expected to lead on issues such as tribal relations, creating inclusive campuses where all students can thrive, and connecting the university with all parts of the state. Please give examples of how you did this in your current or previous roles. So the diversity of this state is very familiar to me because it's very similar to the diversity of Michigan. So we have uh, some of the most urban parts of the country in Michigan, as you do here. We have Detroit and Flint. Um, we also have uh, as rural a population as anywhere here in, in Minnesota, across our Upper Peninsula and across Northern Michigan. Um, with that, we have um, uh, every possible kind of diversity. We also are incredibly politically diverse from, uh, from uh, very, very blue to very, very red to purple and swing states uh, and divided political houses and divided political people over, over the years. And, and this has been a familiar environment for me to work in. Um, I want to speak first to the tribal uh, relations component. In my current role, I oversee our Native American Graves Repatriation Act. So our, I'm on point for much of the tribal relations um, around the university. With that, um, we uh, uh, have done the work uh, in how we advance uh, the need to return ancestors and funerary objects to the tribes with respect. Um, uh, my office has a reputation from our tribal leaders of doing that uh, in a way that is is um, uh, with a lot of respect and you know, leading a lot of that work in the country and best practices. Uh, in my current role, we, you know, working on really building those tribal relations. Trust isn't something that you get. Trust is something that you continue to earn over time. Um, we, things are going really well, but we will, we are gathering together the tribal leaders across 
um, across 50 tribes across the Midwest uh, that we interact with, some including uh, perhaps here in Minnesota, in April um, for a dinner to honor those tribal elders and to continue to work to build trust and keep dialogue open. Um, so that's certainly uh, a, port, uh, a component that's important to me, and I understand the deep commitment that the state has and that the university has towards tribal students um, particularly. Um, in the in uh, in terms of how we address it across the rest of our portfolio, I mean, first I'll, I'll talk at, at, at one level. Uh, you know, in the monthly update that I put out every month, we are always you know very conscious that we're serving an entire state, and we are always highlighting aspects of the ways that we reach um, folks across Michigan, across our rural communities, whether we're touching the Great Lakes. Um, how the impact of our technology, our U of M startups are um, affecting and aiding um, all of the citizens. And, and that's a constant conversation um, to, to be having. Uh, last year, we had a, a Regent meeting up north. I know you have the opportunity to be at some of the different campuses at different times or great opportunities to highlight uh, in the area, a focus on the economic development that the university provides to rural aspects of the state, as well as to providing education and healthcare to those aspects of the state. Um, obviously, we've done a lot of work as well in our um, urban areas uh, such as Flint and with campuses uh, there and with commitments as well to Detroit. So that kind of diversity of people is very familiar to me. In terms of, um, I think the other part of your question around diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and, and justice and belonging, uh, I have a, a deep portfolio in advancing um, a mission of, of DEI across our research portfolio uh, in um, uh, accelerating opportunities, both in how we think about our scholarship and how we support our people uh, in best practices, hiring practices, inclusive hiring practices, um, and, and advancing peer scholarship in a way that allows all voices uh, to lift up. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. <clears throat> uh, Regent Kenyanya, if you could ask the next question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Cunningham, um, pleased to ask you about student success. Uh, students are central to everything we do at the University of Minnesota. Hoping you could share your definition of student success and along with that, some examples of how you have promoted academic success, enhanced the student experience and addressed issues such as mental wellness, campus safety, and food insecurity, uh, both in the undergraduate and graduate context? A short, simple question. <laughs> um, so student success you know, can, can be defined lots of ways. I, I doubt my uh, definition is original, but certainly is the achievement of positive outcomes and personal growth for our students on their educational journey beyond their academic performance encompasses students' development, including their intellectual, social, emotional, and physical well-being. You are training here the future citizens of the state of Minnesota. Student success is about empowering students to reach their fullest potential, their optimal potential, to become well-rounded, prepared for the opportunities and the challenges that they will encounter in their personal and professional lives. It's when done well as a holistic approach that really takes into account the academic achievement and the development of skills and competencies necessary for all aspects uh, uh, of, their, of their life. Um, uh, so a number of different things. First, and I talked more about this on my state tour, as I've been calling it. Uh, you know, I was a first-generation student, went to college uh, with the Ada Pell grants, and uh, those experiences have given me a lot of personal passion, um, not only for affordability and access, but also for what student success means like from people coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and what a difficult transition to college that certainly can be. It certainly was for me when I went to college. And I, I talk about this when I talk with students in public audiences, because I think it's really important for students to be able to see themselves in their leaders and to see that there's a path for them um, to be able to, no matter where their background is, for, for them to go uh, from the journeys like I have from poverty to leadership of a prestigious university just through the power of higher education. But on an administrator level, to aid with such transitions, there's a lot of uh, work that we've done at the university and that I've done personally. Um, I mean, first of all, there's some excellent work and supported by national data. We know that in moving, um, in advancing cohort models of students, we do this at the University of Michigan with a summer transition program uh, where we uh, bring forward um, students uh, with stipends in the summer before um, in the summer before their freshman year, giving them robust support, getting them to know folks ahead of time, really giving them um, uh, an on ramp to have success when they hit the ground in, during that first freshman time. 
I see Rochester, for example, also is working on that cohort model really successfully. A lot of best practices there obviously can't work in every part of your university or for everyone, but there's certainly models you have here and the models around, uh, around the country that have worked well. A personal way that I've worked on student success has really been through engaged learning, uh, engaged learning through um, undergraduate uh, learning opportunities, internships, promoting academic success. Um, we know that the, when we get uh, our undergraduate students particularly involved in engaged learning opportunities, those could be research, those could be community engagement, um, those could be other hands-on skills that that gives them uh, especially when those are funded. Um, that gives them the opportunity to do work uh, and pay bills, first of all, beyond working at a coffee shop, but also while they're doing that, or sometimes in addition, unfortunately, um, but when they're doing that, uh, they're then able to get uh, hands-on skills. You have amazing faculty here um, uh, across your system, and the closer we can get those students to working in any small groups or one-on-ones with those faculty, then the more mentorship they have, the more skills that they can get, the more opportunity they have for reference letters, especially for students who might not have a family network to help get their uh, CV to the top of the pile in some post-college graduation um, way. They can get uh, references and networking um, and, that, and that mentorship. And, and in those engaged learning opportunities, they can also see and get to know students for when they start to go off the rails a little bit and when they need more help and get them the resources they need. And I've been involved in both developing those opportunities, particularly in the rising senior class, especially in a holistic manner for diverse uh, set of uh, a student ex students with diverse experiences, um, as well as recently been involved in how we can scale up some of our amazing undergraduate research opportunities at the freshman and uh, sophomore letter level. And I heard one of your deans um, on the Duluth campus talk about this, about how you know having goals at an amazing um, uh, robust uh, research universities that you have, how you can make sure that each student has the opportunity to be as engaged as they um, as possible with um, research scholarship, creative practice opportunities with that mentorship. And I think there's opportunities there as uh, of way to, a way to improve. A couple other ways to focus on student success, and again, I see some of these opportunities across your campus, uh, and, and I know our, our campuses have used some of them as well. Uh, one is thinking about how, um, it, it, you know, in some areas, it makes sense to have four credits instead of three credit courses, how you can have less courses to focus on um, so that there's some less obstacles and less struggling to be done, um, how we integrate some of those things that have been gateway courses, uh, the organic chemistries of the world across curriculum. I know there's campuses that you have that are working on that because our, our, our job is not weeding out students. It's, it's creating success for students and how they can get the learning that they need. I want to highlight a program, really, that we're using at the University um, of Michigan and Flint campus that's been very successful in increasing the four-year graduation rate specifically has been an active and intensive advising program and really putting a lot of funds into that advising program. Um, our chancellor there will refer to it almost as intrusive advising. Uh, advising where you increase the ratio of touches for that student to advising uh, to be a whole lot more than it was before, giving the opportunities for really directed um, curriculum advancement uh, as well as opportunities to be engaged with that advisor to help know when or when not, you know, how to not have them change majors in their fifth year and then not be able to finish because their financial aid um, has run out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has made a big difference and made a big difference in four-year undergraduate rate. Because your question had multi-parts, I'm going to answer two more parts of it really quickly. Um, one of them is I can't not touch on student mental health, which is um, a crisis across the, the community and certainly an issue of our time. Um, uh, as I, I think the press noted yesterday, I've had a long engagement in working on mental health and mental health access issues. A lot of part of my early scholarship and work was specifically in how we get um, college age students uh, more access to mental health. Um, a lot of that work that I did was about um, addiction, but also about other mental health issues. Um, I championed that work um, uh, locally and in the region uh, over decades. When I came to higher ed administration coming out of COVID, I know your university here focused specifically on how on focused plans for student mental health, our university did as well. Um, I was part of those um, committees uh, at the university, really thinking about how we could not just have more counselors. Yes, more counselors are important, but also how we can have peer counseling that could be very effective. How we can work on the prevention programming upstream from that, in addition to increasing access um, with other remote modalities. Um, the last two things I'll say about student access, because it is so central, um, is we have a lot of students. We talk about our undergraduate 
students a lot, but we have graduate students, we have master's students, we have postdoctoral students, and I would be the president of all of those students. And I have also focused on specifically how we help our postdoctoral trainees recently uh, in uh, past years. And in a student-centered way, the, uh, the postdocs uh, came to my office um, with their voice, and we spent a lot of time listening and understanding why their needs were not being met across the university were very decentralized. They were isolated, um, really at, uh, at risk with big power differentials um, in their work. I worked with the graduate student leadership. Um, we put together uh, proposals working with the student voice across those postdocs and recently have launched an office for postdoctoral support that's central, the first central office. It's top of mind for me because it launched two weeks ago. Provides ombudsman, provides career support, will help hopefully get them um, both directed. That also helps our faculty who then can attract great postdoctoral talent because we know we're providing those services. Your last point here, it was a long question, <laughs> is about um, <laughs> mitigating food insecurity, uh, which is certainly a, a critical uh, part of student success. Um, uh, one has to have their most basic human needs met for them to be able to succeed. There aren't easy answers here, and I won't pretend there will. Uh, there are. We have um, many programs and food covered programs including our maize and blue cupboard at the University of Michigan. Um, I, I uh, have no easy answers here. I will certainly say I was food insecure in my youth, and I'm passionate about supporting this, the full success of our students and our community, and we look forward to working with what resources you have here and how we could support those further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Turner, if you could address yes. the next question, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, can you can you guys hear me okay? So far, so good. Yes. Okay. Yeah, my voice is getting a little tired after getting off my shift. Yeah. Um, Dr. Cunningham, this my question is about relationship development. The University of Minnesota is a mission-focused, premier public land grant university, and Minnesotans feel a great deal of pride and ownership in it. In addition to students, faculty, and staff, there are many other important stakeholders relationships that need to be nurtured. Please talk about your approach and experience in building relationships with the following. Students, faculty, and staff, unions, elected leaders, donors, governing boards. As you address relationships with these stakeholders, please offer examples of how you have navigated and resolved disagreements with any of them. So lots of parts to that question. I think I'll try to take them one by one. But let me say at the top level, there's a commonality across all of these. You know, a key to any of these relationships is a constant bi-directional communication, being visible, being on the ground, getting to know people ahead of time to the extent that you can, uh, so that when problems arise, we can work through them and know what our values are on each side and work with good intent. Um, so, you know, trying to go through some of these groups one by one, um, you know, on the student level, um, uh, you know, I talked about our postdoctoral students and, and listening and our engagement with them. Uh, we have a very active uh, grad student uh, portfolio also. But, but let me back up again and talk about maybe more of a, a fun component of how I've seen this done well um, with developing the relationships ahead of time. And in prior administrations, we had for our students um, a bi-monthly uh, pizza night with the president uh, and the full executive team. And uh, we brought in the student, the leaders of the student organizations rotating, because obviously there are many, uh, but brought them to the table. The full executive team took their time uh, every other month, and we sat down, uh, broke into small groups, and listened and got to know those student leaders. And here, at any one time, one student organization has something that's hot, and another organization has something uh, where they're just moving along. But we got to know each other and work together. And then as issues arise, both the president and the executive team had a good sense of what the issues were on the ground. And we had built that relationship. Uh, it's something I would love to see um, moving forward. On the faculty side, I have a faculty um, governance committee, a faculty um, research SACUA committee uh, that, that I work with very regularly. We work through um, all the issues of the day. They bring to me their issues. Um, I bring to them uh, everything early on what we're thinking about it, how we're gonna iterate on it to move it out. Once we do roll it out, um, they tell me why it got rolled out not right, and I work to then address that and see what we can do to, to rechart courses when we need to. Um, you know, examples there, we've uh, rolled out uh, for our faculty a change in the promotion criteria across one of our team science tracks. You can imagine that would be dicey across a faculty group 
Um, the work that we did there is so much better because we worked with the Faculty Governance Committee. Uh, they were able to help us see how adjusting some of that criteria you know, could impact people who had already received promotion at a particular level. We went back and rejiggered that a fair amount, again, working with committees, working with faculty committees at every step of the way. Um, uh, on a uh, staff level, uh, which is so very important, um, we ha have a huge research administration staff, first of all, all across campus. Um, we have uh, staff groups that are meeting regularly and are meeting regularly with um, both me and, our, uh, and the administration in surfacing how the nuts and bolts work, uh, often back office work gets done across the university and how we can work together on that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, I guess I'll just say from a staff issue, um, uh, you know, uh, we, we talked about my leadership in higher education administration, but a, a lot of how I think about staff work does stem from my foundational experiences um, in, in healthcare. Health healthcare is a team sport. Um, doctors don't cure patients, teams of patient, teams of providers cure patients, um, including the person mopping the floor to clean the room for the next person and making the boiler room run. Uh, and there's nobody that knows that better than perhaps a team in an emergency department. And that's an aspect I take across all of our work, uh, how valuable our staff is. Um, speaking um, uh, maybe directly to something near and dear to your heart, um, uh, in terms of unions, I, I have, um, uh, I was a house staff union member as a resident. Um, I, I got a lot out of that by being a house staff union member uh, during my early residency time. Uh, it provided an opportunity and an ability to have negotiations laid out in a way that I didn't have to worry about and knew that I'd be treated evenly across. Um, union and those negotiations can certainly be tense, but with good partners on both sides, um, we, can, we can get there. Uh, and although that can be difficult, having that playbook in place can really help sometimes, especially when there's giant power differentials ac across groups. Um, it also can help our non-bargain for employees. Uh, we have a very decentralized structure. Um, it's no shock that sometimes groups across the university potentially doing very similar tasks um, are being managed in very different ways. And uh, having um, a, a large portion of bargain for um, uh, contracts uh, union employees also helps us um, work to make sure that we're providing an evenness and an attentiveness to all the rest of our employees. Um, I'll move on to elected leaders, and I talked a little bit about my work there before. Uh, I've um, regularly met with uh, policy makers in, at the House, uh, our state senators, their staff, um, our staff, uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, worked on, on those relationships off over quite, quite a bit of time, as well as worked with our government relations staff to make sure they're working with their government relations staff. Obviously, that's where a lot of the work gets done, although it's important to be visible, and those folks know who I am, and they know who I am by name, and I would expect that folks here would also um, see my face regularly and know who I am. Um, uh, from a donor community standpoint, uh, obviously and incredibly important, there's, I, I want to say donors, but then also our alumni, whether or not they're giving, are an incredibly com important component and stakeholder group. Our alumni are a group that has the longest history potential uh, with the university. They cross over administrations. They truly have the best, uh, uh, always have the best um, uh, you know, focus on what's best for the, for the university in the long haul. Uh, and these are a group that I meet with uh, frequently. I meet with major gift donors. Uh, whether or not they're involved in providing uh, funding to my portfolio, they have a long view. They have experience in the community. They have experience in businesses. They have experience uh, across sectors that they can bring to bear for best in class practices that are perhaps different than higher ed administration practices, and we can learn from them. Um, uh, in terms of, and I have experience in, in both uh, major gifts and raising funds for initiatives across a whole spectrum of level, including for some of that student um, undergraduate success work. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, conversations can certainly get difficult. And, you know, I can, I'll speak to a time when a, a major donor of the university um, 
uh, who you know wants to, to give us a major funding and initiative on an initiative which was really important to all of us and we had a shared vision on, but, but also was behaving really badly with one of my staff in a way that didn't meet our code of conduct um, or really a general code of conduct. And those are hard conversations. And I'll tell you, I can have hard conversations uh, and we can sit down and address those issues and, and do what's right. And when we lead from our values, we can get there and we were able to work through it. Um, in terms of governing boards, um, you know, I, I work with our region and trustees regularly. Um, they know me. Um, uh, we communicate, uh, you know, individually by uh, on whatever the initiative is that's going on as needed. Uh, they're valued um, uh, advisors. Uh, often, I know you'll find this shocking, they don't all agree. Um, and so we have to work through individual, um, uh, what those individual issues and perspectives are, and then, uh, and then work together on it. And I have an experience uh, in doing it and value the wisdom that they bring. I think that was all of the parts of your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and welcome back, Dr. Cunningham. Higher education generally and university presidents specifically are under fire across the country. Please tell us about a stand that you took on a difficult academic or social issue that required courage of conviction. We are particularly interested in examples involving academic freedom or freedom of expression, which have been at the forefront of recent debates across the country. How did you communicate with the university com community and the media about this difficult academic or social issue? And how did the various constituents respond? And what did you learn from this experience? So um, you know, I'll, I'll get to the courage of conviction um, component, but I want to address almost head on first what I hear really in between the lines there a little bit, which is really about the current climate and free speech. Uh, and, you know, as a president, I, I firmly uh, support free speech and academic freedom. And the time to advance and really protect free speech is the time when you don't agree with it. Um, and, uh, and that's when we must, must be most firm uh, in its value. Uh, but as a human, I also know that free and protected speech doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt uh, and that it can't be harmful uh, and, and can't feel har hurtful and harmful and that we need to work to uh, work with our campus constituencies who are on the other side of free and protected speech um, so that they also can feel supported um, during these times. On the Middle East and the current climate, um, I, I just want to say at the outset, my role as an educator and a higher education administrator is to compassionately care for all of our communities and to support them through the strain and pain, knowing that all human, va human life is of equal value. Um, and that we need to really work to support our communities right now that are all experiencing so much pain. I want to go back to the question of speaking um, with courage and conviction and, and certainly have you know that as a president, I am more than willing to do this. And I'll, I'll take you back to a time 10 years ago uh, where uh, I, in, in healthcare, was seeing uh, so many people, uh, young people die in front of me from the leading cause of death among our kids, which was by firearms. And at the time, um, it, it wasn't okay to talk about that. It wasn't okay to talk about it in our professional societies or in our journals. Um, but it wasn't political for me. It's, it's really it was about how we could stop having all these kids uh, die. And I began to ask questions about what the role of our health system was, what the role of our education was, what the role of our scholarship was on that. Uh, and I moved forward with what took a fair amount of courage and conviction. But let me tell you a little bit about how I did it, because I think that's really important, because it wasn't political and it was bipartisan, uh, is the way I did that is I went and talked to, to Michiganders, first of all, all over the state of Michigan, um, and gathered up advisory groups of folks who were hunters, folks who had long uh, uh, worked in national um, uh, sh uh, sports shooting associations, uh, gun shop owners, as well as folks in urban communities and community um, uh, community groups, and uh, uh, talked about what our common goal was and our common goal there of how we could do something um, that would help less people um, uh, and less of our kids dying by gun. And so that's the way I've approached it always, uh, apolitically with courage of conviction that there is something that we can do and that we can work towards a common goal um, and that that goal doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be done politically. And I was able to advance that in a um, 
divided state house uh, at the time to receive funding for it for the University of Michigan um, around how we protect our schools and uh, safety in our schools uh, at a time uh, uh, to really help keep our kids uh, safer. And so that's a little bit about courage of conviction. If we go back to kind of the issue of free speech, which I really think of where the heart of your work is, I want to give you an example um, that we faced at the, at the leadership table around free, sheep, free, free speech and a leadership speaker a few years back. Um, it came to light that we had a faculty, an outstanding educator uh, who had won awards for her teaching, uh, was asked to speak in an awards ceremony. And it came to light that she had also posted on social media her beliefs on right to life that many of our students didn't like. Um, this had nothing, her personal beliefs had nothing to do with her role as an educator, her ability to educate or the job that she was doing. And there were calls and protests by the students and petitions for her not to talk. Um, I'm really proud of how our university leadership um, and our, our leadership across our health system handled that, first by affirming her right to her personal views and welcoming inclusion in her voice in the community by setting out at the top of the talk the rules of engagement for protest, the rights that students have to protest, and we have a very activist campus, uh, but also the right for a speaker to be able to communicate and provide awards at that ceremony and to be able to finish the, the, the talk. We asked a faculty uh, with opposing personal beliefs to also speak uh, so that there could be dialogue, so that we could model for our students how you have discourse on difficult topics and encourage and promote civic and respectful dialogue on several sides of a difficult and polarizing issue. I could give you a lot more examples about free speech um, and about courage of conviction, um, but uh, I, I'll say always we have to focus on this um, from compassion, from uh, a human stance, uh, from supporting the communities that we have, uh, and also deeply committing um, to the ability of polarizing views and individuals to express those views. It's a little different than when organizations want to take views or when departments want to take views, but at the individual level, really I'm supporting the role of uh, free speech and of academic freedom. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Gully. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham, for being here. Uh, <laughs> I did that in the last. Um, session too. So thank you so much for being here and being part of this. It, we're just so grateful and um, it's been really exciting to get to know you a little bit um, through this process. Um, I want to ask you about your leadership style. Uh, this is something that is really important I think to all of us but to me um, I, I have particular feelings about how important this is um, as well. I want to ask, how would you describe your leadership style? Um, what does it look like in action? And specifically, I'd love for you to provide examples of um, an insight, sort of insight of, into how you build support and motivate a leadership team and a time when you made a difficult decision that was upsetting to a specific state, stakeholder group. I know that <laughs> happens a lot in universities. Um, and how you made that decision and how you engaged with the stakeholder group after the decision was made. I'm so glad uh, you asked this. It's not something actually we had a chance to talk about on the state tour very much, but obviously, um, you know, you're hiring me potentially to be a leader across a, a, a very outstanding leadership team and how I lead that team and how I have led teams is, uh, is critically and almost paramount in, in, in importance. Um, you know, and so I, I think I'll start with sort of a general philosophy, which is, I, you know, I've always viewed my leadership as a servant leader. Um, our, our role and the reason I'm in public higher education and not in the private sector somewhere is specifically around the, the, the vision of, of serving both uh, all the constituents of our state as well as our students um, and doing so with humility. I'll add humility isn't really something that's easy to convey in a job interview. <laughs> um, uh, but I think I do lead with humility, although it might not be the point that I emphasize here the most. Um, uh, um, uh, I think the uh, I've worked hard when I when I first came into my team, um, you know, five years ago now, and so it was a little bit of example of how I built teams and how I've led teams. Um, the team had a, a lot of ways to go in both morale and also had to be rebuilt almost entirely. Um, and I've worked through recruiting and retaining then a top team, uh, a team partly because of my history of being able to be a successful manager and what people say about me when they ask whether they want to work for me or not. Um, but also because uh, 
Uh, I've been able to work towards motivating a team for why we're there, creating that vision. Uh, any senior team, you know, I, I've hired folks who could work anywhere. They could work in the president's or provost's office. They could work in government. I have really top talent across my team. Some of them are probably watching. Um, uh, but um, uh, the reason we're able to do that is because uh, I've focused with them on uh, the difference that they're making. Um, senior leaders, all of us want to know, you know, from the senior leader all the way down to the person who's balancing, you know, the checkbook way in the back office, want to know that what they're doing day in and day out makes a difference, that it's contributing to a larger purpose, that it's advancing a mission that's important, whether you're serving food in the dining hall, you want to know how that connects to student success. And, and I, I've been successful, I think, at being able to articulate that, that vision and mission. Um, some other parts of me that you'll know as a as a leader and a manager you know do come back again to that foundational training that I have um, in, in emergency medicine so uh, I'm not the smartest person in the room there's experts all over you know whether that be the thoracic surgeon or whether that be the expert in a particular type of the portfolio uh, that we're working on uh, my job isn't necessarily to be the smartest part of the person in the room it's to be able to bring out the skills and expertise of everyone uh, to get all the issues on the table to have open humility and respect so that we can toss around uh, those ideas, uh, that it's a safe place to disagree, to disagree with me as a leader, um, so that we can then actually get to what a best path is. You never want um, uh, a leader who uh, everyone is afraid to tell what the, actually the elephant in the room is. And I've developed a team and a team culture that's been able to do that. Um, you know, that said, I'm able to make difficult decisions. And I'm able to correct course when we do get off course. Um, the other thing I think I've focused on in uh, leadership is um, is working to grow our leadership team. Even though we have amazing <laughs> leaders at the team, all of us can grow professionally with professional development. I've spent a fair amount of time working on my own professional development um, through executive education. I've brought that to my team as well. We're actually currently in the middle of a year-long program of executive education across our team uh, right now where we've set aside um, a number of retreat days where <laughs> we've brought in uh, executive education through our Ross Business School um, because really we're a senior leadership team running you know, a uh, large budget in a complex organization, you need a high functioning executive team. And uh, we need to, that, that we're working on now on how we can not just be a great team, but how we can really be the best high performing team that we can possibly be. And that means we need to learn what the strengths and weaknesses are across that team, both in communication and organization, but also how we work together and where the strengths and weaknesses are there. And I've brought in um, executive leadership and really work to grow that potential uh, across our team. Uh, I also will say, and um, this certainly potentially stems from my foundational training, but doesn't end there, is I'm very comfortable with crisis and crisis management. Higher education seems on a good day to be a series of unending crises where you also have to keep the longer term ball football of strategy moving ahead, but you have to be able to manage the crisis of the day. Uh, and I'm comfortable in crisis. I'm comfortable in organizing a team towards that in the communication that's needed for crisis, the constant over communication that's needed for that. I was able to bring those skills to bear in COVID um, where uh, with a, a provost that was um, just a few weeks into an acting role, I was able to manage that crisis of the day, um, disassemble uh, and uh, ramp down our the largest uh, research enterprise in the country and then ramp that back up again in crisis smoothly um, and comfortably. So that's a little bit about my leadership style. I want to give you some specific examples because surely somewhere along the way there, um, I have made some difficult decisions where people haven't necessarily been happy. I'm going to give you some budget examples of that because those are always really the diciest is when I came into my role. Um, uh, everything, again, is, is not gold and silver. Um, there were aspects of my portfolio, uh, and one in particular, and the entrepreneurs in the room would maybe appreciate our, our patent budgeting component uh, was uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, in the red with no sustainable budgeting mo model going forward. Um, this was completely impeding our, our ability to move forward with um, entrepreneurship and patenting and, uh, and, and serving the faculty for moving their advances out to the marketplace. Um, 
Uh, there were winners and losers in the way that system had originally been set up. I brought together the deans across our major schools, medicine, engineering, uh, folks at the other campuses as well that were related. Uh, and we sat down and had to have hard conversations about why the current budgeting process wasn't working for this particular portfolio, uh, how we were going to need to change it, how that was going to cost everybody likely a lot of money. Um, and there was a lot of frustrations about it. Um, there was a lot of initially siloed thinking of how what it was going to mean for their individual portfolio and how they were going to win or lose there. And we had to move people to thinking about it from the system perspective in how, as a system, we actually wanted to advance as a value entrepreneurship. We always lead from our values. The other place I brought a values um, thinking there to it is we wanted to be clear as a group, and I got the group to agree on initially that our value there is we would keep the faculty whole, that the faculty would not be harmed by the fact that this, um, that uh, that this budgeting had been done uh, in a way that wasn't uh, that they would not be responsible for filling and backfilling those holes. We eventually worked through that difficult budgeting and rebudgeting. Um, it did indeed cost some of the schools what will be in out years, um, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars that we continue to f uh, backfill as we fix that portfolio. But we now have a sustainable moving forward path for that part of the portfolio. And then how did I handle it after? Because people were a little bit cranky. <laughs> um, is, uh, is I committed to them that uh, it would be transparent in a way that it hadn't been going forward and that I would bring them back balance sheets every year. I also committed to them that I brought in expertise across the private and public sector um, to look at the way we were doing it and the way we were proposing doing it and give us guidance on it. I let them pick some of the expertise that we were bringing in so that they could be assured that the path that we were picking forward wasn't just you know Rebecca's version of the way the world should work, but actually had um, uh, best practice across and then every year since then we've brought them a transparent budgets and worked through it and we now have a path forward so that's that's one um, I'll mention just really quickly one other aspect uh, you know I mentioned when I first came in we did need to modernize some parts of my portfolio um, operations that were dusty and outdated that needed to be um, uh, changed change is not something that anyone particularly likes even when it's the change that we all have to do uh, and in that uh, I, I definitely need to make some difficult decisions and streamline some areas of the portfolio. Uh, I worked with stakeholders across. I tried to have folks understand where they stood, why the thing that had been precious to them for 45 years perhaps didn't have a modern, uh, modern mission that we could be relevantly justifying. And uh, we worked through those issues um, uh, and tried to find humane answers for, for the people in the organizations going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Verhalen, last question. I think we missed one. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I thought uh, you already did that. <laughs> so much for relying on my memory. <laughs> All right, yeah, I've skipped. All right, Regent Tarabi. <laughs> Thanks, Chair Mayron. Um, I apologize. By that's the way. okay. Good morning, Dr. Cunningham. Uh, my question is can you share an experience from your leadership journey where you created and developed a new team? Uh, how did you approach tracking and monitoring tasks delegated to the new team? And what strategies did you employ to ensure a smooth integration of the team's capabilities? So I talked to you a little bit about the original senior leadership team, which I've now recruited and, uh, you know, have retained uh, virtually all of that team, with the exception of some folks that got amazing promotions. Uh, um, <clears throat> across that portfolio over the past five years. And, you know, again, at the top level, I think you, you do that um, in creating teams by making sure that you have a compelling vision and mission and you value the folks and their voice across that uh, and make sure that they know how their part of the work is having a difference. Um, but I also think it's really important as you're creating new teams, and I'll speak about a new team that we've generated, uh, to be really crystal clear in what the organizational chart is um, and have that be formalized, uh, have people really know what role they play. When the places I've seen teams get into trouble is where uh, there's not role clarity and, and where people two people think that they're either doing similar jobs or have overlapping jobs um, and that that's not formalized. Sometimes we think we know it and then we put it on paper and then we think actually realize that we didn't really know it at all. It, it really is, has not been differentiated. Um, so those are some ways that uh, I, I think I've managed teams uh, in general. You know, I'll speak to a recent team, a large initiative that we've been moving forward at the university, an initiative that I've been spearheading that works across our executive offices that has um, major implications uh, across the full executive 
brief team. Uh, and on that, we had to set up a new team, you know, focused on this initiative, in addition to really having role clarity of who was on point for that, you know, ultimately for moving the day-to-day -day pieces forward, um, you know, developing super clear communication practices, um, both at the executive level, uh, for you know what is now our weekly meeting on that, but then also um, executive leaders are busy, and we have to have clear, good delegation um, down to the levels beneath that. And so, um, one, I have an excellent chief of staff, uh, and our other executive officers do as well. But also other delegates at a level down from us, and uh, across our portfolio, I set up and organized who those delegates would be across um, across those teams. They're meeting and doing the hard you know, hard grunt work that needs to be done to move the initiative forward. Um, when setting up a new team and in an initiative, you know, we make sure that we have the right project management expertise on it, somebody who's really following the timelines and the deliverables and making sure that they're reporting out accountably on what's going on um, and doing that at the, at the level, a level down from, from the senior team, but then making sure that the senior team is apprised and is able to lean in where we need to be um, to make sure that the full course is being charted and correct, and also to be able to intervene when things get off course. Um, so that's a little bit about how I've how I've approached it. Thank you. Have I covered everyone. No. All right. No. Um, no. I now have covered all of the eleven questions, but uh, no, 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 I am totally <laughs> off this <laughs> script. All right, Regent Verhalen, if you would ask the. Last question, and then we'll see if there's any follow-up. I apologize, Dr. Cunningham. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Morning. Yes, for four yeah. more minutes. Yeah. Um, in leading teams, how do you foster a culture that encourages and challenges team members to strive for ambitious goals and assignments? Can you please give us an example where you successfully motivated a team to exceed expectations and achieve challenging objectives? So I, I touched on this a little bit. I think you know having that um, whatever the initiative is that we're working towards, uh, rallying everybody around why we're doing it. You know nobody likes to work without a why. People don't work well that way. Why are we doing this? How does this really meet um, uh, the the vision of the university? How can it really advance us as a whole? And and that's why I'm willing to spend you know uh, time hours of time working on it. So that's always first and foremost. You know I'll give you an example. Last year. Um, in, in preparation for our work around um, creating the visioning for 2034, uh, it became clear we needed to do a full analysis of the system-wide research portfolio, uh, and we had three months to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can imagine across uh, creating a SWOT analysis across your full system of research across your decentralized, you know, multi-system campus would be a Herculean task. Uh, and I had to motivate our team uh, that had already been through a fair amount to really lean in and to do that. Um, and, you know, I, we did that by one, understanding what the value of that could be. It was really the first opportunity we would have to then actually think as a system about it as opposed to the individual. So there's a real motivator there for the team for why we we were going to work so hard and get this done over th over a short three month time period. Um, then, with that, you know, we created I created a, a smaller team and unit within my office with a clear you know a clear person on point, the right project management, um, uh, the right support, uh, reprioritize their other duties uh, uh, so that we could they could move forward with purpose on this, uh, and then we're able to get them to engage. And in, in doing that, otherwise you burn people out if you just forever have you know the next the next thing and the next crisis. Um, so it's always important to be continuing to, to reprioritize that as we move forward with the team. Um, you know, with that, we then uh, were able to be motivated and excited and whiteboard how we were going to reach the stakeholders across those three campuses, how we were going to get the input, how we were going to motivate our deans and our chancellors to do um, SWOT analysis individually on their own system research strengths at their school level in a six-week time period. They didn't like that time period. It wasn't my time period, but that's what we worked with. And sometimes we have deadlines we have to work towards. Um, and we were able to motivate people for the why on that and then, and then work through. Um, uh, also, providing the right amount of staffing so that both the schools um, and our, our leadership council that we brought together and my team um, could work at the right level. I'm a big believer in having our, uh, our staff and our people uh, and our executive teams try to work at the right level. Um, everyone needs to roll up their sleeves and do all sorts of duties as a sign sometime. Uh, but how we get people to work at the right level with the right level of supports underneath them on the team so that we can all be working as efficiently as possible. 
All right. I think now yeah, you've accomplished all 11 questions. Um, and we've got some time for any follow up by anybody here around the Horseshoe, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Cunningham, um, going back to the student success question, you, you were talking about graduate students and you said you brought up something about power differentials. And I, that's an interesting comment. I, I think this board has actually learned about that recently. And that graduate relationship is very unique. When it works well with the advisor, it's great. When it doesn't, they're very vulnerable. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and how we can you know, make sure those students are protected? Because they're, their, they're weighing their career against you know, uh, filing that complaint or whatever. Yeah. And it's very similar with our postdoctoral trainees as well, right? So they're, um, they might be in a they might be in a lab. They may be one or two students that are working with uh, a senior expert, potentially nationally uh, re renowned, who uh, is uh, both giving them advising and mentorship, but also is really holding holding potentially the keys um, for their letters and their references going on. There's a bunch of ways that uh, best practices that have been used to address that nationally. Uh, one is by making sure that um, graduate students and uh, and postdoctoral students have a team of mentorship and that that team of mentorship assigned to them specifically is somebody in their lab, but somebody not in their lab, but maybe in their field. Uh, in a different part of their unit, somebody who is, uh, is responsible for meeting with them regularly, understanding really how they're doing, uh, but also uh, providing um, you know, counterbalance to the professional goals of the faculty that they're working directly under, but viewing them in their student role and be able to provide career advice and counseling and also, you know, alternative references in case there are disagreements. So there certainly are power differentials there, and that's the same thing with our, our postdoctoral students. So that the best practices around that nationally are evolving into, you know, not leaving folks with um, a, single ment a single mentor, but a suite uh, of mentorship that gets set up with them formally as a suite of advising um, to give them that uh, to give them th uh, that support. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Baron. Um, Dr. Cunningham. Last year, the graduate students at the University of Michigan went on strike for higher wages and an improvement in their work environment. Um, as you know, they're an important part of a complex research ecosystem. Um, there are some that would have say that higher wages for graduate assistants would be a threat to our research enterprise. How do you feel about that view? And more importantly, how would you plan to support our graduate assistants that are performing vital research, thus, thus avoiding potential labor, labor unrest in the form of a strike? <laughs> So the graduate students are a critical part of the ecosystem, both in teaching and in the research component. Uh, I don't know what the wage structure is here. I would have to become more familiar with it. Uh, our graduate students certainly did um, uh, successfully bargain for an increase in wages, and they did that through their collective bargaining process through, as you, what you mentioned, was a difficult process um, that required a lot of back and forth. Um, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned at, at the outset, having support for our graduate students and having, you know, fair and reasonable compensation for them is a critical part of their success and a critical part of the success of the institution as a whole. Um, you know, that being said, there are realities, obviously, in budgeting and uh, funds from one part of the system come then to feed funds of another part of a system. And, uh, you know, collectively, as that bargaining moved forward, we, we would have to understand where, uh, where and how uh, funds would go to move um, that, that may be needed to compensate graduate students more fairly and how that would impact the rest of the missions. That's simply the reality of budgeting. Um, but graduate students are an integral and important part of, um, of both our researching and teacher, teaching uh, mission, and I'm certainly committed to working uh, with that, that union that's forming. Thank you. Uh, Regent Tarabi, last follow-up question. Thank you, Jeremy Ron. Uh, Dr. Cunningham, I just wanted to go back to um, your response on crisis management, and you talked about being very comfortable um, dealing with crisis and i'm curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about um, that process what determines if something is a crisis and how do you uh, make sure that it, everything is not a crisis but also what are the indicators for you that tells you that you're out of a crisis 
that, that we're out of a crisis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, baked into my DNA, again, mm -hmm. from my sort of early training is, uh, is everything, every, even what is a crisis to other people is not, is not necessarily a crisis when you have the right training and the right people and the right skills. Uh, any good emergency physician will, will tell you they arrive calmly at, uh, at the bedside of a patient who's unconscious, and that is not a crisis for them. That is another Monday. Um, and so having, uh, first of all, having your team prepared, um, having them know how to manage uh, the issue of the day so it's not the crisis of the day um, is, is really important, and that comes down to preparation and training training, uh, and calmness. Um, uh, that being said, we, we do have issues that rise to what the level of crisis is. Uh, I'm not an alarmist. Um, uh, and again, that comes to my sort of foundational training. Uh, you know, COVID was a national crisis. <laughs> uh, and we recognized it for that. And then uh, with that, I, I immediately moved into what has been decades also of crisis management communication skills. I know I flew home that Monday, uh, uh, left the trip I was on and gathered my team in person and began to work through exactly what um, a chain of organization would be and exactly how we were going to communicate. And, you know, one of the things in crisis and true crisis is really about the communication. Uh, and I set up strategies there of who we were going to meet with daily. Uh, at some, some points to having twice daily touch points with the key people, you know, down to folks that were deep into facilities um, management, no hierarchy on there and how we were going to move forward. So certainly crisis communication is part of that. Um, knowing what is a crisis and what isn't a crisis. Uh, I mean, there's issues of the day. Uh, many of those can, uh, you know, can be, can be addressed. There are uh, issues, you know, sometimes that are uh, an issue that really may are a crisis for your your PR and your communications team, but shouldn't be a crisis for your leadership uh, if we have good planning in place and if we can work on the back end to organize the messages and our values uh, for what we need to do to go forward. Um, uh, so th I think those are some sort of top level things that come to mind. Uh, we will face crises together, and I can promise you that whatever the one is today it will not be the one, if, if I'm your president here, that we'll be talking about in a year and a half from now. Uh, but there's a structure and a format to managing crises and issues uh, of the day, as well as the communication around them, you know, with key messaging uh, and uh, with the engagement that we need to and communication plans across the leadership on campus. And I'm deeply familiar with those. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. I'd like to give you a few minutes to make any closing remarks uh, to us before we conclude your interview. I, I mean, first of all, just what an honor and a privilege to get to see who you really are here at the University of Minnesota across the state. Uh, it was a fabulous state tour. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I'll leave you. You've gotten to know me. I've gotten to know you. The other thing we just haven't talked about this morning that I would add is um, uh, I am serious and purposeful when I make a decision to take a new position. Um, I take that position because uh, I think I can help create uh, impact and advance the priorities that you have and that I'm able to do so in service. Um, I have, have not been job hopping particularly. Um, I'm focused on where I can add value and where the values of a next organization meet my values. Uh, I care a lot about Minnesota. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm not a stranger here. I'm not from Minnesota, uh, but it's people and some of my family are here and I have roots here, and I really would want to put down firm roots here and give you the leadership that you deserve. I've lived through several uh, transitions in administration. They slow momentum. Uh, and I would hope to, uh, if take, to take this job, to really be here uh, in a firm way to put down roots to help see um, you through uh, this next significant phase. I, I, I wouldn't be passing through Minnesota. So uh, thank you so much for your time and, and your efforts and the amount of vast time of your staff and you in making this important decision for the university. Thank you very much, Dr. Cunningham. That will conclude uh, Dr. Cunningham's uh, interview. And this board will now be recessed until 12.45 p.m. This is our time, did you know, to have lunch, to, to, to coalesce your thoughts and your notes as you individually think about which way you are proceeding on this entire matter and look forward to meeting our next candidate at 12.45 p.m. Thank you, everyone.
good afternoon. The special meeting of the Board of Regents will now come to order. Welcome back, everyone. At this time, we will welcome Dr. James Halloway. Good afternoon, Dr. Halloway. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Good. Good to have you here. Dr. Halloway, the board has a series of questions prepared for our time together today. For your information, each candidate has received the same nine questions from the board and two questions that are tailored to the candidate. If there is sufficient time at the end of the interview, we will give you an opportunity to ask us questions. And with that, Regent Wheeler will get us started with the first question. Great, thank you. Actually, my first question is easier. Is it Holloway or Holloway? I've been. It's, it's Holloway. Holloway, okay, thank you for that. I've been seeing it on paper and it's good to see you in person. Very good to see you. So my question is, uh, to start us off with, is why you? Um, we've all listened to and watched the finalist campus interviews and forums. Your presentations and responses to the questions were informative and thorough, which we really appreciate. Thank you so much. What do you believe differentiates you and should cause us to say you are our next president? In other words, what do you want us to know about you that should get us especially excited about you serving as the next president of the University of Minnesota? So, uh, Chair Mayor on uh, Regent Wheeler, thank you for the question and, and thank you all for your time. Um, I'd also like to uh, take a moment to thank the board staff who've been incredibly gracious uh, in uh, over the last several weeks. So thank you for that. Um, you know, so every morning um, uh, farmers get up across the state of, of Minnesota and they tend their crops, they tend their herds, they tend their, their, uh, their orchards. Um, they do that with knowledge gained from the University of Minnesota. Every morning, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans get up, they go to work, they civically engage. They do that with a foundation of knowledge and learning um, that came from the University of Minnesota. Uh, every day, hundreds of businesses across the state, from small to large, um, undertake their work, undertake their business using intellectual property, ideas, processes uh, that came from the University of Minnesota. To, to, to take an example, uh, the state produces 80% of the iron ore in the, the United States. Four of the five largest iron mines are in this, this state. Um, that only happened because of the University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota developed the, the capacity to take what is a low quality iron ore and turn it into a superior product in the term of what people call taconite pellets, which are really mostly hematite. Um, it's the University of Minnesota that makes all of these things possible. And the University of Minnesota is focused on and in service to the state. Not every university is actually in service to the state that supports it. The universities that I find exciting are the ones that are. One of the reasons I went to the University of New Mexico is it was a university that was about its state. Uh, one of the reasons I find the University of Minnesota so exciting is it is a university that is about its state. So why perhaps consider uh, me in this particular role? Um, so I'll start by saying that you know, I have extremely broad experience across all aspects of um, universities and how they function. I was at the University of Michigan for 30 years, University of Virginia for a short time before that, but Michigan for 30 years, five years now at the University of New Mexico. In those roles, um, I've undertaken research from insignificant funding to $17 million back when $17 million was real money. Um, I've um, managed student discipline. I've managed student success. I've supported students who were in trouble. I've supported students who were thriving uh, and um, really needed uh, challenges beyond their regular classrooms. Um, I've managed auxiliary units. I've managed academic units. Um, I've done promotion and tenure from the perspective of reviewer to ultimate decider uh, in, in my role as provost. Um, the, uh, uh, I've developed a large first year class that uh, all students were required to take uh, and I've taught that, that large first year class and everything up to small 
um, graduate classes. So I really do have a very large, broad perspective on the different operations of, uh, of universities and how they work and what they can do. Um, you know, what's, uh, what are, you know, what are some things that have happened because of that? If I take my time at the, the University of New Mexico, since I started there in, in 2019, we've increased first year enrollment by uh, new first year students by 42%. We've increased overall undergraduate enrollment by 10% in the last two years. Uh, we've increased philanthropic giving by 35%. We've increased research within um, the part of the university that, that I work with most directly by 27%. So we've really seen, I think, success in um, growing the impact of, of the institution. Um, and I would really love the opportunity to bring some of that experience here and combine it with the expertise and knowledge that I know is here on this campus and in this state to really live into that mission of the University of Minnesota as an institution that while it is global in its impact, is also deeply dedicated to its state. Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Uh, Regent Hipsch, if you would ask the next question. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mayron, and, and welcome, uh, Dr. Holloway. The next president will lead development of a new system-wide strategic plan and accompanying plan while overseeing completion of the current strategic impact 2025. You have been to all five of our campuses and have met hundreds of people across our system. We are an R1 land-grant university with a mission to serve the state of Minnesota through high-quality education, knowledge creation, innovation, and service to the people of this great state. Please share your vision for the University of Minnesota system and why you are the right leader to implement that vision. And secondly, please give us an example of your experience in strategic planning in your current or past positions and how you obtained buy-in from various stakeholders at the institution to adopt and advance the strategic plan. Thank you. So Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Hips, thank, uh, thank you for the question. I'm actually gonna swap the two. Um, I get to do that, because I'm, yeah. I'm giving the answer. Um, <laughs> and, and talk a little bit about uh, examples and, and experience in strategic planning first. Um, I've, I've done strategic planning at different levels. As an associate dean, I undertook strategic planning uh, around undergraduate education in the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. As a vice provost at Michigan, I undertook strategic planning that was focused on um, uh, digital learning and engaged education. Um, and uh, more recently, though, at the University of New Mexico, I've been deeply involved in what we call UNM 2040. And so I'll talk about that as, as uh, the, the primary example, if you will. Um, UNM 2040 is, is a, a plan that uh, uh, shortly after I arrived at the university, the, the president now that she had a new provost wanted to get going on, uh, we planned a kickoff for the, the planning process for that in late March of 2020. Oops, not a good time to start a strategic planning process. We wound up delaying the whole thing for a year because obviously our whole plan for a, a big uh, in-person kickoff suddenly couldn't happen. Um, so we delayed it by a year, but in doing that, we, it gave us some real time to think about where we were trying to get with this plan. And, and let me say some features of it. So why is it called 2040? Uh, a lot of people look at that and it's like, that's a long way away. Um, other universities have done that kind of long, long vision, not many, but a few. But when we created it, we had a couple of thoughts in mind. So one, Many universities' strategic plans are more tactical than strategic, right? So we tend to do five-year plans, and that leads to, oh, here's a set of things we're going to do right now so that in five years we'll have met some metrics. Those are good things, but it doesn't really tell you where you're trying to get to. It doesn't give you a North Star. Um, and, and one thing a strategic plan can do for you is help you find a North Star. Uh, and so we wanted UNM 2040 to give us a North Star. Where are we trying to get to in the long run? Because then within that framework, we, we create those shorter term, one year, three year, five year steps to move us towards that North Star. The other thing that we really wanted was as much a framework as a plan, because many university strategic plans, they kind of happen up here, president, the provost, maybe the deans get together and, and they get input, but they create a plan that's really at a very, of course, at a university level, but that also means that many parts of the institution are largely untouched by those plans. 
Um, it's very easy to, to kind of uh, set a set of goals and, and metrics that are that are at the university level and which individual faculty um, or departments or even whole colleges never touch on. So our other goal with, with our 2040 plan was to create a framework into which every other unit would plan. Uh, and so in fact, one of the, the first tactics that, that is uh, engaged in that plan is that we now have every unit doing strategic planning that has to fit into that framework. Um, it also gave us a way to align resource decisions for schools and colleges with the plan because now every request that we make, our annual budget request, our annual faculty hiring request, say, tell us how it aligns with the five major goals of UNM 2040. So our goal was to make that plan really um, one that gave us a long-term vision of where we're trying to get into which we could put our shorter term tactics and in which we could engage the university at many levels. How did we create that plan? Um, so we engaged a lot of stakeholders. Um, obviously, uh, we engaged students, we engaged, engaged faculty and staff, but we engaged legislature, legislators, we engaged the governor. Um, we brought together a council of the tribal leaders from across the state of New Mexico uh, to talk to them about what do they need to see in a university strategic plan. So we purposefully went beyond the institution in getting input for that plan. We used online tools to get input. We used in-person tools to get input. We got a lot of, of, of input into that plan. And now we're really making it part of the culture. Um, you can't kind of walk around the University of New Mexico now and not hear someone say, oh, goal one, that's, that's uh, advanced New Mexico. Goal two, that's student success. Um, we even have little cards printed up that, that have all of those things on it. So we really wanted to make something that was deeply embedded in the institution and in which we could do um, planning uh, and, and define the more tactical steps. Um, so, so that's an ongoing plan. It's already having impact. We use it every day to make decisions about how to resource, what to resource, um, what to work on. Um, now, when we think about the University of Minnesota, and the question is, is kind of share your vision. So I want to start by saying, to create a vision, you have to engage the place. Um, and so whatever I say in terms of vision has to be thought of as provisional, and I'm purposefully going to make it kind of broad and high level, because we do need to engage the, the stakeholders of the University of Minnesota, some of whom will be part of the university, some of whom will be outside before we kind of declare a vision the vision. Um, but I do think that having a, a vision of what your university is is important um, from a, a broad perspective. We didn't ha really have that at New Mexico, and now we do. We can tell you what we're about. Um, so, so I think the University of Minnesota is one of the, the new modern American universities, what Michael Crow calls the fifth wave of American universities. Um, and that is that it is a research university strongly dedicated to access. Not every research university is that. The University of Minnesota is. The systemness of the University of Minnesota gives it a unique capability in terms of access because we provide five different campuses which are appropriate for different kinds of students and learners. Um, and so when I think about the, the, the University of Minnesota, I really think that leaning into the research mission and the way that it supports all of those, um, all of the ways in which we serve the state is, uh, and, and human society is critically important. And so we often talk about our purposes as education, research, outreach. Sometimes we add patient care, and I think we always should. Um, because it is a critical part of what we do. Those things, research, teaching, outreach, patient care, those aren't the goals. Those are the ways that we achieve the goals, which is to serve the state of Minnesota, to serve the people of the nation, to serve the people of the world. Um, and, and when we think about how we define a vision for the institution, I think that we define that vision in terms of the ways that we serve, and the ways that we serve a broad population of people. Too many, too, too often in higher education, we allow ourselves to be defined by a set of institutions that are elite and even elitist. They're defined by who they reject and not who they accept. We should be defined by who we uplift. 
Um, and, and I think that's a different vision for, for what an institution should be. For me, that's the, the, the vision I have of the University of Minnesota, and I think it's uniquely positioned to deliver on that because it is a research powerhouse. It does have amazing opportunities for access. It has five campuses, each of which serves different populations of faculty and staff and students. Uh, the depth of its, uh, its intellectual breadth is combined with depth in a way that lets it um, attack global challenges and local challenges in ways others can't. And just as one example, um, one, of the, one of the challenges for, for any society going forward is what's called the food, water, energy nexus. Um, this university can do all those things. Not every university can. Um, this university can really take a One Health perspective. Um, we have the, the six health science schools that doc, um, Dr. Tolar likes to work, talk about, but we also have agriculture. Um, we also have um, the College of Biological Science. That actually lets you take a One Health perspective of um, all of the work that we do. So, so in my mind, it's that combination of a research institution with access devoted to service. That's the vision that, that um, I think the University of Minnesota can uniquely deliver on. Thank you. Uh, Regent Ruth Johnson, if you could ask your question. Thanks, Chair Mayor. Thank you again, Dr. Holloway. Uh, just a question here about Healthcare and Academic Medical Center. So the University of Minnesota is the state's public healthcare leader and innovator and are involved in education about 70% of our health, our medical and health workforce, and of course influences health policy in myriad ways. So how does your background and experience prepare you to lead a complex academic medical center and its related clinical partnerships? So Chair Mayor on uh, uh, Regent Johnson, good to see you again as well. Um, so, so let me start with you know, sort of the obvious question, what's the nuclear engineer got to say about healthcare? Um, and so let me start with some of the things that, that I did at uh, Michigan, some of the things that, that I've done at, at New Mexico, and then some, some broader thoughts. Um, and so about 10 years ago at the University of Michigan, we did not have an uh, interprofessional health education program. Um, it was a real hole. It was something that we absolutely needed. It's, it's not just is it a requirement for accreditation these days, but in terms of the way healthcare is done, it's critically important. So we didn't have that. Um, I funded the creation of our interprofessional health education program through a program that I ran out of the provost office uh, at the time. Um, and that program actually reported to me until I left Michigan. Uh, so interprofessional health actually reported through um, um, to me in, in the provost office. And that program had both educational components and in its second year we started a research component. So, so I, I actually have some, some direct experience with those two aspects of thinking about um, university, um, uh, university health science systems. Um, at the University of New Mexico, I have several clinical operations that report to me. So our speech hearing pathology um, program reports to me. We have several um, uh, clinical counseling services, including an addiction center that, that are part of my uh, portfolio. But the biggest piece is actually the Student Health Center. Um, and when I started at the university in 2019, our Student Health Center was undergoing a leadership crisis. Um, it, it did not have a clear executive director. Um, providers were leaving. Um, there, there was real challenges in, in working within the leadership structure that was in place. Um, and in fact, we were at risk of closing the doors. Um, there were literally days when it looked like we would not have enough providers um, on duty to, to open the doors of our student health center. Um, so I had to lead us through that. We engaged the University of New Mexico Hospital to um, help uh, uh, loan, us a, loan us a provider or two. Um, we brought in interim leadership who could help us transition from a very poor um, um, a low morale place to a place that was functioning. Um, and we did that just as we went into COVID. So we then had to carry that uh, interim leadership through COVID uh, with all of the complexities you can imagine uh, that providing. Um, we now have a, a great stable leadership there. We, we hired a terrific executive director, a terrific medical director. Um, and so it's in, in really good shape now. But that's a clinical operation that in fact was um, part 
of, of uh, um, uh, part of my portfolio in, uh, at the University of New Mexico. So I have that. Um, I'll go a step further. Um, a couple of years ago, the um, uh, Executive Vice President for Health Sciences at the University of New Mexico decided to retire. Um, that left us with an opportunity to rethink what we did with health sciences. The President and I did a listening sessions throughout the health system. Um, heard what folks were concerned about, what changes might be helpful. And based on that, um, I made recommendations to the president about how we restructure the leadership of the health sciences system. And I then chaired the search for the next executive vice president for health sciences. And so um, recommended to the president the person that, that we now have in that role. So I also have that experience of actually hiring um, a health science center leader. Uh, and that's important because you do not want a president who's going to run the academic medical center. Um, you want a president who's going to hire the right team, um, bring in the right kind of information, uh, provide the correct leadership to run a health science center. Um, uh, and again, that's, that's uh, you know, I've, I've had that experience of bringing in that leadership. When I think about the opportunity here, um, what's currently on your, on your plate is exactly the right thing. Um, so I've, I've talked to, worked, um, um, worked with folks at a number of universities where they own their health science center, they own their hospital system, and where they don't own their hospital system. And, and each place that doesn't own its hospital system is really struggling with that arrangement um, for some of the same reasons that, that uh, we're, we're struggling here in, in Minnesota. So absolutely going the right direction. It's a huge opportunity for the University of Minnesota to own its own hospital system. Um, and, and I mentioned that One Health perspective uh, a few minutes ago. Think of the opportunity that comes from having that complete set of health science uh, fields, but then all of those other fields as well, things like agriculture. You can't talk about animal health and not talk about um, plant health and ecosystem health. You can't talk about human health and not talk about ecosystem health. Um, so the opportunity there is huge. Um, as we look at um, acquiring, uh, reacquiring the, the, the four hospitals, East Bank, West Bank, Masonic Children's, and, and the Clinical and Surgery Center, um, one of the things that, that your president needs to do is ask the right questions. Um, I've had a chance to talk to um, uh, Myron Franz about this and, and kind of hear some of the things that are going on, and that's been super helpful. But the things I think about are... Um, you know, what is what is the fair value of the these hospitals? Um, they're they're going to have liabilities associated with them. Um, we need to understand what those liabilities are. What is the business plan for ensuring a net positive margin? Um, academic health centers work on net positive margins of a few percent. Um, this one will have 1,700 beds. That's a, not a small one. That's good. Bigger is better. Um, but what is the plan to operate um, uh, at a positive margin? There doesn't have to be a plan today, by the way. It's just that we need to work towards knowing how we can operate uh, the system with a positive net margin and provide mission payments to the medical school because uh, you have to subsidize the medical through school through clinical care. Um, what's the, what are the opportunities we have to develop the partnerships with uh, primary care networks? This is largely going to be a tertiary quaternary care system. And so referrals from primary care providers are critical. And that means partnerships with those primary care networks. So understanding the opportunities there right now are critical. Um, there's a longer term opportunity or challenge that we should think about. By 2030, CMS would really like everybody to be on a value-based payer system um, for healthcare. I don't know if they'll get there, but that's their goal. 2030 is not that far away. Um, most academic health systems work well on a fee-for-service system. Is there an opportunity, because we're acquiring these, uh, these hospitals, to think about that now and plan for that future in a way that we might not be able to? Um, it's very difficult to make the switch, and there's been a lot written on that. Um, so there are opportunities here um, and, and uh, a lot of questions. And it's really a matter of bringing in um, the leadership and the, the knowledge base to help us think through those questions from a financial and patient care standpoint. Um, there's also opportunities around um, co-branding with health systems across the state. What are, how do we realize those? So, um, so, so I'll, I'll stop there, but um, uh, hopefully, uh, Regent Johnson, that, that answers the question for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regent Farnsworth. 
Thank you, Chair Mayron, and good afternoon, Dr. Holloway. My question is about enrollment. Several of our campuses, as well as some collegiate units on the Twin Cities campus, have experienced enrollment declines. Although this is consistent with national trends, some universities have been able to maintain or even grow enrollment in this challenging environment. What strategies have you employed to place students and their success at the center of your work and maintain or potentially grow enrollment? So Regent Mayor on the, um uh, Chair Mayor and Regent Farnsworth, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, I've, I've looked at the enrollment numbers here, and, and of course, you know this, there are challenges. Um, uh, Morris is, is, you know, has fallen by about half over the last decade or so. Um, it looked like they just got a nice uh, tongue lashing from the, the legislature about that. Um, Crookston is a is, um, wonderful, amazing campus, but really kind of surviving on, on um, uh, online students, despite having all of that, that infrastructure in place. Um, Duluth is seeing some decrease in, in undergraduate enrollment. Um, Rochester is kind of different because it's so new, uh, and so it it's, doesn't make a lot of sense to draw conclusions there, but there are certainly things to, to think about in terms of enrollment. Twin Cities, pretty stable at the undergraduate level. Um, that's great. Pretty stable at the professional student level, but actually graduate students at the, in the Twin Cities campus are declining significantly. That's concerning for a research, R1 research university. Um, those graduate students' uh, populations are critical, both because they're the um, uh, they're a huge, huge source of intellectual capital and, and um, um, opportunities to train the advanced workforce of the state. Um, but master's students can also represent uh, a revenue stream. Uh, and so that, that graduate enrollment at Twin Cities is concerning. So, so there, there are questions to ask at each of the campuses here. Um, when I started at the University of New Mexico um, in fall of 2019, they had just enrolled their smallest class in a long time. Um, it had been a trend downward. It was a real concern. Kind of job one for me was, in fact, enrollment. Um, and so about the second or third hire that I made was, in fact, a new vice president for enrollment management. Um, and, and we hired someone who had real experience and great ideas about what to do about enrollment. Those things never translate directly, right? Each institution's different. Um, but knowing that this was a, a person who could, could bring in ideas and could work with us as a team to, to develop ideas that worked for the University of New Mexico was important. Um, and I'd mentioned you know, already some of the statistics. We eventually have increased first year classes 42% um, undergrad enrollment the last uh, two years. You know, total, total enrollment always, go, always lags first year enrollment, of course. And so that's why we don't see the, the um, total enrollment increase until the last couple of years, uh, but 10% in the last two years. Um, but, but how did that happen? What, what made it happen? So the first thing was we created a really serious enrollment. Um, strategic enrollment plan. It's incredibly detailed, it's 100, 150 pages long, and, and it's down to the level of we will visit these schools these many times. Um, and so we really gave ourselves a, a really clear playbook. Um, we pulled together everybody involved in enrollment, student retention, um, recruiting from across the institution to, to meet on a regular basis um, so that ideas could be shared. Um, um, <clears throat> We, um, we optimized scholarships. That was incredibly important. And so we had students who we were giving this, this much to in scholarship. They would have yielded at this much. And we had other students we were giving this much to, and they would yield here. And so by shifting funding from one student to the other as a recruiting scholarship, you could yield two where before we were yielding one. Uh, and so that scholarship optimization, also a very important um, uh, tactic to uh, to bring in uh, to bring in students. Um, if you look in the southwest, there's great data um, it comes out of, of a group called Witchy, but it's called Knocking on College Door, Knocking on the College Door. It tells you predicts out to the latest uh, 2036 um, high school high school graduations state by state. Um, it's great data to look at. New Mexico is challenged. We'll see a 22 percent drop from about now till then, um, but Texas will see growth. 
And so focusing on having recruiting in Texas is a really important strategy for us. Not that it will change things today, but we're also playing the long game. And, and one of the truths of enrollment is if you get students to start coming from a place, others will follow. Uh, and so putting, putting a recruiter in Texas is an important strategy for us, not just for today, but for the long run. Um, we, we used to get a lot of, of what are called junk applications. Um, we had a, a company out there that was being paid to generate applications for us. Those applications didn't yield. Um, they, they were not, usually weren't even completed, so we stopped doing that took all of that work in-house, um, and we buy a lot more names than we used to. The buying names is, is really the process of finding prospective students so you can get them to apply. We didn't become more selective. That wasn't our goal. Our goal was to get more students to apply, more students admitted, because then, even if yield is roughly constant, um, we would see increases uh, in enrollment. So a lot of strategies to get more students in the door. We also started focusing on transfer students. Um, uh, many universities don't know how many transfer students they have. I went through this at Michigan um, where I discovered that, that at the time I was there, 30% of the students at Michigan were transfer students. Nobody knew. So we put a program in place to support transfer students. Um, same thing at, at uh, New Mexico. We started focusing on transfer students, put um, special advisors into place just for transfer students and to work with local community colleges um, to, to bring those students in. So a lot we can do in terms of bringing students in. But then the other thing that's critically important is um, supporting students when they're there. Retention is an enrollment strategy. And so we've increased retention fall to fall, you know, you know, kind of first freshman to sophomore year, if you will. Um, we actually have started tracking enrollment from fall to spring and frankly, every term in between because um, we want to see where we're losing students. One technique that, that we've introduced every November, December now, um, we go out and we look at who did not enroll for spring. And we go to those students and say, oop, hey, we got an opportunity for you. Why didn't you enroll? Can we help you enroll? Um, we've set aside a pot of funds. We find students, we actually go through and we find every student with a financial hold. And we go through and, and take funds from this pot of funds where we can and clear their balance. Because losing a student over a couple hundred dollars of financial hold is just silly. Um, and so trying to, to do everything we can to help students stay enrolled, which is a hugely important to them. The, the, I know you'll ask later about basic needs, but keeping a student enrolled is a basic need strategy. Keeping a student on their scholarship is a basic need strategy because it puts money in their pocket. Um, and so keeping those students enrolled is very important. One of the, the other things I did um, when I started was create an associate provost for student success. Um, we had an associate provost for, it was a terrible title, something like, you know, um, quality control and something. Um, what, what the heck is that? We wanted to have an associate provost whose title was very clear. This is for student success. Student success is important. And, and implemented a whole set of student success strategies so that students are more successful. They get fewer, um, fewer, um, D, fewer uh, Ds, Fs, and withdrawals, fewer DFWs, as we say, more As and Bs. Um, and, and that student success work and having, having folks focused on that is another enrollment strategy because that helps students stay in school. More important, it's a mission strategy. Our goal is to educate people and, and let them be the, the, uh, the advanced workforce of the state, transform their families, transform their lives. Um, that can only happen if we help them, them graduate. Uh, and so we actually now, uh, we're just starting this, but we're gonna create a, a metric called scholarship retention. When students lose scholarship, um, because their GPA falls too low or their credit hours fall too low, we don't wanna see that happen anymore. We wanna have, be monitoring their retention of scholarships because that's an enrollment strategy, that's a success strategy that transforms people's lives. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, uh, our next question will be by Regent <coughs> Tad Johnson. Thank you, Chair Mayron, um, and good afternoon, Dr. Holloway. Minnesota has a unique culture, but it is not a 
monolith. It is home to 11 federally recognized tribes, as well as 5.7 million people with widely varying backgrounds, cultures, and viewpoints. It has major urban centers, small towns, and everything in between. If you are selected as president, you will be expected to lead on issues such as tribal relations, creating inclusive campuses where all students can thrive, and connecting the university with all parts of the state. Please give examples of how you did this in your current or previous roles. Uh, Chair Mayor on uh, Regent Johnson, thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I'll start with a, a, a little personal bit. I'm actually kind of, of excited about uh, the, the prospect of being in Minnesota because my mother is, is Slovenian. Um, there's a pretty significant Slovenian um, yeah. population here. Um, so, uh, so, so several things. So, so let me also kind of start by making a parallel. Um, the, the state of New Mexico is incredibly diverse. Um, 23 native tribes, uh, Pueblos, um, um, bands, and nations. Um, uh, significant um, uh, uh, Vietnamese population, um, uh, other Asian American population, surprising to some people, but, but there is uh, African American population and a unique African American culture, I might add, um, with the, the Afro-Mexican influence um, from uh, just across the border. Um, and the university, we work hard to mirror that. Um, our undergraduate population is 50% Hispanic, 60% overall minoritized. Um, uh, and 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 so the 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 way in which we create an inclusive environment is very important to us. Um, as far as, as you know, some concrete things that I've done. So, in the role of of provost, I get to hire a lot of people, uh, and I think that's an important opportunity because one of the things we want to do is is to the extent at all possible is have leadership that reflects who we are. Um, and so half of the leadership hires I've made have been women, half have been minoritized persons, persons of color, um, uh, folks who are, who are um, uh, openly gay, folks who are um, disabled, uh, kind of in many dimensions of, of um, 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 minoritized um, um, perspectives. Um, uh, and so hiring a diverse group of leaders is important. That sets a tone, that sets a, um, um, it's more than just symbolic, but it's also symbolic. And the thing I want to say is, you know, how do you do that? How do you hire 50% women or 50% minoritized persons? Um, turns out the best practices work. You just have to actually do them. Um, and so there are a lot of best practices known in hiring. You, you guys have done implicit bias training as part of this process. That's one of them. Um, it turns out that a lot of places that know they should do these things don't do these things. Um, and when you do them, uh, when you keep pools diverse and so on, uh, you can get where you need to get without, um, uh, without making any assumptions about who you should or shouldn't hire. Um, and so, so we provide training for faculty. We require every faculty search committee now to do implicit bias training. That wasn't the case when I started. Um, we created an inclusive excellence postdoc program to bring in uh, minoritized um, um, postdocs um, and then see if departments want to, to hire those folks as assistant professors. And my commitment as provost is um, if, if a department wants to keep one of their inclusive excellence postdocs as an assistant professor, I will work like hell to make that happen, to find the funding, to, to find the faculty line so that we can actually do that. Um, another tool we have at, at the university that's very powerful is a set of, of student, um, uh, student, affiliate, uh, student um, uh, ethnic centers, if you will, student, um, uh, student identity centers, African American Student Services, El Centro de la Raza, focused on Hispanic students, um, American Indian Student Services, LGBTQ Resource Center, Women's Resource Center, um, Asian uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Resource Center. That's a, a new one we created just recently. Those centers are incredibly powerful. When you look, for example, at American Indian Student Services, students who engage with American Indian Student Services are retained from first year to second year um, at rates over 90%, while the majority of students at the university are retained at rates of like 77 to 80%. So it's a huge impact by engaging with those centers. 2020 comes along, um, the state uh, reduces our budget in the middle of the year and kind of in June they have a special session cut, uh, understand why. Um, those centers were, were cut 
directly by the state. They have funding directly from the state. We made that one good. So we, we, we knew that we were going into a bad period of time where students would need support. We ensured that those student centers, those student-focused ethnic centers, would not have their budgets reduced by taking other university funds and, and putting them there because the students would need that support. Um, I think when we, when we think about working uh, across uh, um, um, working across diversity, it has to hit every aspect of our mission. So we have a research um, program called Grand Challenges, which is focused on um, doing research that is of uh, one interdisciplinary and two of special interest and support for the state. Two of our recent level, so-called level one grand challenge teams, one was focused on culturally responsive literacy. We have a lot of, of bilingual learners um, in our state. Uh, another was focused on um, uh, an indigenous view of child development, in particular Diné, uh, Navajo, uh, and so developing Diné specific milestones for child development rather than um, the, the milestones for child development that, that many of us maybe might think of coming from a, a kind of a Western European um, um, focus. Uh, another of the, uh, the grand challenges, which has now moved to what we call a level two team, it's called Just Transitions. And this one's important. Um, it, it really focuses on a different kind of diversity. But two of our counties, Lee and Edie County, are the oil patch, um, the, the one of the largest oil producing regions in the country. They're part of the Permian Basin. So when you think of Texas, it's actually partially eastern New Mexico. Um, there's a distinct culture associated with the people who work there and a distinct economy. In 10 or 20 years, that will be gone. Just Transitions is about how do you help the people in that region transition to something new, to a new economy that isn't focused on um, um, oil and extraction. Um, two more examples. Um, uh, we've had a, an Africana Studies program for a long time, over 50 years. Um, no one had ever turned it into an academic department. Um, that's, uh, I did that. Um, it, it was for whatever reasons, there, there were all kinds of political reasons why it didn't happen, but there was absolutely no reason why the University of New Mexico shouldn't have an academic department focused on Africana studies, especially when there are unique aspects of the African experience in the Southwest. Um, uh, that are that are related to um, really the the, the ways that, that um, African populations have interacted with and engaged with Hispanic populations and native populations in that region that are different from what you see in the rest of the country. Um, and one last example, we have a terrific Native American studies program. Um, we want to build that up. We gave them a, a faculty line um, a couple of years ago, and they found two people and said, can we hire two? Absolutely, because building that up is important because when we talk about diversity, it's got to be throughout the whole institution, in the academics that we do, in the research we do, in the way that we support individuals, in the way that we engage with the state. And so I hope those examples hit, hit on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Holloway. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, if you could ask your question. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Holloway. Um, I want to ask you about student success this afternoon. Students are central to everything we do at the University of Minnesota. Uh, can you please first share your definition of student success and along with that provide examples how you have promoted academic success, enhanced the student experience, and addressed issues such as mental wellness, campus safety, and food security, both in the graduate and undergraduate context. Sure, Chair, Mayra, Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Kenyanya, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I wanna start with that, what is student success? Um, it's actually related to a broader philosophy that I, I, I think I have, which is that it's not for me to define someone else's success, it's not for me to define someone else's needs. Um, uh, that'll come up in, in some of our other discussions. But so when we think about what is student success, aspirationally, we should start with the student and what they think their success is. Um, so in my mind, student success isn't graduation. Graduation's good, but 
The real question is, did you graduate able to pursue your own aspiration? If you wanted to go to medical school, could you go to medical school? If you wanted to go to graduate school, could you go to graduate school? If you wanted to get a, a job with a certain kind of company, could you do that? If you wanted to start your own company, could you do that? So aspirationally, I think of um, student success in terms of uh, if, if we think about it kind of at uh, that, that graduation level, did you graduate able to do what you aspire to do? Um, back when I was in um, the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan, um, we put together a program called MSTEM. Uh, and, and the idea of MSTEM was to support minority, lower income, first gen students, students who were vulnerable in, in various ways to achieve their aspiration and in working with students, the, the thing that we, we saw was a challenge for students, and this is in engineering, is graduating with less than a B average meant you might as well not have graduated because a company wouldn't interview you. So Boeing won't interview you if, you're, if you show them a resume that says 2.7. Um, Ford Motor Company won't interview you if you show them a resume that says 2.7 or 2.8, three or above. And so when we designed MSTEM, the goal was to help this group of students who weren't always getting those kinds of grades, get those grades, get, those, get that GPA that would allow them to be interviewed by these companies that otherwise weren't talking to them. Um, and so that was an example of kind of putting that philosophy into, into place. And by the way, yes, it worked. Um, uh, it was a cohort-based program uh, starting before they, the, the summer before they started college. We, we, we often said we based it on the Meyerhoff program at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which had a different goal, but its secret sauce was creating a cohort and creating social capital for, for students. So we did that. Um, we did improve those graduation GPAs, and um, that allowed students to actually get the kinds of, of positions they wanted. Um, at University of New Mexico, my first term there, um, I took a chunk of change and handed it to a committee on student mental health and said, decide how to spend it. Um, and, and they did some really clever things with it. Some of it they put into additional counselors at the, uh, um, I assume Dr. that's Halloway? not me. I, I was going to say, hang on, let us see what's going on with okay. the system. We don't, want, we don't need white noise in the background here for your responses. Only for our questions. I thought it was in my head. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this if you want. <laughs> I thought it was in your head, too. <laughs> I kept thinking, am I rubbing this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not you. Is it coming from your speakers? Or is it coming from? <laughs> oh, she's muted. So. Let's just take a five minute recess. We won't dock you for the time <laughs> while we get this sorted out. It's getting worse, not better. It is. <laughs> well, we will take a five minute recess and return. Recess and return. <laughs>
All right, our recess is over. Supposedly our technology is working and our fingers are crossed. All right, uh, Regent Hall Holloway, if you wanna continue with your answer on student success. Uh, Chair Maron, I'd be happy to, but thank you for the promotion to Regent first. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like we had a cliffhanger at the end of our last episode. The provost had handed a chunk of change to a committee on mental health. <laughs> and so I was, I was just starting to describe some of the things they did with it, which was to, to build out a network of, uh, uh, of mental health supports, not just in the, um, uh, the student um, health and counseling center, um, but to actually um, look at providing mental health supports in the Women's Resource Center and African American Student Services. Over time, we, we put a half a, half a uh, FTE of counseling in the law school. So we tried to make it a system and not focus it all in one place. Um, and, and that work continued. We've, we've never stopped working on mental health. Uh, and, and in the last couple of years, the regions have gotten very interested and been very supportive. Uh, and so in the last about year and a half, we've added nine FTEs of uh, staff in mental health within our um, student health and counseling center. Um, we've also uh, deployed a um, online telehealth platform that does both physical health and mental health, but mental health was our, our primary focus. Um, it's one you may have heard of, it's, it's called Timely Care. A number of universities have been using it. One of the things we did as, as we started to contract with them though that, that I wanna mention is um, we actually made it a joint negotiation with us New Mexico State University and the, uh, the, the vendor um, to really increase the volume and, and get a better deal. But equally importantly, um, that allowed New Mexico State to, um, uh, to bring in a, a similar kind of support. Uh, and, and I flag that because, you know, as universities in a state, we don't always have to work against each other. We can actually support each other in, in a number of ways. Um, so, so again, a, a lot of work there in, in mental health. Um, in basic needs, we sponsored a, a basic needs a survey a couple of years ago um, that was very informative and sobering as, as those surveys always are. Um, uh, that's now gone statewide. And in fact, the research team that did it for us are, are doing it for the entire, all the uh, colleges and universities in the state. Um, as part of the outcomes of that, we moved our food pantry, which was kind of tucked in a weird little basement that nobody knew where it was, to a permanent location in the student union. We gave it proper equipment so they have refrigeration and can, can distribute refrigerated materials. Um, I provided a full-time staff um, for, the, for the food pantry. Um, we also really started to think about this in a systematic way. Um, and so this is really about student wellness understood broadly. Um, and, and so when we think about basic needs, food, housing, um, mental health, um, we're thinking about pieces of, of a much larger problem and we really wanna look at it systematically. Um, uh, our our uh, vice president for uh, student affairs who, who reports to me is now organizing it along the, the eight dimensions of wellness that are defined by, by SAMHSA. Um, but it's really thinking about you know, wellness is physical health, but it's also emotional health, it's also spiritual health, it's financial health. Um, I won't kind of hit all, all eight, but, but to think about individuals holistically um, and think about our supports holistically. Because one, one of the truths of mental health, to hit that one, is we're not gonna staff our way out of mental health problems. Um, that's that's a, uh, really a well-known well issue. The best approach is to create an environment in which students' health and, and well-being is, is prioritized in a continuous way so that we don't get students to the point where they're having mental health crises and, and, don't, and, and in need of clinical care. Um, uh, as um, uh, uh, I think related to that the, in student success is student success in an academic way. Um, and I won't hit everything, but, but I mentioned our associate provost for student success. Um, she's really responsible for, for getting a lot of really impactful programming into the classroom. A lot of student success works gets done on the margin. We'll have a, you know, we have a tutoring center. We have several tutoring centers. Those are helpful. They're good. Um, but a lot of student learning happens in the classroom. A lot of uh, support needs to happen in the classroom. So we've trained, uh, we trained faculty in a set of, of very simple um, 
low, low weight uh, psychosocial um, interventions that make a difference to students in a classroom. I, I mentioned this example um, previously to some of you. Just read, a, just stop, don't use the term office hour because nobody knows what an office hour is. When you've got a gen, uh, population of first gen students, what the heck's an office hour? Mm -hmm. um, and so calling those student help times uh, or other words that convey a meaning to a student who doesn't hang around universities all the time has a huge impact. We put a group of peer learning facilitators in classrooms. So in, in large, um, high fail rate classrooms, hiring upper level students who are near peers to the students taking the class and having them sit in the classroom uh, and then be peer learning facilitators is very powerful because the other students, they're not going to some tutoring center to meet a stranger who's going to teach them about, help them understand calculus. They're sitting in the classroom with that peer learning facilitator who can help them on the spot between classes, whenever it may be. Um, and so we, with all of these techniques, we see a decrease in DFW rates. We see an increase in the number of A's and B's um, that students are getting in those, uh, in those classes. Um, and so um, um, really all of these things go together. I'll mention one last, uh, I mentioned this before, but I want to hit it again. Um, for us, an important basic needs tool is scholarship retention. Um, we have a lot of Pell students. We have a lot of students supported on state scholarships. Um, if it's not hard for them to lose their state scholarship, and if they lose their state scholarship, now their Pell is covering tuition instead of room and board. And now they're, they're food insecure, they're housing insecure. Keeping them on that state scholarship is a tool to let their Pell um, address their food and housing needs. And so that's become a very important tool for us as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if the episode ended. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Regent Turner, if you wanna ask the next question. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Holloway, the, this is in regards to relationship development. The University of Minnesota is a mission-focused, premier public land-grant university, and Minnesotans feel a great deal of pride and ownership in it. In addition to students, faculty, and staff, there are many other important stakeholder relationships that need to be nurtured. Please talk about your approach and experience in building relationships with the following. Students, faculty, and staff, unions, elected leaders, donors, and governing boards. As you address relationships with these stakeholders, please offer examples of how you have navigated and resolved disagreements with any of them. Uh, Chair Mayron, uh, Chair Turner, uh, uh, Regent Turner, Turner uh, um, thank you for the question. Um, it's got a lot of parts. Um, so, so let me start with kind of, a, of an overarching principle, and I, I alluded to it earlier. Um, when, when working with any stakeholder group, um, really what you want to do is understand their needs and interests. Um, it's not about me. I brought a visual aid. It's not about me. <laughs> um, really, it, it, with all of these stakeholder groups named, um, it's, it's not about approaching them with, with my needs or the university's needs. It's really about understanding their needs. Um, and that, that plays out in different ways for different um, members of these stakeholder groups, but I think it's where we always have to start. We're talking about building relationships. We're not talking about doing transactions. Um, and, and building relationships has to, um, you know, people say it's founded on trust, that's true, but trust comes from genuine interest to genuinely understand what are people's concerns, um, uh, why, why, why are they where they are, um, I view these as learning opportunities. This is a chance for me to, to learn when I engage with people what they care about, what their needs are, um, so that I can think about, okay, how might we find ways to do things together? Um, so students, faculty, and staff to, to kind of make things concrete and, and take that group first. Um, there's a lot of ways that, that I have of connecting with, with these groups. Um, I meet regularly with our student body presidents. Um, I meet regularly with our student assembly, our st uh, a student senate. Um, we have another student group called the Joint Council, which the student assembly forms, but it's really meant to be kind of, of just an advisory group. The student senate themselves have, have lots of, if you will, legislative business. Um, so I meet with, with that group. Um, 
uh, all of those are opportunities to uh, mostly just answer questions from them because their questions tell us what, what their interests are, what their concerns are. Um, something else I frankly do for students is, is I have lunch in the union every so often, at least once a week. Um, just to be there, to be in that environment, um, but also there by being there to be accessible. So people can come up to me and say hi, or that's an unhealthy lunch, or whatever it is they want to say. Um, <laughs> Occasionally, not often. Um, uh, so, so that's that's I think an important way to re reach that group. Um, our faculty has a we have a very effective faculty governance system, um, and so I meet regularly with the faculty senate president. Um, they have an executive group called Ops. I meet with them regularly, um, tell them what's going on, and and um, um, you know hear what their questions are. Um, I'm required to meet once a year and, and report to the Senate. I, I report to the Senate every meeting because um, I want them to know what's going on. I want to hear what their questions are, what their concerns are. Um, we have a group called Staff Council. Um, I just met with them this last week. Um, they were interested in um, uh, a lot of a lot of what they were interested in was actually issues relating to how we were talking about um, uh, protests going on relative to the Middle East. So we spent a lot of time talking about that at this last the last staff council. Um, but again, and I also meet with their their president regularly. So I look for those those opportunities. I also have a separate staff council, provost staff council, or a staff advisory committee, um, and and a lot of the work they do is about creating. A, um, they do an awards program, which I think is important. We also do a lot of work around creating a, a welcoming, joyful environment. Um, just to give an example from my, my provost staff group, um, last fall we handed out flowers to students, and the idea is the student takes the flower and gives it to a staff member. So it comes with a little tag so that they can say thank you, and the students then are, are um, you know, just a simple little a show of gratitude that goes a long way uh, with people. Those are those are powerful powerful symbols. Um, we've got about a dozen uh, unions at the University of New Mexico. Uh, two of them are ones that I work with directly. The the unions that uh, unionize academic employees and so faculty and graduate assistants. Um, they're both relatively new, um, and um, you know I think we've learned a lot about how to work well together. But one thing that that we did was build into both of their contracts, a labor management committee. It's not something we'd had at New Mexico before, but it just gives us a forum to get together and informally solve problems. And I think about what we do as problem solving. Um, they frequently tell us about things that are wrong. Um, give an example, our, our graduate assistants, um, uh, contract periods were not being properly done. We can fix that. It's not hard to fix. Um, but we, you know, as soon as we know about it, it's it's not something that's hard to fix. So creating those places where, where folks can um, share concerns and problems leads to solutions. And the labor management committees are, are one of those. Um, um, I'm going to skip elected leaders and come back to them. Um, I've worked a lot with donors for well over a decade. I've closed seven-figure gifts. Um, I enjoy donors. I've taken a train. I've taken a long train trip through China with a donor. Um, uh, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, uh, I, I work with our foundation board regularly. I'm, I'm whenever they meet, I'm there. Um, it's really about building good friendships with donors uh, and understanding what they're interested in and what their concerns are. Yes, they love the university, but they give for the things that matter to them. Um, I will also say with donors that the part of the work of a president with donors is about developing strategy. It's not always about individual donors and, and, and their relationship with the president. It's also about um, the broader strategy and the way we engage the university in philanthropy. Um, uh, with governing boards, um, I work with our regents pretty much continuously. They're all on speed dial. Um, the uh, uh, we have an interesting structure. Uh, we have one committee. It's kind of like your kind of mission fulfillment committee, but we call it STAR, Student Success Teaching and Research. I'm actually a member of that committee. And so that committee is three regents, the provost, the staff council president, and the faculty senate president. Um, 
I draft the agenda for that. The, the regent chair of the committee finalizes it. I go to all executive sessions of the um, regents unless they're talking about the president's performance and then that's fine. They can do that in private without me. Um, so very engaged with the board. Um, now let me circle back to elected leaders um, and, and then also talk a little bit about uh, uh, disagreements, um, but not with elected leaders. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, elected leaders because I, I work with them a lot. And I want to say it's not just elected leaders, it's elected leaders and their staff. Um, the legislative staff is very important. The staff of our um, delegation in Washington is very important. Um, they're, they're frequently the source of, of many solutions and, and pathways to those solutions. Um, and so it, it, is in this, it, it is what I described previously. It's about developing relationships with legislators. Um, there are legislators that, that I have breakfast with regularly. Um, there are legislators who have common interests as, as far as what they're hoping to see happen in New Mexico and what I'd like to see happen with the University of New Mexico, we connect. Um, one of the, the challenges we have, which is I think a challenge here too, is, is faculty compensation. Um, and so starting about four years ago, we wanted to bring this issue to the legislature to get funds to help us make our faculty compensation more competitive. Um, that involved talking to legislators, but also key legislative staff. Um, and, and I can remember kind of the, the, the meetings we had with the director of the Legislative Finance Committee to talk about this problem where, where he moved from not thinking about this to, oh yes, yes, we should do something about this. And the framing is really important. I can't present this to the legislator, legislature as this is a problem for the University of New Mexico. I have to present it as it's a problem for the state of New Mexico. We are losing talent. We're investing in, in smart people and they're leaving. That's a problem for the state. That's something legislators get interested in. Um, it's not really their job to solve the problems of the university, but it is their job and their interest to solve the problems of the state. So framing our challenges in ways that relate to their interests, what their constituents care about, what they can run on is incredibly important in working with legislators. Um, and so we're, we've been successful at that. We provided really good data. We provided the argument for why this is bad for the state. Last year, we got funds from the state for faculty compensation. Um, the legislature just finished last week, once again, put funds for faculty compensation in. Um, fingers crossed the governor hasn't signed yet, um, but um, I'm confident that that will happen. Same with construction. I've, I've had two large capital projects that we've moved through the legislature um, by making it clear how they were important to the state. So for example, a, a Center for Collaborative Arts Technologies, arts, I don't know, arts is one in 10 jobs in New Mexico. Now that's something a legislator gets interested in. Film is a huge industry in New Mexico. Pick your favorite film. Good chance some of it was filmed in New Mexico. Um, film's a big industry. So placing it in terms of, of those economic interests for the legislature was important. Now we're doing a humanity social science building. We just got a $55 million um, bond agreed to for that from the legislature. What do the legislators care about right now? Nursing students and teacher education students. Well, guess what? Every nursing student, every teacher education student takes classes from the humanities and social science departments. So that matters to something that those legislators care about. Um, Dr. Holloway, I yes. just wanted to let you know you have about 15 minutes and we have um, four or five more questions uh -oh. to get with you. So I know you have more to say and we actually want to I'll, hear it, but I'll we're running out of time. I'll let it go. Um, right. And, and uh, I could talk about a disagreement, but uh, we'll, we'll let that one go too. <laughs> all right. It came out successfully. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Marion, and welcome back, Dr. Holloway. Higher education generally and university presidents specifically are under fire across the country. Please tell us about a stand that you took on a difficult academic or social issue that required courage of conviction. We are particularly interested in examples involving academic freedom or freedom of expression, which have been at the forefront of recent debates across the country. How did you communicate with the university community and the media about this 
difficult academic or social issue? And how did the various constituents respond? And what did you learn from the experience? Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Chair Mayeron and uh, Regent Davenport, thank you, and good to see you again also. Um, so, so I'll, I'll kind of just jump into an example. A couple of years ago, um, one of our student groups working with a national organization started bringing a series of speakers to campus. Um, and the, um, uh, the, the national group actually has this as a strategy. They bring a um, moderately controversial speaker to campus, and then the next, if they get a good reaction from their perspective, they next bring a more controversial speaker. And if they get a reaction, they next bring a more controversial speaker. Um, and, and so there's a purposeful escalation strategy on the part of this, this national organization. Um, and so when the first speaker was, was brought to campus, we were frankly caught flat-footed. Um, yeah, we kind of knew that was happening. We didn't think about it too much. We were not ready for the counter protesters who showed up um, and um, showed up in our union, student union outside the room where um, the, the event was happening. Um, the, the students banged on the doors. I shouldn't say students. Some were students. Some were folks from outside the university. That's a, a challenge we always have to remember. So the counter protesters banged on the doors. They banged on the walls. Their goal was to prevent the speech from happening. Um, that, of course, is not acceptable. Um, so it really doesn't matter that there's a controversial speaker. Um, uh, it doesn't matter that what they're going to say might be uh, challenging or, or upsetting to someone. It doesn't matter if I find it abhorrent. Freedom of speech has to be protected precisely when you find the speech abhorrent. You don't need to protect speech you agree with. You have to protect speech you don't agree with. So that was our stand. Um, unfortunately, because we were caught a little flat-footed, um, the people inside the, the auditorium were very frightened because all they got was people banging on doors and they're trying to hold them closed. Um, uh, we quickly put together a, a plan to get them out through alternate doors, um, but, but it was really a kind of a touch-and-go situation, and that speech was disrupted. Um, so same organization now, they got a reaction. They're sending the next even you know, more controversial person. Um, but now we're getting, now we're kind of ready for this thing. And, and we did a couple of things, um, not precisely in this order, but to give you a sense of the scope. So we created a, a put together a group to um, a, a kind of a freedom of speech task force. We stood up a website for students kind of saying more, I call it the how to protest website. Um, so it, it emphasizes that, you know, if there is something happening on campus you disagree with, you're free to disagree. Here are ways to disagree that's constructive. Um, safety is always going to be important. You can't disagree in a way that, that um, um, threatens someone's safety. Um, so we put that in place. We put together and uh, put a system of supports in place as well around everything from um, having um, folks on hand to de-escalate um, when, when individual protesters might come too close together and get into some conflict, um, to managing ticketing. You wouldn't have thought managing ticketing matters in these events, but it turns out it does, because one form of counter-protest is to buy up all the tickets. Um, and another form of counter protest, and, and not go, by the way, just leave the place empty. Another is to buy tickets and or get tickets. Nobody sells these. Um, and, and go and protest in the room. You've got to be ready for both of those. Um, and, and so we put together the systems to try and deal with that. Um, and, and then we got to the third stage. The actual leader of this group came, very controversial. Um, a lot of counter protest, very, um, very physical counter protest. People grabbing barricades and shaking them and moving them. And, and it was very interesting in that, again, it's some students, some folks from the community, and, and you could watch many of our students leave the, pro the counter protest when, when they thought it was getting too much energy into it. Um, so, so, but we put the system in place and we defended the right of these speakers to speak. That did not sit well with a number of legislators, uh, didn't sit well with a number of donors who wanted us to um, expel students um, for, for their counter protests, who wanted us to, uh, while others were saying you shouldn't let these people speak on campus. Um, uh, different parts of the press, same kind of narratives, um, different parts of, of elected leaders, same kinds of narratives. So, so we have kind of all these voices saying, 
no matter what you did, it was bad. Um, and, and we had to simply stand by the principle. We're a university. Um, free expression is incredibly important here. Um, it is acceptable for people to say things I find abhorrent or you find abhorrent, um, and I don't have a right to silence them. And, and you don't want to give someone like me the right to silence them, because when you give someone like me the right to silence a group, it is historically almost invariably used to silence the, the, those who are most vulnerable. Um, so, so we stood by the, the principles, and um, you, know, you, you take a little bit of a beating in the press, um, but that's okay, because it's the principles that are really important here. Thank you. Regent Colley. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Dr. Holloway. Oh. <laughs> Third time I've done that today, but. As long as it doesn't get staticky. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to avoid. Um, thank you so much for being part of this process and just so appreciated the time that you've put into going through it and the engagement with our community. Um, this actually is a really good uh, way to start thinking about this question about leadership style. Um, I would love to hear about how you would describe your leadership style, um, and what it looks like in action. Um, specifically, it'd be great if you could give us insight into how you build, support, and motivate a leadership team, and describe a time when you made a difficult decision that was upsetting to a specific stakeholder group. Um, how did you make the decision, and how did you engage the group after the decision was made? So, uh, uh, Chair Mehran and uh, Regent Gully, thank you for the question. Um, so, so I'll start with kind of the, uh, what is what is my leadership style. Um, there's a, a leadership style uh, many people have, haven't heard of, but I think it actually captures it well. It's called the host leadership style. Um, and uh, think about what a host does. They invite people to the party. Sometimes they're in the spotlight and talk to the people at the party. Uh, sometimes they introduce people at the party to each other. Sometimes they stand aside and just watch. Sometimes they go work in the kitchen. Um, that's what the host leadership style is about. It's about, in different contexts, doing each of those things. So sometimes the leader needs to be out front, um, standing in, in front of the crowd or whatever it may be. Sometimes the leader needs to be bringing other members of the leadership team or of the institution or the institution and its stakeholders together. Um, sometimes the leader needs to be observing and figuring out the big picture and figuring out how to act. Sometimes you need to be back in the kitchen, maybe with a small group, um, figuring out um, uh, what is a, what's an important strategic imperative, what dish should we prepare um, in, in order for the whole party to go successfully. Um, so so I, I, like, I like that metaphor of, of the host leadership style. Um, What's it look like uh, kind of for me day to day? Um, I kind of have a, a tiered leadership team. I have a very small team that's, that's kind of just in the provost office um, who we meet regularly, we see each other regularly. Um, it's really important that that group have shared values um, and have a shared sense of where they're going. Um, we have a larger team uh, that brings in a few other folks. They don't, not all folks who report to me either. So for example, we have a group called the Provost Leadership Team. It includes some folks who don't report to me, but it's really important that they be in the loop on what we're doing. Our Vice President for uh, uh, Equity and, um, uh, and Inclusion is an example. And then I have what I think of as the, larger, the largest team, which is all of the deans, uh, which includes all the health science deans as well. Um, uh, all of the deans, um, uh, and, and we meet less regularly as a group, but nevertheless, in all of these tiers, um, my goal is one, for, for folks to have a shared sense of values and a shared sense of purpose. Because the whole point of having this team is the team can do way more than any one of us can do individually. They have different strengths. They have different spheres of influence. Um, when I started at the University of New Mexico, the provost office was very command and control. Um, I can't operate that way for a lot of reasons. Um, but, but part of it is it's really inefficient. If every decision has to come through the, 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 the provost, um, then we're not taking advantage of, of all the talent that we have. Um, 
part of developing that team then is um, setting expectations and giving folks the resources to succeed. And so let me give an example with the deans, and it relates to, to philanthropy. When I started, the deans weren't really sure if fundraising was part of their job or not. Um, well, I think it is. Um, and so we had to set expectations with the deans. Fundraising is part of your job. Um, and, and we started that in kind of the very simple, soft way. Every dean is going to meet with me and the president of the foundation, and that'll be an exploration of their philanthropic opportunities, challenges, and goal setting. Um, and, and that had never happened before. It was always the foundation sort of talking to deans about these things. The deans don't work for the foundation, but they do work for the provost. So just that change in who was there changes the way that the team responds. And then you got to provide resources. So we make sure that they have the development officers they need. But equally important, we provided training through CASE, through um, um, advancement, um, um, uh, advancement resources. These are, these are national groups that do training and fundraising. So create expectations, provide the training and support to be successful. Um, yeah, you know, as for a time when, when uh, there was a difficult decision, pick anything in COVID. Um, and so provost office at the University of New Mexico is all the, you know, teaching, learning, and research. It's all there. Um, and in fact, when we went into the start of COVID, we were undergoing a leadership transition in the vice president for research. Um, and so we, we had that kind of funny dynamic going on, too, um, and that the, the VPR who reports to me was going to be leaving soon, but we didn't have a new person in place. Um, and so all of that work to change the way the university operated for the next, we didn't know how long, turns out year and a half, um, that's a series of difficult decisions that not everybody agreed with and that people were in conflict on. So some colleges wanted to be very permissive in their, leave everybody in the labs and do all co courses online. Some wanted the opposite. Um, can't do that. Couldn't do either of those. But you couldn't have different ways of doing things at different parts of the university. We had to all work in the same way. Um, so getting those deans together and getting everyone on the same page is important and, and deciding that and then saying, okay, you know, we've talked about it. This is what we're going to do. But for one other, um, enrollment management was very unhappy with our vaccination program. So, so we developed a vaccination program that started with incentives, education about vaccination, um, provision of clinics, and purposely evolved from that into um, requirement for all faculty, staff, and students. Um, and, and of course, not everyone agrees with that. But enrollment management was very worried about that because they'd done all this work to bring in all their students I told you about. And we were about to say, student, if you don't get vaccinated, you're out. Um, they were very concerned about what that would do to our enrollment. Um, and so we had to work through that with them. Um, in the end, it's a giant game of chicken. Very few students actually left. Um, we, we progressively rolled out the discipline on those students, if you will. Extol, 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 infinite patience, infinite humanity, until, okay, finally disenrolled. Almost every student we disenrolled got vaccinated and we put them back in immediately. No, no harm, no foul. Um, but, but enrollment management was very opposed to that action because they didn't know how it would come out. Um. Thank you. We're now going to turn to a couple questions that are specific to you. Uh, Regent Tarabi, if you could ask your question. Thank you, Chair Mehran. Uh, Dr. Holloway, uh, thanks for being here this afternoon. Can you share a specific example from your previous roles where you had to navigate a tough conversation or deliver challenging feedback? How did you approach the matter and what were the outcomes? Uh, so, Chair Mehran, uh, uh, Regent Talarabi, um, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Confucius Institute at the University of Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, um, uh, part of my role at the University of Michigan was senior international officer. Um, we had something called a Confucius Institute that reported to me. Those not familiar with them, Confucius Institutes are um, funded by the Chinese government to promote um, Chinese culture um, around the world. They've been highly controversial. Um, they've certainly been controversial in the United States as um, places that, that may impinge on academic freedom. Um, certainly, they're explicitly a projection 
production of Chinese soft power. That's their fundamental purpose. Um, so there, there's been a lot of controversy about them and, and a lot of pressure on universities not to have them anymore. Um, and so we had one of these at the, the, the University of Michigan. Um, and there came a time when, when I decided that, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't have this organization. Um, uh, some of the fundamental, there was the pressure from the federal government, but the more fundamental ones is it was actually duplicative of things we did at the university. We, we didn't need anyone to teach Chinese. We had Chinese teach, you know, we had an excellent Chinese language program. We had Chinese arts, um, and our Confucius Institute was actually focused on visual and performing arts. So there wasn't a compelling reason to maintain it, and there was a lot of pressure about having it at all, and it was very complex to run. Um, and the challenge is that to simply end it, um, there's two concerns. One is we had a lot of work going on in China from the University of Michigan, a lot. Um, literally someone there every day of the, every day of the year uh, doing something. And some of what we were doing there was, was somewhat controversial from a Chinese perspective. We had a faculty member who taught women's, women and gender studies um, at a university there, um, not without controversy in, in China. So one concern we have is if we end this Confucius Institute relationship, in what ways might the Chinese government decide to uh, impact our other operations? And the other was purely financial, the way the finances of this worked. It was kind of like we spent a dollar and 10 weeks later, the Chinese government sends us a dollar. Um, so they, they hold the purse strings. And, and of course, we've expended funds. Um, so, so I had to figure out how are we going to get ourselves out of this? And, and it, in a, in a shortened version, it's kind of a two-step process. I, I distinctly remember standing in the foothills of the Himalayas, having a phone call with the director of, of the Hanban, the piece of the Chinese Ministry of Culture who runs these. Um, that just happened to be, I happened to be on this, this other uh, university trip when, when the uh, conversation could happen. And just talking about, you know, we're thinking about the ways that, that we should institutionalize this work. Um, Chinese arts, uh, we have a center for, for world arts and culture. We have a, a school of music that, that does Chinese music. Um, you know, we, we're just thinking. And, and the whole point of that call was to establish a no surprise uh, condition. Because the next thing that was going to happen is I literally got on a plane, I flew to China for one meeting, this meeting. I flew to China for about an hour, two, an hour, two hour meeting, um, in which we showed up and, and said, you know, we've thought about it and decided we're going to institutionalize all this work and not have a Confucius Institute anymore. That was a very hard conversation. Um, the Chinese government did not want us to not have a Confucius Institute. It was important to them to have Confucius Institutes at what they saw as premier institutions, because it legitimizes the whole construct of Confucius institutions. Um, and yet, I needed to have that conversation in a way that was totally respectful of the Chinese and the Chinese government. That's why I went in person, could have sent an email, could have turned it off by phone. But in a Chinese context, that would have been very disrespectful. And so flying to China to, to end that relationship was critical because we're protecting all of our other activities and the fact that they at that moment owed us probably something on the order of three hundred thousand and a half million dollars, um, which we did get. Um, there was no obvious ramifications for our other activities. Um, but I think that is a very difficult conversation to have because the Chinese government was very upset with this proposal, with what we were doing. Um, uh, and yet I think we did it in a way that resulted in, in minimal harm for our relationships with our other partners in China. Thank you. Our last question will come from Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Dr. Holloway, in your experience, how do you typically go about establishing structure and providing guidance when you're working with a new team or on a new project? Could you provide an example that highlights your approach to fostering cohesion and productivity in such situations? Uh, Chair Mayor uh, and uh, Regent Verhalen, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so I've, I've done this about four times now, uh, once in, in establishing a large research center, um, once as an associate dean, once as a vice provost, once as a provost, come into a place and had to um, build a new team in part out of existing teams. And I think that's, that's a very important thing to recognize. We're not usually working de novo. 
Um, and you need to be really respectful of, of people who are already in place and have dedicated their time and talents to an institution. Um, one thing I think is very important to do is find um, a key person or two who can be your, your local guide, um, someone who is who understands the place that, that you're coming into, um, who has a lot of trust across the institution, and whom you can trust really completely. My first hire as um, provost at uh, New Mexico was a senior vice provost, and, and I vetted the person I was hiring very carefully with a lot of stakeholders, and this was all before I started. It was literally a hire on the first day. Um, uh, but having her in play, and, and when I started, we met every morning. Every morning we would get together, what's going on, what are we working on, um, Barbara, am I screwing anything up? Um, and having someone who can say yes to that is super important, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you go to a new place. Um, so having that, bringing that key person in is, is I think, super important. Um, equally important with the new team is, you know, it's easy to talk about I empower my team. They've got to see it. Um, and, and that means backing them up. Uh, and so, uh, again, when I started, I think I'd mentioned the provost at New Mexico, the, the office was kind of command and control, and I needed the team to operate much more independently in their spheres of, of authority. Um, and working with some of the team to prove to them, yes, I, I, I think you know more about this than I do. Um, there's a, the, the, I think it's over there, the Scholars Walk, there's a, a, a sign up of a, a guy named uh, Neil Amundsen, uh, who's a chemistry, um, chemist here did mathematical modeling, my kind of person. Um, <laughs> and, and there's a quote that, that's shown from him, and it basically says, um, uh, whenever I hired a team member, I always hired someone smarter than me. Um, I think that's an important philosophy of building a team, um, because there's a lot of people who know a lot more about certain things than I do. And so when, when I um, uh, empower my, my associate provost for student success, she knows a lot more about student success than I do. And, and with all due respect, it's not like I've never worked in student, uh, student success before. I've done a lot there, but she's amazing. I need her talents, and I don't need them filtered through me. So I need to her empowered. And, and I had to prove to her that she was empowered and that I would back her up when she made a... Um, um, made a decision. Uh, and teams need to see that early. Um, because if they see that early, then they know they can trust you when you say they're empowered. And that even means if somebody does something, I'm like, I don't know, I should still back them up, at least publicly, because they need to know that they can make a decision and not, um, not be put in a, in a bad spot because of it. Um, so I think that's incredibly important um, in um, uh, building, a, building a team. Um, and then I will say also, cohesion is partially professional, but it's partially social. Um, so um, we go bowling. Sorry, I know it's kind of, you know, middle class or whatever, but we go bowling. Um, we go to baseball games together. Um, I bring families of, of my team to, to those kinds of events because we're trying to build cohesion. Um, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, you guys have a tough decision to make, but I can tell you that if, um, uh, if um, I were to become president of the University of Minnesota, Halloween's gonna be kind of a big thing in the president's office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Holloway. Um, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to make for uh, to us before we conclude this interview? Sure. So, so let me let me say again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything you do for the University of Minnesota. I know being a regent's a hard job. I've, I've hung out with a lot of regents, and and uh, you know the work is hard. The 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 hours are long. The pay is terrible. Um, <laughs> and and so I do appreciate your service in in this way. And I appreciate that that you've got a difficult, high consequence decision uh, in front of you, and and respect your time. I'm I'm just so excited at the possibilities of the University. Of Minnesota. Um, I see it as an institution that truly matters within its state uh, and at the same time touches the nation and the world in a profound and significant way. I see huge opportunities at this moment. Um, I see huge opportunities to think about the university as a system and to really create clarity about the special roles of, of each of the system campuses and how they can work together, um, not, as, not as separate institutions that happen 
to share a name. Um, uh, I think there's huge opportunity in the work that's going on to reacquire the um, uh, uh, the, the academic health, uh, academic hospital system, um, and to really build um, a cohesive uh, academic um, health center, a health sciences system, if you will, at the university. Um, huge opportunities to impact uh, a state. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited about that and, and would be just thrilled to be part of this project uh, and, and help move it forward. Um, I, I realize that, that it would probably be good to have some kind of a University of, of Minnesota good luck charm while I was here, but I couldn't get a tie, I couldn't find one, and, and my maroon sweater is not very good. But I, but I do have a nice <laughs> University of Minnesota napkin. Um, so I'm, and, and I'm not going to, and I can't show you the other side of it because it says gophers and that's only a part of the University of Minnesota <laughs> so I won't show you the other side um, but but yeah you know, I, I think this is an amazing institution um, all, all jokes aside and uh, uh, it really it's it's the number one institution in the state of Minnesota um, I think there's a potential future where the University of Minnesota is one of the top uni universities of that fifth wave of um, American universities that that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Holloway. Very much appreciate your remarks and your being part of this process. Uh, at this time, we're going to take a 15 minute recess to gather our individual thoughts, uh, to go over our notes, and then we will return to begin our deliberations.
Okay. The special meeting of the Board of Regents will now come to order. This is the time we'll, we will move into our deliberation as to who we will select for the next president of this university. Before we get started, I'd like to share some observations and then some guidelines as well. First of all, I want to offer my sincere thanks to our three finalists. We appreciate their willingness to be public finalists, their engagement with the university community over the past two weeks, and their interest in becoming our next president. While only one of them will be selected to the position, I want each of them to know that all of them, all of you, have shown that you possess the qualifications and strength for the role. Now turning to our deliberations, I am speaking now to my colleagues here about how we're going to proceed. First of all, uh, all of you have received private personnel data about each of the three finalists. This is information that remains private as non-public data, and we cannot discuss it in this meeting. Our comments here around the table should be limited to materials, videos, media, and evaluative input that is publicly available, as well as the interviews that we just conducted and completed. Given the highly public nature of this process and our desire to be respectful to the tremendous pool of finalists who presented themselves to us here today, I'm going to suggest that rather than enumerating strengths and weaknesses for each finalist, that we each share the candidate we are most attracted to and those attributes that draw us to that finalist over the other two finalists. We will each speak in alphabetical order with me speaking last. And then we will have an opportunity of, after we've gone through around the entire horseshoe in alphabetical order, we'll have the opportunity to ask any of our colleagues to clarify or expand their answer so that we can fully understand where each of us are coming from. After everyone has had time to weigh in on their thoughts and we have had sufficient dialogue, I will test the group with what I'm hearing. It is my intention to lead this portion of our deliberations until it becomes apparent that we are coalescing around a particular candidate. At that time, I may propose a straw vote by all of us. I may propose a vote by the dot exercise or other means to test my sense that we are converging around one candidate. And at that time, I will ask for a resolution to vote on a particular candidate. It also may be that in testing and hearing everyone that I conclude more dialogue is needed before we take a straw vote or do a dot exercise or before I can really begin to sense that we are coalescing around a particular candidate. We're just gonna have to see how this first step of the process goes. Consequently, while this portion of our deliberations is taking place, I would ask that each of us refrain from making any motions to elect a particular candidate. Please note uh, that when we do get to the resolution to select a candidate, that it does include a delegation to me to negotiate an employment agreement with the president designate. It is my intent for that agreement to have a start date of July 1, 2024, and then the final employment agreement will then be brought to the board for its review and action when it is ready. Also, please note that between now and the new president's first day, interim president Ettinger will continue to advance our priorities and to do the important work of leading the university. He has our full support and our grateful appreciation for his service. Lastly, let me, before we begin our discussions, let me share my thoughts on what we hope to accomplish here today. I think that we can all agree that it would be terrific if there was unanimity in our decision. That is that all 12 of us have voted in favor of one candidate. But that may not happen, and nor should that necessarily be our goal today. Our next president will be elected by a majority of votes, that is by more than six votes. Consequently, if we do not have a unanimous vote, I believe that our goal ultimately should be that regardless of our individual votes, 
that when we each leave the room here today, that we can all fully endorse and support the person selected as if he or she were our first choice. Knowing this board and the quality of the candidates we have before us, I am confident that we can reach that goal. And with that, we'll now turn to our discussion. And uh, going alphabetically, I would ask Regent Davenport to go first. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I want to thank again the Presidential Search Advisory Committee who brought forth three candidates with some similarities, some differences, and some complementary backgrounds and experiences as reflected in the presidential profile. The feedback received reflected support for each and or all candidates. We have a tough choice, uh, but it's a good place to be and all are outstanding. The feedback was important to my thought process and I found it serious, thoughtful, and insightful. So I wanna thank the community for that feedback. Throughout the process, I listened for differentiators, not just between the candidates, but higher education across peer institutions and other preeminent higher education providers across the country. My preferred candidate is Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Dr. Cunningham clearly has deep and mature experience with a broad scope of knowledge. I heard responses to questions throughout the process that were sophisticated reflecting years as a senior leader making an impact on those she serves. I heard a sharper edge to bringing outcomes that were beyond best practices or typical approaches common in higher education today. One grows into a presidency. I can see Dr. Cun Cunningham quickly entering into the role of the 18th president of the University of Minnesota in a thoughtful, long-term and impactful way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Davenport. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and um, I'll jump right into it by also uh, giving a final and heartfelt thanks to the Presidential Search Advisory Committee and all of the work of those members. It was an honor to be a part of that process um, as we get here today. Also um, sharing, which I'm sure we all um, do and will mention, a deep appreciation to the staff from across the entire university system who've made this process possible. Um, I will briefly talk about my um, personal lead candidate, which would be Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Uh, I think her healthcare and academic health experience would be of large asset to our university. Uh, I'd also highlight the relevance of the institution she's coming from and the experience that she's gathered at the University of Michigan that I think would be um, of asset in terms of stepping into this role. And as Regent Davenport talked about, the growth into the role of the presidency. Uh, I appreciated Dr. Cunningham's comments today about leaning, uh, leading from values and uh, what that means in terms of executive leadership of an institution and the depth and breadth of her experience. Uh, two things to highlight um, from today, although there are many as a part of Dr. Cunningham's participation through this process, was her um, answers to our question about strategic planning and then her um, answer to our question about enrollment. I noted, um, which I believe is a direct quote, but I don't want to say for sure, when Dr. Cunningham was talking about um, the importance and, and her um, representing her experience and expertise in recruiting top talent and working with accountability towards goals. Uh, as a governing board member, that's really important to me and I appreciated her highlighting that. Um, and as I'll, I'll also add my thanks to um, all the finalists and candidates who have participated in this process, um, but those are some of the reasons that Dr. Rebecca Cunningham is my lead candidate and looking forward to hearing from the rest of uh, our board colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Farnsworth. Regent Coley. Thank you so much, and I just want to echo um, all of my colleagues so far. <laughs> Thanks for the candidates. Um, this has been an incredible process, and um, to all the folks who didn't make it to the finalists, um, you know, thank you for putting your names in, and for the for the people who came and became finalists. 
We know you made an incredible sacrifice to be here and we just so deeply appreciate your engagement with our whole community and um, I would not feel as confident about this process had you not done that. And thank you so much to the committee and to our board office. Um, my first choice after this interview day, and I really came in um, as, you know, having watched all of this, but with the hope that I would make a decision today, uh, my recommendation is Dr. Laura Bloomberg. Um, and I have a number of reasons, and I will try not to talk for an hour, but um, I sincerely appreciated that Dr. Bloomberg has such a strong connection to the University of Minnesota and to the state of Minnesota. And while I don't think that that's um, alone enough to bring someone in, I think that that will give her the ability to really hit the ground running when she comes here. She just has deep connections to the university and really understands um, our system wide uh, university and also has deep critique, I think, of the university, which I think is incredibly important coming into this role. Um, she's a believer in relationships, and we heard that come through in her interview. Um, she's a believer in people, in learning, in, in tapping um, strengths, and I heard that, but I also learned through her interviews, through her interview forum statements and um, external conversations that I had with people that she's a transformative leader uh, who works toward justice. Um, Dr. Bloomberg said that she, the longer she's a leader, the less she's afraid of looking dumb. And I just so appreciated that because I think that that kind of openness and transparency in leadership is incredibly important. That feeling that you're, you know, we're a huge institution with multiple campuses and so many very smart and dedicated people. No one person can get their head around all of it and we have to lean on each other to do this work. And I heard that from her and I think that kind of, um, that kind of openness will serve us well. Um, Dr. Bloomberg also gave excellent and expansive explanations about bringing in stakeholders, um, both from the state and from our local communities and building relationships with partners. Um, I heard her talk about leading from values. Uh, I heard, um, and I heard, and I heard from people outside of this interview um, beforehand who said that when she was here on campus with us as dean, that she was one of the most transformational people that they had the opportunity to work with. And I've really held on to that coming into today um, because I think that the conversations that I had were with people who could have very well come with a very strong critique of her leadership and the fact that she um, that that they were so impressed and said that they were able to implement um, policies across the university because of their work with her uh, in some really difficult situations was incredibly impactful. Um, so, and the last thing that I just want to say is that she came across to me as being very, very grounded. I liked that she said that she wasn't a fancy leader. I feel like she will be approachable to our students, our staff, our faculty, and will be open to talking about um, some of the uh, things that we're doing really well and also the major challenges that we have in the University of Minnesota that are echoed throughout higher education. So, thank you. Thank you. Regent Hipsch. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayor. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to just thank the committee, like everybody else is doing. I, it's really our job. And I'd like to thank the candidates, all three, uh, all three of them, really all the candidates that applied, but it's, it's especially the three that came into uh, interview. That was tremendously great people, all three of them. Any one of them could easily do the job. They're, uh, so I mean, to find three candidates like this and to have a good problem like this to have choice is uh, really great. So thank you to Mary Davenport and her committee, and, and I, th I think that's really important. So my candidate um, also is Rebe uh, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, and I think she's uh, the right person to advance our state and advance our university right now, okay? Um, she's uh, great with the legislature. Uh, she's... Uh, you know, we have a big medical vision that we're trying to push forward. I think that's really important in this, to the next dozen years or so. I like the way she answered the questions on uh, on student. Our job is not uh, weeding out students, it is providing success for students. I thought that was a really great, great quote. I liked her quotes on vision. Everything flows through the vision. Uh, and she, she talked about the systemness a lot and the differentiated vision 
on each campus. We all know that each campus is different and has to have a different vision, but we all come together as a system and she understands that. So um, I support her. I like the fact that she has some Minnesota ties uh, and uh, I think she's gonna, she'd be a really good president, so thank you. Thank you, Regent Hips. Uh, Regent Ruth Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, so I'm the third and final of the regents who served on the uh, Presidential Search Advisory Committee with my colleagues, Regents Davenport and Farnsworth. So uh, I've been thinking about these candidates for a long time now, and I am delighted that we have had such um, outstanding candidates, all of whom could do a good job. Um, my choice at this time will be uh, Laura Bloomberg, and I am particularly uh, uh, thinking this because um, I think she's incredibly relationship oriented and I think that she has all the other qualifications but that people who are really able to connect with people of all kinds of different backgrounds uh, for different interests and different reasons establish good healthy positive relationships with people is going to be very likely to be successful I just think that's very um, foundational and so well, and I, I will say that having been working on this committee and in the, in the previous committee, um, you know, I've, I've just heard so many positive things about Dr. Bloomberg from people all over the state of Minnesota. That includes not just regents and other colleagues, professors, people who worked with her in the Humphrey uh, Institute, uh, with alumni, with donors, with friends of the university. It's rare for somebody to be an excellent strong, powerful person doing a good job, and then at the same time having that kind of positivity and relational skills. And I, I just think those are it's worth a lot. And I think as we look forward, that's very important. Um, I think she has the background to do whatever we need her to do. Humphrey School, where she was dean, is in the top 10 uh, schools in the country, which I think is pretty powerful. She's the only one who's actually the president of a university right now. Uh, I was also interested and impressed um, as a physician myself with how she worked in Cleveland. Uh, so Cleveland State University is, is in the city. The Cleveland Clinic is there also. It's an outstanding, excellent medical center. And they don't have any built-in ties. That's not a pre-establishing. But in the interests of their students, uh, she was able to form good relationships with the Cleveland Clinic, helping students get uh, internships, jobs, you know, and other good options there, looking at career options. So I think that's just one kind of example of what somebody can do when they go into a city, in a big city, and a diverse city, and uh, find ways to connect uh, with the groups there that make a difference for your students. I think she would lead uh, the faculty, the staff, uh, well, and um, I think her, obviously, her incredible groundedness in the values uh, of Minnesota, I think will be a great asset. And so I'm supporting her at this time. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Regent Tad Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron. And um, uh, first of all, uh, again, thanks to the, the, the regents who served on this and, the, and especially the staff that did an excellent job of, uh, uh, of getting the entire um, system involved in this decision and uh, spent many hours reading through the, the comments. Um, and I'm taking those into account as, as uh, I go forward. Uh, all of them uh, are qualified. All of them could, could do a good job on, on running this university. But I guess the question is, um, what do we need right now, and um, what are we doing right now, and where do we need uh, strength? And uh, for that reason, uh, as we're in the midst of um, some quandaries on academic medicine, I think uh, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham um, comes up slightly ahead. Um, I look at... Um, what she can bring to the university in the way of research uh, that she has brought to the University of Michigan. And I also look at um, in my hometown of Duluth. Um, there were a lot of big fans of Dr. Bloomberg up there, of course. And uh, I had a 
number of phone calls on um, uh, uh, Dr. Holloway as well, and I had people pull, trying to pull me in all different directions. But um, <laughs> the University of Michigan at Dearborn, as, as Dr. Uh, Cunningham said today, is very similar to the University of Minnesota Duluth, and it's uh, the, the the main campus in Ann Arbor and the campus at Dearborn both have significant research missions, as does the University of Minnesota Duluth, which a lot of people forget about. But she uh, brought that up um, both in Duluth and and here today. So um, and then also has expertise in medicine and and uh, and academic medicine specifically and and and. Uh, we have a lot to do on that over the next couple of years in both the, the metro area and Duluth. So um, I'm, um, she is uh, right now my favorite. Thank you, uh, Regent Johnson. Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, colleagues. Um, I, I would also like to just echo the thanks for all the involvement, particularly with those that submitted feedback in the. Um, the portal uh, that was very helpful and confusing at the same time. Um, such great feedback in there, but you know, for one candidate, it would be I like that they were X, and then that's in the pro, and then the next person would put that same comment in the negative <laughs> column. Um, so definitely something to work through, but certainly informed my thoughts as I think about this role. I think all the the many many activities that a university president has to embark on can be broken down into two categories. I'm oversimplifying, but um, one bucket I think of is the tactical um, or executive, right? The chief executive role. Um, and then another is, and I, I, I'm stealing this word from actually a forum comment, chief ambassador um, of the university, the relationship building, um, representing the university, building relationships and, and being the face. Um, and I find that one, the tactical can be augmented and it, it has to be augmented by a team, but that other chief ambassador, chief relationship builder, you know, um, leader of the institution, that the person has to have that. Um, and, and, and while the team does support that, I mean, that's not augmented. You have to have that. And to that end, um, I want to speak a little bit about Dr. Bloomberg, um, who, who I feel um, certainly brings that aspect. Um, I mean, on one aspect, I think we spoke before about connection to Minnesota. And um, I, I and I think most of us were clear that we don't expect someone to be from here or be in this state. But it is um, it's hard to overlook the, the connections, um, the familiarity, um, you know, which can be pros and cons. In, in her interview, she, she spoke about love for institutions, but then quickly conceded that love for institution is not qualification enough. Um, and that's true, but then proceeded to speak about the qualifications, which she does have. Some differentiators, one of my colleagues used the word differentiators, that I, and I liked that, um, were her experience and approach to stakeholder engagement and being genuine about that. She talked about um, not... Uh, not engaging in engagement theater, right? That's engaging just to say you did, but being authentic about those and gave a, a, a number of examples of her um, ability to do so. She talked about something several times brought up K-12 um, partnerships in her past experience. Obviously, this is not K-12, but I am drawn to that, you know, because that's a key ecosystem partner and um, our success is... Um, is dependent on theirs and vice versa. Um, so that's a unique lens that I think we have to have more of. Um, again, as Regent Gully said, not afraid of, of sounding dumb and, and really which could be said as, you know, being ready to be wrong and, and willing to be wrong, understanding when she is. She talked a lot about team um, and actually even on one occasion delineated, um, said, I'm proud of X but take no credit, right? And I think um, that's always unclear, you know, because we did X at this university. Well, what role did you have in that? And I think she was very careful to um, clarify when she felt she was involved in, and when she felt that 
credit belonged um, to others. So I will save my further comments for another round, but can really just sum it up as um, uh, there's obviously develop developmental areas, but for me, they fall in that tactical executive area rather than that chief ambassador, chief leader of the institution correct, uh, area. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Kanyanya. Regent Tarabi. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I too, I think that everybody will be echoing thanks, but um, another thanks both for the search committee and all of the staff for the tremendous uh, work and effort in putting to make this um, process happen. It's been incredible. Um, I've not been as deeply um, entrenched in it, but just watching it all work has been, um, I think, just a confidence booster in some ways to let us know how deep engage our whole university um, uh, stakeholders have been in the process and really facilitating that I think has been tremendous um, I also want to echo my thanks to the, all of the candidates who um, really felt that this was an important position that they might be interested in and then for the three candidates who came in and participated in the, this process it's been a learning experience for us but hopefully a way for us to um, also share some lessons for how we might do this into the future so greatly appreciate all of that. Um, first, I just want to say what an incredible day it's been um, just to uh, finally meet the candidates and to hear from them and to even though the questions were um, mostly the same just to be able to hear their thoughts and their visions and um, learn more about you know their um, their leadership has been incredibly um, meaningful and helpful um, in this process um, I did watch all of the videos as well and read all of the comments and everything was uh, very helpful. And so um, where that leads me to is really um, um, some things that I was thinking about as we are in this phase of the university is really that um, when when everything is going well, it's easy to pick. <laughs> when you have a lot of big things, it's harder to pick. And I know that there, you know, we have a number of big things, and it's important to think about who who could um, step in and um, uh, provide that kind of leadership. But I also think that it's important to think about about um, who, who, who really cares for this institution, because that's something that um, I think is an incredibly important thing, given how hard this position is, um, that uh, oftentimes um, it's, it's hard to stay when things are hard um, at an institution that you don't love. And so, uh, so, so I just um, really um, gave that a lot of thought. Um, and so my choice today is for Laura Bloomberg. Um, I really heard a lot about, um, not because she just loves this state, but because I do think that um, her own leadership um, path has taken her in a lot of different directions and to um, know that she really is a leader who is uh, uh, able to build teams um, and she really honors that expertise that she can put together um, and also really valuing relationships. I too feel like that is really important um, to be able to put people who um, who not only bring expertise, but can have good relationships with each other is really important. And I heard the examples of being able to talk to somebody who has, um, and, and not just talk, but to be able to do things in partnership with um, people who are who have very different values or very different uh, points of views about how things should be done. I feel like that is uh, a really important thing at this time. I also, um, uh, really valued her um, her presentation about the systemness. I know that um, it is something that is still in uh, development for the U, and I know we talk about the systemness of the uh, Block M, and it's very important, and I feel that, but we have a ways to go. And so to be able to have somebody who uh, is deeply committed across the state um, and wants to continue to build that, I think is um, important. 
and and to do that in humility, um, honoring uh, all the different regions of the state, um, I think is going to be incredibly important. So my um, number um, one choice today is for Laura Bloomberg. Thank you. Regent Turner, are you there? Yep. There you are. Yeah. Uh, so Regent Turner, I'm going to. We've been have just so you know, um, I, I'm guessing you're talking into your computer uh, microphone and for some reason, even if you move on um, just a fraction, your voice will go in and out. And so we obviously want to make sure we hear Perfectly your still. input. So I, I don't know what we can do at your end, but if you can lean into your computer as uncomfortable as that may be, that maybe that will help. <laughs> <laughs> all right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, first of all, test the, is it better now I turn my volume all the way up? Can you yes, hear me it is. better? Yes, it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, can I just say a general thanks to everybody that everybody already mentioned? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. A little short on words at this time okay. of the day. Uh, the, but our, I'm going to go from the perspective of what what I know. And as far as relationship building, um, Rebecca Cunningham, in first and foremost, in her career in emergency from doctor, there's, there's nothing like being an emergency from doctor as far as being able to form relationships immediately working in crisis situations, um, having empathy, and being able to communicate on all levels. That's extremely important. Now, she didn't go on about that. She went on right away about all the experience that she had in higher education. And I firmly believe that her background as a doctor, and she says that she's a, a servant leader. She leads with humility. She is pulling that from her background as an emergency room doctor. And that means a lot to me. And then secondly, when I asked her that out of the blue question about the um, bad assistance at Michigan, she didn't flinch. And she, she pointed out what she needs to know, but that she values that position and um, she, she kind of laid out what she would need, what kind of information. I value the fact that she didn't shy away from that question. I believe that she's got the most um, between her medical experience and her higher ed is the person for the time. And so my vote goes to uh, Rebecca Cunningham. Thank you very much, Regent Turner. Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I know we've all said our thanks, but this is the only time we, we get to do this. Um, and the fact that we have, as regents, been given this opportunity to dive this deeply into this process in such a public way is really astounding. I know, Chair Mayron, you commented on it when we started today, but it's worth revisiting. The, the fact that these three individuals were willing to put themselves out there in such an open and transparent way across our campuses, um, in talking with stakeholders, in talking with the media, through this interview process, um, and, and today, sitting here for 75 minutes answering our questions, um, is, is really commendable, and we could not have had this process without the willingness of Dr. Bloomberg, Dr. Cunningham, and Dr. Holloway all saying, yes, I will participate in it. You know, on the front end, we said we hoped we would. Lots of people said the university needs to have more than one finalist. The only way we can have more than one finalist is if those finalists are willing to do all of this publicly. And so I thank them from the bottom of my heart for being willing to do this also publicly and to our staff for coordinating such an impressive operation over the last few months 
has been amazing to watch. So thank you, Brian, to you and your staff. Um, I should say your team, because that is how you look at it. And, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, so to get to your question, <laughs> my vote right now would be for Dr. Cunningham. Um, her, her responses on particularly around strategic planning, um, vision, but accountability in those conversations were really insightful because she immediately took those and turned them to my vision can be whatever it is, but it's really important that the stakeholders are involved in the process and we listen to what they need. Um, because yeah, you could put whatever you want on paper in a strategic plan, but you have to have that buy-in and that cohesiveness that she emphasized. Um, she also really expressed an appreciation for the attention that's needed across the system. Particularly pointing out um, some of the open positions we have at all of our campuses in leadership and without those positions filled, it continues to create more work for other people um, and create some inefficiencies, finds opportunities for other efficiencies and, and ways of doing things. But her desire to strategically build that team of leadership across the entire system is really important for where this university is going and needs to go. Um, her desire to empower students to reach their full potential, I think is the phrase she used, um, but via that engaged learning model, which really helps foster that sense of community um, between students and faculty and engagement with staff and all of that, um, and, and those, those pathways to success and, and what that looks like to each student being a, a bit different. Um, and then, the way we closed out our conversations, particularly the answer to your question, Regent Taoyurabe, that her, she wants to emphasize preparing teams on the issue of the day so it doesn't become the crisis of the day. Um, that is certainly something I have heard from other emergency room <laughs> personnel that I know very, very well. Um, and it shone through in a very, um, positive way from an administrative standpoint um, to the way uh, Regent Turner balanced those two aspects of, of Dr. Cunningham's um, extensive experience. And so that, those are the reasons why that is where um, my vote would sit at this moment. Thank you. Regent Wheeler. Uh, thank you, Jeremy Ron. Um, boy, I, I, again, I can't, I can't not thank people because from this advisory collection committee to the, this has been an amazing process, just an amazing process, and it speaks so well of this university of which we're so passionate. And the hundreds and hundreds of voices raised or at forums just speaks to the passion that everybody holds for the university. And I can't help but uh, not mention, too, the courage of the candidates and the willingness to put themselves out there. This is unprecedented at the university. Uh, this kind of transparency and this openness, and it was largely because of your courage and transparency that each of you owned that uh, allowed us to have such an amazing process and we have incredible candidates. So with all that said, um, I, uh, I favor uh, Dr. Laura Bloomberg. And it's for the, these four reasons that I favor her. One is her experience. She has a breadth of experience from, you know, classroom teacher to K through 12 principal to a, uh, the center of integrative leadership to a dean to a provost to a president. And that means she has to have a broad wingspan of all issues. And she's been nursing these issues. Primarily, I'd focus on who, who are we here to serve for the students for, for a long time. So she's been noodling and dealing with issues of safety, of support, of enrollment, of affordability, of academic free speech. She's been dealing with those issues in her roles um, and um, has those uh, relationships that actually allow us to support students and their learning in the best possible way. So that's reason one is her breadth of experience. 
Reason two is her performance and innovation. She's got a track record of direct involvement and in leading it. She wasn't. She hasn't just been at the table. She's been leading incredible things. Um, you know. Uh, Regent Johnson mentioned that she, she actually made the Humphrey a global institution that's so well respected that's in a top 10. At Cleveland State, that's student belonging and uh, you know success. That's not an easy change to make in, in her time there. And the integrated delivery programs that I heard about at some of her forums that are crossing schools and what that is. Um, really highly collaborative and working with climate change you know, um, in a very substantive way. And I'd say that one of the things that I would say about her performance and her innovation is that I think what we need most now is how do we work across lines and, and tie this together in a systems approach. So yes, I know we have other issues too we have to solve, but I think the largest uh, opportunity for this university comes in the system approach and the collaborative approach that she has modeled and led um, throughout her time. Thirdly, the third thing is her knowledge of the university and her reputation. Let's just say that there's a lot of people who have a lot of passion about this university and often veers into hopefully constructive criticism, but criticism. When you talk about uh, Dr. Bloomberg, um, it's amazing how many people um, speak so positively about her leadership when she was here. And somebody on one of the comments said that she dealt with, um, she dealt with extremely difficult issues as her dean here and she had a master, she was a master class in courageous leadership. Somebody else said, I've known her since she was a, led was a principal and I was a social worker. Her skills, passions for justice, equity, and education have grown, but her ego has not. Um, so that she has this knowledge of the U and has and maintained a positive reputation in the vast majority of responses, I think is pretty remarkable, especially in a university setting. And then the last thing I'll say, the fourth reason is her man humanity. I mean, she's extremely relational. She listens well, but she's able to discern with clarity what uh, position she will take. She's not afraid and won't back away from something. Um, her humility, uh, I think, was really demonstrated. I mean, she um, talked often about where she got things wrong and what she had to do differently. I always, when I was recruiting people, look for, I asked them a question, tell me about something you're really invested in that really, you know, you thought was the best thing since uh, that you could do and it didn't go well and what happened? When people start to point at other people that that's the reason it didn't happen, they don't get hired. Um, she did uh, just the opposite and said, here's what I learned from that. So I'd say her humility. And the last thing I'll say is that I loved her quote, I think it was at the Rochester Forum, where she quoted Voltaire, recognizing that she wasn't a CLA um, aficionado, but um, that uh, he said that uh, appreciation is a wonderful thing. It makes what is excellent in others belong to all of us. And I think that reflects largely who uh, Dr. Bloomberg is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the last speaker is me. Uh, so. Uh, I did my thanks in the opening remarks uh, to the candidates, to the team, to the community. So I'm not going to repeat them here because if for no other reason than my colleagues have said everything I could say in that regard about how appreciative I am of how we got to where we are today. And the, um, the wonderful problem, as my colleague said, uh, Regent Hipsch, that we are faced with today. Uh, my mother used to say, you, uh, you got a problem, you got a problem if you don't have a problem. Well, this is a good problem to have, but it doesn't mean that it isn't highly challenging. I will say what makes this decision so difficult is that all the candidates satisfy the position description that we as a board articulated for this search. In, then, in this sense, I truly believe that all three candidates meet the qualifications to become our next president. But now our task is to determine who is the best candidate for the University of Minnesota now and into the future. Who is the best candidate to advance our three-part mission of education, research, and outreach across the entire system now and into the future. And before I discuss my choice for our next president, let me share the characteristics that I am looking for in a candidate. In other words, the differentiating characteristics that, I, that uh, Regent Davenport mentioned. First, I want a person who can address our current challenges and priorities. And second, I want a person who understands not only the magnitude and the breadth of the university's impact and its footprint on the state and beyond, 
but who has the experience and the skill set to proactively envision and expand our impact and footprint to address the changing landscape of higher education, the future needs of our state and citizens, and the world at large. And as a corollary of that second criteria or dimension, this forward-looking person must also have the skill set to build a team and to garner support from the various internal and external stakeholders to implement innovation and changes in the future. With these criteria and characteristics in mind, I, my choice would be Dr. Rebecca Cunningham to be our next president. And before I explain my reasons for being drawn to Dr. Cunningham, let me first say that in my view, all of the candidates, while they all have different experiences and present different backgrounds, credentials, and a personal, a public persona, each one of them was different. I believe that each of them have the skill set and personalities to address many of our current challenges and priorities whether they are declining enrollment, budget and tuition challenges, DEI, student success, campus safety, relationships with students, staff, faculty, unionized employees, and the Native American tribes. They may do it differently, but I absolutely believe they all have the skill set and the personalities to drive and to uh, work on and to address those particular issues and challenges. Similarly, all of the candidates, in my view, are likable, thoughtful, compassionate, and passionate about the role of public education, and have the skill set and experience to work well and have great success with our external stakeholders, donors, legislators, and the community at large. That said, what draws me to Dr. Cunningham are the qualifications and experience that I think are unique to her. First, she is coming from a Big Ten institution that is our peer in size, scope, and impact. It has a budget of about $11 billion. Ours is about $4.5 billion. It, too, has multiple campuses, and she recognized that when she talked about, for example, the similarity between uh, Dearborn and Duluth. The University of Michigan is more highly ranked than our university. It is, a, it is a peer, but is it, a, it is a peer that we also to aspire to be or to exceed. In her role as Vice President of Research and Innovation at this premier institution, she is part of the senior executive team and reports to and regularly advises Michigan's president and board of regents on all facets of its operations, engages deans, chancellors, faculty governance structures, and executive officers across the entire system. And while she has not led a college or university as its president, in her role as Vice President of Research and Innovation, with revenues in excess of $1.8 billion, she leads an enterprise that is the size of a smaller, medium-sized college or university. In sum, in, her, in sum, in her Vice President role, she is part of an executive suite that manages the University of Michigan's entire portfolio and operations. And that experience satisfies me that she has the necessary qualifications to be president of this university. Second, as you all know, uh, approximately 30% of our revenues um, and budget is driven by our academic health enterprise. The largest contributor to our $1.2 billion in research grants is the medical school. And that's about 37%. When you add to that, the grants to the School of Public Health and other health science units, units, the health enterprise accounts for approximately 62% of our research grant enterprise. Clearly, our role in teaching our future medical providers, conducting research and discovery for the benefit of our state and beyond, and operating a clinical practice that is devoted to the citizens of our state is a distinguishing and laudable characteristic of the university. As Dr. Cunningham explained in her forum interview on the Twin Cities campus, as a doctor, educator, and administrator in the medical field, she brings unique expertise to our current medical enterprise. And most, or I should say, and importantly, 
can assist us in the acquisition of our hospital facilities from Fairview and our reimagining of the delivery of our clinical mission. Additionally, her background and expertise will uniquely position her to contribute to and guide our long range endeavor to make the academic health center a reality. And third, while all the candidates clearly understand the value of systemness, and they all are very committed to addressing it, Dr. Cunningham's work to break down the silos at Michigan and to encourage and incentivize schools and departments to collaborate across disciplines on research projects, for me, walks the talk. That the sum can be greater than the individual parts, and that the university is better served when the parts act as a family and do not compete against each other. Similarly, her work on Michigan's strategic plan, UM Vision 2034, while recognizing the unique feature of the campuses and schools, focuses on a plan for the system as a whole. Finally, Dr. Cunningham is a person who will not only work to ensure that the university does not lose ground on its current status and endeavors, but I believe she has the ability and the drive to tackle the challenges of the future. By its very nature, research and innovation is futuristic. In addition to developing the University of Michigan's comprehensive multi-campus research strategic plan and spearheading a new economic development plan that advances both the university and state's common goals, I believe that she has the skill set, experience, and the expertise to envision, inspire, and implement our future. And for that reason, I support Dr. Cunningham um, as our next president. So um, at this point, we're going to take a very short break. Uh, if for no other reason than I need a restroom break. So <laughs> we're going to take a very short break. I'm going to gather my thoughts based on what we've heard, and then we will come back in and proceed with our deliberations.
Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this special board meeting is now called back into session. I want to thank everybody uh, around the table here for your remarks. Um, everybody was is so thoughtful, was so thoughtful as they articulated uh, not only their preference for a candidate uh, for our next president, but set out in such a respectful way uh, what it is that draws you to that particular candidate. Uh, it's been very helpful to all of us to hear our respective thoughts and perspectives, and I know all of us have carefully listened to the conversation. Uh, right now, based on what people said, uh, we have a majority, seven uh, regents who are supporting uh, Dr. Cunningham as our next president, and five regents who are supporting Dr. Bloomberg as our next president. Um, but I thought before we um, go any further um, for, um, to take a vote on this, I wanted to give those who are supporting Dr. Bloomberg um, as our next president, the opportunity to share any other thoughts or information that you would like those who are supporting Dr. Cunningham to know um, to see if that makes a difference to them in terms of which way ultimately they will vote. So um, I think what we will do is, uh, I think we'll go in reverse order, reverse alphabetical order, um, and start with uh, Regent Wheeler. Great, thank you, Chair Mayor. And by the way, if you don't want to say anything, you don't need to. Let me just yeah. make that clear. But I want to give everyone the opportunity to weigh in. I appreciate the process. I appreciate the opportunity to say something. Um, I, I, again, think it's very important for the university to have somebody with a broad set of experiences um, so that they can deal with all issues uh, facing the university. It's interesting, I think, to note that while we know the Academic Medical Center is facing uh, challenges and is a, a problem of today that's pretty salient, I worry about a currency bias, and you know that the, the two, uh, it's interesting that the two MDs on the, on the uh, on the um, Board of Regents uh, didn't vote that way because I don't want the rest of the university to get lost in uh, that, that particular issue. So one of the key reasons for me, and I can let others speak to their reasons, is that um, because the university is so much more than the health sciences, um, that uh, you know we want to make sure that it's all attended to, and by somebody who sat in a chair and has led that in a substantive way. So that's my thing. I'll qualify by saying that too, that we have two exceptional people that we voted for. So let me just say that as well. All right, thank you very much, uh, Regent Wheeler. Uh, we gotta get this right here. All right, uh, Regent Tarabi. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I think oh wait, I'm sorry, I see it goes to show. No, um, I was asking for those who, oh, of the oh, five individuals yeah. who were supporting <laughs> okay. uh, <Yeah. laughs> you Dr. Blunt. All right, all right. I think I've got this right in front of yeah. me here. All right. Uh, yeah. Dr. <laughs> Regent Tarabi. <laughs> Thank you. You're, You're, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, well. Just to clarify, <laughs> no. um, uh, Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I think one of the things that felt really important to me is really about about the relationships that um, having the skills to build um, good relationships with all of the stakeholders of the university. I know that it's not just in this interview process, but something that we have consistently heard um, from our stakeholders, whether that be legislators um, or you know different um, faculty, staff, all of those things. I know it's a work in progress, but I think having the um, value in relationships and soft skills to be able to do that, um, I think felt to me like something that was really strong um, in Dr. Bloomberg. And um, I, um, I also appreciated, I think, her approach in understanding that um, as president, she is not uh, to be the expert on any one thing, but to be able to build teams who have expertise um, and to be able to facilitate uh, ways in which data becomes information for decision making. And so to me, um, being able to I think bring and build those uh, relationships in order for us to problem solve felt very important. And I 
um, just felt that she was able to demonstrate that uh, the most. And from reading all of the comments, it was something that um, was common across um, the feedback that we had received. And so that's, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Briefly, I mean, at this stage, and especially with the two candidates were coalescing around, if you will, um, it's almost more, it's a matter of fit rather than qualification. Um, you know, I don't know that anyone would disagree <clears throat> with either in terms of being qualified. I, I won't repeat um, some of what my colleague said, but um, just want to highlight that, at least that point about um, trying to weigh the, the issues and the needs of today with um, the university decades out, right? And, and there's one clear need today, and that attracts us to one candidate, did for myself as well, but just trying to understand how much weight to give to that. Um, I also think in my consideration, obviously we had the interviews today, and that's what's fresh in mind, but thinking back to the forums that we all watched and the written comments uh, that came through, again, those didn't necessarily yield one message, but they were helpful. And, you know, I think the president, obviously that onus for selection lies with the board, but the president has to work with the entire universe community and, and, and outside the universe community as well. And I just, at least in the written comments, felt that um, throughout the forums that Dr. Bloomberg had been received well. Um, again, to my earlier comments, the president, while they do a lot, um, you know, they're not, there's so many aspects of leading the university, and while we put them all in the in the in the position description, you, you can't necessarily expect that out of one one person. What they do need to be able to do is is lead, aggregate um, talent, and make decisions through that. And I think um, that's what Dr. Bloomberg has done throughout her career, um, and spoke well to today in this interview as well as uh, the forums. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Regent Ruth Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'll just say again, I, th I think your um, relationships are central. I think some of the most difficult, kind of intractable problems we've had relate to not being able to do that. I think when it comes to the legislature, Again, the citizens of Minnesota, our alums, donors, as well as the entire university, faculty, students, staff, the relationships are central. With that, you can do almost anything. Without that, and everything is just conflict and difficult. I think, you know, if Dr. Bloomberg would come here, this is where she would come and stay. She would commit herself for her career uh, to doing everything possible for this university to live up to the potential that it has which is great, and I think given her skills, she can help us achieve that uh, more than anybody else. And so that's very um, powerful to me. And I, I think that I will just say that with regard to the University of Michigan, there are ways in which we are alike. We're certainly Big Ten large public universities. But from the reading and, and, and that, that I was doing in terms of the um, process of, of so on, what I've read is that Michigan is like 19 colleges, and each of them are a world unto themselves. I'm not sure that they have as integrated of a campus as we might think that they have. And I don't think that Flint and Dearborn are exactly really analogous to the kind of other four campuses that we have here. There's some differences. That doesn't mean that, you know, it can't be working, but it isn't as 100% analogous as I think when you dig in a little bit deeper. But nevertheless, it, my, my plea here is for the absolute um, priceless value of people, someone who can build and nurture relationships over years and all the positive things that will come out of that for the university. Thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, at this point of the conversation, Regent Gully. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and thank you to everyone for all these like just very thoughtful comments. Um, uh, it's hard to persuade people. <laughs> And I just want to say, I know that we all have really good reasons. We have these amazing candidates and whoever we choose in this moment will be, um, I think will be a great asset to the university. Uh, that being said, um, 
Some of the things that really stood out to me that I just want to emphasize again, um, or maybe bring a new perspective to with Dr. Laura Bloomberg, uh, are just the, the importance of the relationships. Um, so when we were in this process, I had the I had the great honor to talk to a lot of people from around our campus and around um, Minnesota who reached out to me or who I reached out to to talk about uh, Laura Bloomberg. And I was so, every single person that I talked to said just excellent things about her. Um, but what I also heard in her interview is, and in the forums, is just her philosophy on building relationships with stakeholders, um, that she comes with this. Um, humility and humbleness and this expectation that she can draw on the expertise of everyone in a space that she's not going to be the smartest person in the room and that it's her job to build the teams and build the and build the relationships with people who can move um, who can move things forward um, and that it's okay to to that it's okay to be wrong and that it's okay to um, make mistakes and that the best things that we can do, we, we learn from making mistakes. Um, I also just deeply appreciated that she's an educator through and through. Um, she's worked at all levels in public education. So she worked in K-12. She was a school board member. She went, you know, she came to higher ed. She's been at all levels, um, everything from teaching, you know, doing teaching and research to being an administrator, being a university president. Um, that kind of experience um, is not just important, but it's incredibly inspiring when you're trying to talk to legislators and talk to the public about why public education is important. And she's very inspiring when she talks about the need for public education and, and how, it's, how important it is. I strongly believe that she will bring that to the legislature and that she will bring that to our stakeholders, that she will bring that to the state of Minnesota, um, and that she will build support for the university um, by really believing in the university and really believing in the value that we bring to our entire state. Um, and I just, I think, you know, for me, she's, she's the strongest candidate, and I think that she will. Um, be able to build connections in a way that that I haven't, you know, that I, I feel like she'd be the strongest person to do it. Um, and then, of course, just one last thing I'll say is that the connection to the university is not not a small thing. Um, I heard from a lot of our community members that they want someone who deeply understands the University of Minnesota and deeply understands Minnesota. And I believe that um, coming back to the University of Minnesota will be coming home for her and that she will invest in our, invest in our university, invest in our state, and that um, she has the knowledge to really hit the ground running in a way that um, no one coming from somewhere else could could do as qualified as they are. Um, it's hard to understand the intricacies of this university and of our state. And I think that she knows it um, deeply and intimately in a way that, you know, comes from being part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, would anybody else, uh, those who uh, are, have indicated that their uh, preference, their first choice is Dr. Cunningham, anything that you would like to either say in connection with your uh, perspective or questions that you may have of those who are supporting uh, Dr. Bloomberg? Yes, uh, Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, and I appreciate this opportunity to discuss these details. I, it's challenging and delicate, but we need to do it. Um, you know, when I was considering where my vote would lean, I will say that it was not a deciding factor in any way for me that Dr. Cunningham is a medical doctor. Um, that wasn't something that was driving any of my decision. Instead, it was where she's coming from as a leader in running a significant engine within the University of Michigan's system across different campuses with different interests, uh, different stakeholders, different communities, 
some really challenging issues in, in each of those um, and facing those head on in, in her uh, interview, in conversations, in her written materials. And then also, um, she was very upfront in acknowledging um, that we aren't hiring, and I wrote this down, not hiring me to run the medical system or medical school. She is very aware of what her role is and would be as president of this university. I, I really strongly feel that based on the conversations um, because she's not only doing, she's not the vice president of medical research or of the medical school at Michigan. She is the vice president of the research function, the innovation function at the University of Michigan. And those were the pieces that really fed into um, my decision. I said this before, I'll say it again. We have a great problem <laughs> yeah. um, because it's, it's picking from really great candidates. Uh, other regents? Uh, oh, yes, or Regent Davenport. I, I thank you, Chair Mayron. I want to um, say that I think relationships are so critical. And we hear from our constituents the importance of that. And um, I heard strong relationship building from both of these candidates. I, I from really, from both of them, talked about it. They gave examples. Um, I would to me, um, it's not just the relationship building, but how do you turn that into actionables and outcomes? And I think the maturity, and not in chronological means, but maturity and senior leadership um, really brings a lot forward. There's, there's the question of fit. And I think sometimes when we think of fit, that's comfortable. And so it's known. I mean, we, we have more of a known than an unknown. Um, and I think the unknown poses some risk. But the way I heard um, some of the vision, and, um, and I call them the differentiators, um, there's different things going on at the University of Michigan than there are in other places in the, in the country um, that she um, Rebecca Cunningham has a direct hand on, and that's that sharper edge I reference that it, it, it's out there just a little bit more than I think higher ed is in general um, in the country, and then and and size factors into that when you take a look at um, the difference in size of institutions, um, and um, it, it's it's different, and I think. Um, Don't know what else to say, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> but the relationships, I think, is a strength of both. I mean, I, I appreciate that in both of them. I, I will um, just echo what Regent Davenport said in that regard. Um, honestly, as I was trying to sort through in my head, how do I decide between Dr. Bloomberg and Dr. Um, Cunningham? And, and I clearly, you can, um, and I certainly understand why people are um, attracted to, in our state, to Dr. Bloomberg, because they've had experience with her here, and that none of us have had experience with Dr. Cunningham, who's in another state. Um, but I realized as I was walking through this, my goodness, these candidates, they all share that. I don't have any reason to believe, and in fact, the information that we received about Dr. Cunningham, to me, shows her ability to create relationships with the legislature, with the governor in D.C., with um, uh, grant making, with students, with um, cam uh, other campuses, with 19 different colleges that she she like Dr. Bloomberg, I believe it has all of the skill set to develop and maintain and expand relationships and build on them and build the trust. 
And that came through from the information, all of the information that we received about her. What we didn't have the advantage of um, that we have advantage here in our community is that she is from another state, from another institution, and we can't, we don't have boots on the ground to evaluate and say, see how successful it is. But I believe she has all of those qualities. I believe she has all the passion, all of the drive, all of the compassion to work with the various constituencies, students, faculty, unions, inside and outside. And so then I'm, look, I'm going, they both have these qualities. I understand their personas are different, but they both have it, which is great for us. But now what, what's gonna, so they share that in common. Now I need to look to see who has other unique attributes that maybe will take us over the top. And that's where um, I leaned into the fact that she is um, not only um, on the senior administration, I mean, she is a right-hand person along with the other senior VPs at Michigan to the president. I mean, she is this part of the executive suite. She is probably, um, and while she doesn't carry the role of president, um, as equipped as anybody to be, um, to execute the functions of a president because of her role being in the senior suite and of an institution of that magnitude. The fact is, <clears throat> Cleveland State is significantly smaller. It has about a $350 million budget. The University of Minnesota has a $4.2 million, $5 million budget. The billion. billion dollar budget, I'm sorry. Michigan has an $11 billion budget. The um, Cleveland State doesn't have auxiliary campuses. And so, um, and Michigan does, and maybe they're not the same. And in fact, she talks about, she did talk about how decentralized they are. Um, but she's had to work on all of that at a very high level. And so I feel like she's got all of the attributes that we want, interpersonal attributes to drive home success, but she's got those added qualities as well um, that for me is what differentiates her and really says, I think she is the best person, not only for now and our current challenges, whether it's Fairview uh, or the Academic Health Center, but into the future down the road as well. So um, I just want to acknowledge, I understand the draw about the interpersonal relationships, but I do believe, and there's nothing to suggest that it, to the contrary, that uh, Dr. Cunningham doesn't have those attributes as well. We just don't have the ability to see them in the same way as we have with Dr. Bloomberg, who is homegrown from this state. Any other comments by any of the regents before? Yes, yeah, uh, Regent yeah, Ruth Johnson. Just, just briefly, it was talking about Michigan. Um, I, uh, Dr. Cunningham's a brilliant researcher and is doing great work and all those things, absolutely. But um, it's a little hard to know, as kind of the vice president for those things, exactly how things are working out because the University of Michigan has been in some chaos relatively as far as leadership for the last three years. They've had three presidents and I believe three provosts in the last two to three years. There's been turnover, there's been resignations. It's complicated. And she's there, I'm sure, doing good work, but we don't really know how she's working with, I think, people above that or with them because there really hasn't been a steady presence there for some time. I think she's t taken on more work and done a great job. There's no doubt about that. Very skilled, very smart, all those things, totally. But I guess those are things we don't really know because they're not in a usual state of function, I think. Okay. Anything further around the table? Just a moment. Should we just go ahead and ask for a resolution? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Okay. It's the one in the docket. Okay. Um, unless people want to proceed differently, um, I think we're at a point where we could entertain a resolution um, uh, to uh, put before the entire board here to vote on. Um, but I want to check in and see if people feel differently. If you don't feel ready to vote on a resolution, then uh, we'll look to see what we are interested in doing. But otherwise, I think that we are ready to, uh, to proceed. Madam Chair, are we going to be able to discuss the resolution? Uh, 
once a resolution has been made uh, and seconded, then we can discuss the resolution. The courtroom, just check it. <laughs> Are you trying to make trouble? <laughs> Good trouble, right? Good trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have the resolution? It's, cool. it's in the docket. Oh, all right. I don't have it in front of me. Do you have a hard copy? I, I don't. James has a question. All right, James has it. James, you have a question or are you re ready to move? I was going to move a resolution. All right. Why don't you go ahead and move the resolution then? Uh, Madam Chair, I would move the resolution in the Board of Regents docket materials, which I have in front of me and could read, but I'm assuming. Mr. I think you should. Um, well, do, do you want uh, Regent uh, Farnsworth to read it or do you uh, want Madam to Chair, um, since it's in the docket, we don't need to read it aloud, but um, it is it is page uh, 56 in the docket. And so you would just be inserting the, the blanks. Maybe it feels important to read it. Yeah. I think we yeah. should. I think so you need to insert to the blank it. of who you want to, uh, <laughs> who you're moving on. Yeah, so Chair Mayoron, I would move the following resolution um, as listed on page 56 of the um, Board of Regents docket. Be it resolved that the Board of Regents selects Dr. Rebecca Cunningham as the president of the University of Minnesota, effective July 1st, 2024, as defined by the terms of an employment agreement to be negotiated between the University of Minnesota and Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Be it further resolved that the board delegates authority to the board chair to negotiate and finalize an employment agreement with the president designate and submit that employment agreement to the board for approval. And be it further resolved that the board directs interim president Ettinger and his administration to begin working with the president designate on a transition plan that ensures continuity of leadership and sustains advancement of the board's priorities. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion on the resolution? Yes, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth, for the motion. Um, I mean, the, the nature of the discussion and the format we chose was obviously we speak in, in, in the pro terms of, of the candidate we're supporting, um, you know, but if, if I was asked to do the same of, of Dr. Cunningham, I would have had a very long list as well. Um, so, I mean, I think th th this has been a, a great exercise and a historic one, really, for this institution. Um, it's, while uncomfortable, it's our duty to have this conversation. I think we all, um, we all reflected our opinions, um, but, you know, I certainly would have no reservations uh, with Dr. Cunningham leading our institution. She's extremely qualified. Um, actually, I think I'm the only one who outed myself in our previous meeting. She was my lead candidate then, you know, and there's just <laughs> so many factors in between um, here and there. And, and if we were to, if you were to ask me to talk about her, I, I have a list, you know, um, um, I do region for Hale and I have, <laughs> I have a list um, of, of her strengths as well. So, um, you know, I, I think we've, I, speaking for myself, I've stated my case, um, but this is, this is still a resolution that. Um, I can support and give my wholehearted endorsement uh, to Dr. Cunningham. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else who wishes to speak on the resolution? Regent Wheeler. Yeah, I will say, first of all, thank you for hearing us. Thanks to all of you for hearing uh, those of us in the, in the five minority on uh, the uh, one way we were leaning. Um, that said, I think that all of us around this table will do everything and anything to make whatever president comes in successful. And I think Dr. Cunningham is an exceptional human being and will be an exceptional leader. So I just want to state that I will be um, approving the resolution as well. Thank you. Regent Hipsch. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. And this is to, to the people that didn't actually support uh, Dr. Cunningham as their first choice. This is what the committee did to us. They gave us two <laughs> candidates that are, you know, I mean, you talk about a very hard decision for each and every one of us that just, it's it really, got, it's gut-wrenching in a lot of ways. And, and I just want to say thank you guys for, I mean, I'm glad we could have that discussion here in, in the public, and I'm glad we can all come together with a solution, even though we all probably don't 100% agree with it. Um, thank you for the discussion. That's all I want to say. So, Any, oh, Regent Gully. <laughs> I just want to echo my colleagues and say um, that uh, Laura Bloomberg is my first choice, and I stand by it. <laughs> that being said, um, if it's going to be Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, we are very, so lucky 
Um, I could have also come up with a long list of reasons that she was um, an excellent candidate. And, and truly, my notes are expansive and, and went really back and forth between um, the two of them. And um, Dr. Holloway was wonderful, too. Um, but, but for me, it was they were, the, they were the two that I was most interested in and most intrigued by their experience, by what they brought to the table, by their philosophy on education, by the way that they built relationships, by the way that they've engaged with their institutions and built teams and built leaders. Um, and so I will support the resolution and look forward to building a great relationship with Dr. Cunningham. Um, but also just want to say, uh, we are lucky to have a heartbreaking choice <laughs> in this moment. So thank you to the committee and thank you so much to everyone who put so much work into getting us to this point. We're so lucky to have a hard choice. <laughs> Any other comments? I, I yes, guess, uh, I guess Regent I might as well jump in and make a comment too that um, uh, Chair Mayron and my colleagues around the table, I just have really appreciated hearing everybody's uh, comments about the candidates. I too had list for uh, both candidates who were uh, really exceptional and um, and you know as a body uh, on the board, I know that uh, we stand ready to support whoever we will put in this position because it's really important for this institution. And I know that Dr. Cunningham um, is bringing both her wealth of experience and expertise, which I think will really help this institution and where we need to be now, but also where we're going. And I just, um, want, um, you know, all of us to know that it was important for us to talk about what we wanted to lead with in terms of our next leader, but we stand ready to support whoever um, we ultimately and I will be voting um, for the resolution to, but just um, wanted to echo the sentiment that um, I think we wanted to express uh, our thoughts about what was important based on also what we have heard, what we have observed, and what we know to be true from the, all the documentation that we've received in today's interview. So thank you for the process and um, for uh, allowing us to be able to express those things today. Thank you. Any, any one, Regent Ruth Chan. Just one quick, I won't yep. go long. My colleagues have said uh, everything I was thinking, so I'll just, Add that it was an honor to be part of the uh, initial committee and review all the outstanding candidates we had, interview many, bring forward this list, uh, three folks, all of whom would be great. Uh, Dr. Bloomberg, Dr. Cunningham were my one, two. They're excellent, so I'll be uh, joining the group in that. Thank you. All right, any other uh, comments or questions? Then we are uh, prepared to take the vote. If you would call, uh, do the roll call, please. On the resolution to select Rebecca Cunningham as the 18th president of the University of Minnesota, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Gully. Yes. Regent Gully votes yes. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Tayurabe. Yes. Regent Tayurabe votes yes. Regent Turner. Yes. Yeah. Regent Turner votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Regent Wheeler. Yes. Regent Wheeler votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. The motion is approved uh, 12 to 0. And uh, I will say congratulations uh, to our president designate, uh, Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Yeah, over here yet, or maybe on her way. But let me just make a, a couple final comments before we uh, gavel the meeting and um, and go on. And and that is, uh, before we began the deliberation process, I mentioned or I said, you know, our hope was we would have unanimity uh, around this decision. And um, 
it, we didn't initially. I mean, it was very close, seven to five. And all of us felt, I think, uh, uh, we're very invested in uh, the, our particular reasons for wanting the candidate that we wanted. But what we did reach, and what I'm thrilled about, is we did reach consensus in this room. And by that, I mean that I am confident, and each of you have said that, that when we all leave the room here today, while the candidate may not have been your first choice, I know that you're leaving the room here today fully supporting that candidate as if she was your first choice. And I think that's what's most critical of all. So I, I just want to thank my colleagues for uh, participating as you have. And I'm thrilled that we have a unanimous vote and look forward to um, meeting immediately with uh, Dr. Cunningham and giving our heartfelt congratulations and tell her to get ready to roll up her sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and with that, unless we have any further business, that concludes today's meeting. Thank you.